Some time ago, locals began to report a surge in unusual animal attacks in the Adirondack Mountains. Living where they did, they were, of course, used to seeing wild animals. Bears poking through trash cans, raccoons stealing pieces of dog food out of bowls, rabbits hopping through the yard, or nibbling on someone's garden. But no one had ever seen anything quite like this. All of a sudden, it was as if the local wildlife was turning on humanity. Hikers were attacked by wolves, torn to shreds in the middle of the day. Raccoons caught stealing dog food could no longer be chased off with a broom and a loud noise, but would stand their ground, advancing menacingly and gnashing their teeth. Even squirrels were leaping out of trees and biting people at random. Animal control swiftly intervened, suspecting some sort of rabies outbreak. However, none of the specimens they managed to capture and bring into custody showed signs of rabies. No foaming at the mouth, no hydrophobia, only extreme aggression, the likes of which they had never seen in animals without any identifiable diseases. Meanwhile, as the animal attacks ramped up, locals also noticed that they were more common the closer one was to a certain hunting lodge nestled deep in the forest. No one knew the owner of the lodge, a mysterious man who had been seen coming and going but never stopped to talk to his neighbors or even so much as give a friendly wave. There was no reason to believe the two were connected, and yet there were whispers, rumors, that somehow he had something to do with the whole thing. Maybe he was conducting illegal animal testing at his home or had started a fur farm filled with abused animals that were escaping and seeking revenge. It all seemed a bit absurd, but the anomalous animal activity attracted the attention of the SCP Foundation. They dispatched several operatives to the area who heard the rumors of the hunting lodge and decided to take a look for themselves. When they knocked on the door to the lodge, no one answered. Inside, they could find no signs that anyone lived there or had lived there for quite some time. The building reeked of dried blood and vomit and something else, something dark and animal that no one could quite place. They followed a dark brown smear of blood on the floor to the back room of the hunting lodge where taxidermied animal heads adorned the walls, glassy eyes staring at the SCP officers, unblinking. And there, in the back of the room, was a wooden chest. Inside, they found a pile of furs, nothing too unusual to see in a hunting lodge, but if everything else had been cleared out of the house, then why had they left these furs behind? Something didn't quite seem right. The furs were taken into the foundation for additional observation, where once their true nature revealed itself, they were classified SCP-801. SCP-801 refers to a collection of several separate articles of fur clothing, including one mink coat, one raccoon coat, one wolf coat, one squirrel coat, and one sable coat. Each of these coats are lined with black silk and have a full body cut, including a hood. Though they appear machine assembled, none of these coats have a tag or any washing or care instructions located anywhere on the garment. In addition to the coats, SCP-801 also includes one pair of rabbit skin mittens and one pair of elk skin shoes. The gloves are lined in silk, and the shoes are lined in leather. Just like the coats, they appear to be machine assembled and lack any tags or other instructions. At first glance, there is nothing anomalous about these articles of clothing. However, once a person has put one of them on, they will rapidly begin to transform. When the coats and other items were first apprehended by the Foundation, they conducted a series of human trials using randomly selected D-Class. One man was ordered to put on the squirrel fur coat, which he did without further question. In his eyes, it was a much more appealing task than the usual affair, which could involve directly interacting with deadly, terrifying monsters such as SCP-682. A fur coat was nothing compared to the giant lizard, but as soon as he had slipped his arms through the sleeves, the test subject felt an excruciating pain ripping through his gut. He screamed, doubling over from the agony, and cried out to the researchers to get the coat off of him as it felt like his organs were liquefying. They refused and continued to observe the effects. Approximately two minutes after the onset of the pain, the subject stopped speaking in coherent words. He fell to his hands and knees and although he continued to vocalize, it was no longer in any human language. The pitch of his voice raised higher and higher until the cries of rage and agony began to resemble squeaks and chitters. At this point, as he thrashed and writhed on the floor, the man was able to tear the coat off of his body. However, the transformation was already too far along, and removing the coat did nothing to stop the horror unfolding before the research team. 
As they watched, the man's face began to lengthen and warp, shaping into a snout. His eyes enlarged, migrating to the sides of his head. His ears rounded and grew, moving up and back. His teeth stretched, jutting from his mouth. His spine arched, and with a sudden spray of blood, a tail erupted from the back of his pelvis. All of this occurred over the duration of three minutes, and the research team looked on in shock and awe. At about four minutes into the transformation process, the test subject opened his mouth and began to vomit a mixture of unidentifiable organic matter onto the floor. It appeared to include bone fragments, skin, and pieces of various organs. Once he had finished expelling this material from his mouth, the subject began to writhe and thrash on the floor again, clawing at his face and body. All of a sudden, as if his skin itself were an oversized coat, his flesh came off in one large piece. It flopped to the ground, leaving a small furry creature where there had been a grown man only moments before. Only five minutes after he first put on the coat, there was a bald squirrel in the D-Class man's place. Then, the ultimate stage of transformation began. The squirrel squealed, eyes rolling wildly in its sockets, as brown hair began to sprout all over its body, growing at a rapid rate. As the hair burst through the skin, it expelled blood along with it, which sprayed across the room. A few unfortunate researchers got splatters of squirrel blood on their lab coats, on their notes, and even in their eyes. After all this, there was a seemingly ordinary squirrel sitting in the center of the room. Though the squirrel was ordinary in appearance, its behavior was not that of a typical squirrel. The creature lay on its side, muscles slack from fatigue, but its eyes were still rolling wildly, taking in its surroundings. Its body heaved with shallow breaths, and it appeared to be in a state of extreme distress. One researcher attempted to approach the squirrel to examine it for any potential injuries or anomalies. When he was within one foot of the squirrel, it launched itself off of the ground in a sudden leap, landing on the man's shoulder. Before he could stop it, the squirrel was digging its teeth into the man's neck, biting through his jugular vein. Another researcher intervened, grabbing hold of the feral squirrel, and it scrambled up his arm onto the top of his head. As the researcher screamed for help from the guards, the squirrel locked onto his scalp, drawing blood as its claws dug into the flesh. One guard aimed his weapon at the squirrel, but it climbed down onto the researcher's face, making it impossible to take out the animal without harming the man in the process. As one of the guards worked to load a tranquilizer dart into his weapon, the squirrel scratched at the researcher's eyes, resulting in wounds that would permanently blind the man for life. After all this, the guard managed to shoot the beast with a tranquilizer dart, and it slumped limply to the ground. It was subsequently caged, and the two injured researchers were given immediate medical attention and rabies shots. With the squirrel experiment as a baseline, the Foundation proceeded to test the remaining articles of clothing on additional D-Class. Each time, the process unfolded in pretty much the same way. First, immediately after placing the article of clothing onto their body, the subject would double over and complain of intense pain as their organs began to shift and transform. After two minutes of this, they would lose the ability to speak, as well as the ability to stand upright on two legs. Their vocalizations would shift from human to animal, and external changes would begin to set in, regardless of whether or not the article of clothing was removed from their body. The front of the face would lengthen into a snout or muzzle, the arch of the foot would lengthen, and the tailbone would stretch as a tail formed. Three minutes into the transformation, the subject displayed signs of extreme fatigue and pain. Next, the vomiting stage would set in, as the subject apparently shed all excess tissue and mass that would not be needed in their transformed state. Any mass that could not be expelled through the mouth would begin to deteriorate at an extreme rate, slothing off the body and falling to the floor. By minute five of the process, the subject would almost perfectly resemble their new animal form, with the exception of a lack of body hair. Then it was time for the hair to sprout, disrupting the upper dermal layers and causing the violent expulsion of blood in the process. When the transformation was complete, the subject would appear calm, but this was a result of fatigue rather than disposition. Once researchers attempted to move the subject into a cage for transport, the animal would become incredibly aggressive and resistant to pain. Until sedated or terminated, attacks from the animal would not stop. Some recorded instances of aggression on the part of SCP-801 test subjects have included but are not limited to 
a rabbit that chewed through the Achilles tendon of a security guard, causing him to drop his weapon. The rabbit then made its way into the hall, where it charged at and subsequently bit through the shoe of a senior researcher, eating his big toe. The rabbit was apprehended when the other guard managed to administer a tranquilizer. Notably, the dose was far greater than the standard dose for a creature of its size, resembling the tranquilizer dose that would be administered to a horse. When the elk skin shoes were tested, the resulting elk managed to charge through the glass window separating the examination room from a room full of researchers, sending broken glass flying everywhere. The elk attempted to gore one of the researchers with its antlers, but was stopped with an elephant's dose of tranquilizer. The raccoon was quickly apprehended, as the test subject was tranquilized during the transformation process rather than after. However, when it woke up inside of its cage, it began to throw itself against the bars in an attempt to break free, until it had expired from its wounds. One sable that had resulted from testing with its corresponding coat avoided attacking researchers in an immediate fashion. Instead, running up the wall and into a nearby vent, it could be heard skittering through the ceiling for the next 20 minutes until it was tracked to the site director's office, where it emerged and attempted to eat one of the site director's eyeballs. Thankfully, it was unsuccessful in this mission. One of the minks resulted from testing managed to bite off a portion of one researcher's buttocks before it was tranquilized and caged. The specific details have been redacted from the official file, but testing with the wolf fur coat resulted in the deaths of four personnel and nearly resulted in a fifth death before the intended victim was able to terminate the test subject herself. It should be noted that even after the animals had been contained, they continued to display unchecked aggression. If there is no one available to attack, the animals will turn this aggression on each other, or even themselves. As such, it has been officially recommended that all test subjects working with SCP-801 must be immediately terminated following testing and examination. Following human trials, the Foundation attempted to test the various articles on non-human subjects. This yielded mixed results, depending on the species of the test subject and the species of the article itself. For example, placing a raccoon inside of SCP-801-2 had no anomalous effect at all. All you get when you place a raccoon in a raccoon fur coat is a very annoyed, if very fashionable, raccoon. However, if the animals are a different species than that of the coat they are placed in, something else will occur. They will begin to transition normally for approximately three minutes before the process suddenly stops. These subjects are frequently left in a sorry state, with missing fur or limbs that have only partially transitioned. Most test subjects in these experiments did not survive the process. Those that did were promptly terminated on the orders of the Ethics Committee. The Foundation's experiments revealed that any attempts to transition a subject wearing multiple articles of SCP-801 at the same time resulted in the transition stopping earlier. This left the subject partially conscious with partially transitioned limbs. These subjects were just as violent as those who had fully transitioned and were recommended for immediate termination. Currently, all SCP-801 items are kept in a metal locker on Foundation ground. They may only be accessed for official approved testing, which is open to any personnel with Level 2 clearance and above. After any testing, the specific article of SCP-801 that was used must be dry cleaned. Aside from standard Foundation site security measures, no additional containment procedures are needed at this time. The exact cause of the aggression displayed by SCP-801's victims is still uncertain, but there are some potential explanations that have been floated by Foundation staff. Some suggested that the animals retained some understanding of their former human selves, and out of agony and rage over what they have lost, they act out violently until their lives come to an abrupt stop. Others suggest that it is a reaction to the mental and physical trauma of the transformation itself. A third, more vocal group, posits that it is a combination of the two. Unfortunately, there is no way to interview the transformed animal subjects, so the precise truth of their mental and emotional states post-transformation may remain a mystery forever. The origins of the garments themselves still remain a mystery as well. Out of an abundance of caution, the SCP Foundation has issued an organization-wide rule for its staff. Please refrain from wearing any fur garments while on duty. You just never know what might happen. The synthetic stuff may not be as elegant or warm, but at least you know it won't transform you into a beast, probably. The mouse wriggles desperately under the cat's paw as the long, curved feline claws dig into its furry skin. 
It squeaks with the primal terror of a creature that knows it's about to be devoured alive. No matter how hard it tries, it can't escape. It's in the clutches of its perfect predator. As the mouse fights for its life, the cat licks its fangs and descends towards its frightened prey. But before it can sink its fangs into the mouse's body, the cat opens its mouth and says, Sorry about this, but I don't have a choice. In perfect English. It started with a man named Maurice, whose girlfriend was currently in the process of dumping him. The two of them sat in a diner over cups of coffee and mediocre eggs as she tried her best to let him down gently. But Maurice, his eyes glistening with tears, didn't want to get out that easy. He asked his former girlfriend, Laura, in case you were interested, why she didn't want to be with him anymore. For reasons even she didn't understand, Laura decided that on that fateful day, she would be honest with the man she was dumping. She told him that he is a nice guy, he's just kind of boring. Specifically, he just isn't cultured. He only listens to Top 40 music, doesn't watch any movies that don't have superheroes in them. She can't even remember the most recent time she saw him reading a book, and never once in their three-year relationship has she ever seen him take an interest in art. Laura wishes Maurice a nice life and leaves the diner. The next couple of weeks are hell for poor Maurice. He doesn't know what to do with himself in the single life. He goes to work, but that's about it. The rest of the time, he cries. He sleeps, he eats whole buckets of Ben and Jerry's, and he rewatches the same set of movies that Laura left him for watching in the first place. He's stuck in a rut, an endless loop, and as he lays on his couch in the dead of night while Avengers Infinity War plays out on his screen for the 21st time, he notices how blank his walls are, bereft of even a single poster, photo, or painting. That's when it hits him. You call me uncultured? I'll show you, Laura. I can be plenty cultured when I want to be. That same night, he googled art dealerships in his area and found something interesting. Archibald's Art and Antiquities, only a 20-minute walk from his apartment. The place was apparently accredited, with sponsorships from something called MC&D, and also claiming to feature some acclaimed pieces of an art from the fine folks of the AWCY Collective. All of this went over Maurice's not particularly cultured head, but he decided he'd definitely be visiting the place first thing in the morning. When he arrives, after shaving and washing his hair for the first time in over two weeks, he's feeling optimistic about his prospects. It is a classy-looking store, the exact kind of thing he was expecting when he read about the place online. There's even a hand-painted open sign in the front window. The store owner, Archibald presumably, greets Maurice in the doorway. He's an old man, with thick black glasses and a white walking cane. Is he blind? Maurice is confused by that. A blind art dealer feels kind of like a comedian who can't speak, but the dealer is polite and tells Maurice to look around to his heart's content. Once again, Maurice feels a little out of his depth. On some level, he knows Laura was right. He doesn't know the first thing about art. None of it was connecting. His eyes passed over paintings, sculptures, and artistic photos with no effect. He was worried for a while that perhaps he was truly hopeless, until his eyes met with a truly glorious sight, a painting that spoke to him on the very deepest levels of his soul. It doesn't even have a title, but the second he sees it, he just knows it has to be his. It's a painting of a fat cat lying against a pile of pillows without a care in the world. It's everything that Maurice wants to be in his life. Relaxed, unbothered, carefree, happy. Before he even knows it, he's reaching for his wallet. A short transaction with Archibald later, and Maurice returned home with his new prized possession, a painting that represented a turning point in his life in more ways than he could have ever understood. With a hammer and some nails, he mounted the precious painting up on his wall so that he could look at it for inspiration every single day. It's the start of a new chapter. Maybe everything would be better now. Little did Maurice know, the transformation had already started. One hour after initial viewing, it's like a switch in Maurice's brain had been flipped. He was suddenly pulled out of his post-breakup depressive slump, rejuvenated, reborn. With the painting up on his wall, he started to look at the apartment differently. 
This place was a dump. Where was the life? Where was the effort? He needed to make the rest of the apartment worth the grandeur of the painting. He started cleaning up and looking at articles on feng shui. He carefully rearranged the place until it looked perfect, like the kind of place a woman would be proud to go back to. Speaking of which, he signed up for some old dating profiles, taking a nicer, happier selfie to represent himself. Somehow, with the painting in his possession, anything seemed possible. The possibilities were endless. For the first time in a long time, thoughts of Laura didn't even cross his mind. He's thinking about the future rather than the past, about all the wonderful things that he can do and experience now that he's single. He's on his way to being cultured. One day after initial viewing, Maurice is picking up some new tastes. While spending hours browsing online retailers like Etsy and Redbubble, he finds himself drawn to furniture and ornaments around one particular subject, cats. It doesn't even really strike him as that strange at first. After all, so many of the articles he read about interior decoration advised having a cohesive theme for your living space, like a nice rug. It just really ties the room together. He buys a rug shaped like a cat. He buys some cat cushions and throw pillows, a picture frame with a cat on it, cat charms, cat statues, cat statuettes, cat everything. The more he puts into his home, the more it feels like it's meant to be. And really, why stop at just decoration? He starts buying t-shirts with cats on them and sweaters with kawaii cat faces lovingly embroidered into the fabric. He even buys a woolly hat with cat ears on top for when the winter months roll around. As the quantity of cat-based merchandise in his home begins to outweigh everything else, another thought wanders into his mind. There's not a no-pets clause in his lease agreement. Why doesn't he just cut to the chase and get himself an actual pet cat? With a sense of joy and excitement he hasn't felt in a long time, he starts to Google local rescues, where he might be able to adopt a new furry little friend. One week after initial viewing, Maurice has already made some of his dreams into a reality. He's got a cat, Felix, who wanders around his home. He's thinking about getting another as he pours some kibble into Felix's bowl, or maybe two others. A whole family of cuddly kitties to keep him company. Why would he even need a girlfriend? He starts to think about how everyone would be happier if they had a cat or two in their life. This is the thought that inspires his new information campaign. He starts with the people at work, telling anyone who will listen to him about how getting a cat has changed his life. When he does go on occasional dates, his favorite topic of conversation is, of course, his feline friends. He can't wait to ask his potential partners whether they're cat people or dog people, and if they're undecided, he eagerly takes the opportunity to convert them. It didn't take long for his almost holy mission to go further. He wants to make people's lives better, and his life started getting better when he first bought that wonderful painting. He tries his best to convince people to come back to his apartment just so they can take a look at the painting. Most people politely decline the offer. Three weeks after initial viewing, the changes to Maurice's behavior became a little more drastic. He's become so obsessed with the feline lifestyle that his own behavior begins to take on a kind of cat-like dimension. He doesn't feel the need to take a shower or bathe anymore. Why would he need to, when he can just lick himself clean? The same goes for eating. Why sit at a table with a plate and a knife and fork? Instead, he eats directly off the ground with his hands and mouth. He drinks milk out of a saucer, hungrily lapping it up. Some days, he doesn't even feel like walking bipedally. He'll walk on his hands and feet with his rear sticking up in the air. Somehow, it feels more comfortable than walking normally. But the transformations are only just beginning. Two months after initial viewing, Maurice has started to notice that his stubble is growing out faster than usual. Sometimes he needs to shave twice a day, if he wants to stay neat. But what began with the stubble would soon grow quickly out of proportion. His eyebrows became wild and bushy. His hair started to become almost a mane, growing out in thick mutton chops and creeping down his neck towards his back. His arm and leg hair, the hair on his chest and his back. At a certain point, shaving felt futile. He just let it grow out. Soon enough, it didn't look like hair. It looked more like, well, fur. Just like the soft, silky fur on his beloved Felix. Maurice doesn't mind it. In fact, he's starting to love it. With a cat in a room full of cat memorabilia, all overseen by his beautiful, perfect cat painting, 
Maurice fits right in here. Four months after initial viewing, Maurice woke up one morning to find something strange about himself. Even stranger than everything else, he's gotten smaller. No, it's not as though he's lost weight. He's physically gotten smaller. Had Maurice been the kind of guy who likes to habitually visit the doctor, they would have told him that his skeletal structure had somehow contracted, along with his skin and musculature. Nothing is out of proportion, it's almost like he's gradually been hit with a kind of science fiction shrink ray. Maurice doesn't pay much mind to it, of course. He only noticed that he'd gotten shorter when he went to lovingly gaze at his painting and noticed that he was looking at it from a slightly different angle than usual. But that's fine. Much like Maurice himself now, it's no biggie. If anything, it's a real treat to see his prized possession from a slightly different perspective. While Maurice didn't know it, at this point, he was only two months away from fully completing the process he'd started undergoing just four months earlier. Five months after initial viewing, the most obvious of the changes started occurring at this point. For a few months now, people at the office had been politely ignoring the peculiar changes to Maurice's size and skin, and his tendency to treat lunch break very differently to his colleagues. But the alterations that began at month five were impossible to ignore. First, the ears. They disappeared against the sides of Maurice's head. Instead, two other ears, pointy and furry, popped out of the top of his skull, half hidden amongst his hair. Then came the eyes. His sclera disappeared, and his pupils lengthened and narrowed into black, feline slits. And, of course, most inconvenient to Maurice's daily life, the disappearances of his thumbs and fingers. They shortened down to furry nubs until his hands weren't hands at all. They were more like paws. The transformation is almost complete. Six months after initial viewing. By now, the transformation is complete. Getting into art has changed Maurice's life forever. He has now quite literally become a cat. He paws through his apartment with his best friend, Felix, eating kibble to his heart's content. The one difference being that Maurice, despite his new form, retains all of his personality and mind. He can even talk, if you're the kind of person who enjoys talking to cats. Because Maurice had the foresight to leave a window open before the transformation fully took hold, he and Felix could come and go as they pleased. When the kibble ran out, they started running through the alleys together, foraging for scraps and hunting down mice and birds for sustenance. Maurice was reported missing a month ago, and there have been no leads in the case. Posters went up, searches were performed, but nothing was ever found. A few months after that, he'd been declared legally dead, to the human world at least. Laura never thought about him again after the news report stopped, and eventually his apartment was cleared out and resold. He and Felix would spend the rest of their days eking out a strange little existence together on the streets, just taking it day by day. And despite it all, Maurice is happy. In case you somehow hadn't gathered from all that, SCP-3270 is an anomalous painting of a cat lounging against a pillow. Isn't he adorable? You may be inclined to agree. But if you encounter the painting in person, that agreement may come at a heavy cost. While seeing secondary reproductions of the painting has no anomalous effect, seeing the real thing in person will cause horrific changes to the human body. Little by little, anyone who observes the painting directly has a considerable chance of turning into a cat, designated SCP-3270-1. These are no ordinary cats, of course. They're cats with human intelligence, human lifespans, and even the ability to speak. Despite cat physiology not being compatible with human speech, the painting itself is kept in Site-64, and any humans turned into cats by its anomalous powers are kept in Site-88, where they're very well taken care of. The idea of being turned into a cat and forever forsaking your humanity might horrify you, but you shouldn't worry about it too much. After all, cats have it pretty well. There's an app for that. Wait, hold on, I'm Steve Jobs! Come on, no stomach! It was a phrase so ubiquitous in the early days of the smartphone craze that it's hard to believe Apple actually has trademarked. It was a testament to a simple and immutable truth about the world these new touchscreen phones were creating. No matter how strange and obscure the need, there would be an app to fulfill it. Perhaps you remember iBeer, 
the app that allowed you to pretend you were drinking a tall glass of beer, for some reason. There was Car Matey, an app that reminded you where you parked your car, in a pirate voice. And who could forget I Am Bread, a surreal game about controlling a sentient slice of bread on a quest to become toast. But there's one app out there somewhere on the market that you probably didn't download. And if you did, well, you have our sincerest apologies. Because even seeing this video pop out onto your feed probably sent a chill down your spine. Well, if that chill ever even left. Take it from one gentleman whose life took a very strange turn after downloading a certain app that the SCP Foundation calls SCP-1471. Because the sentiment, there's an app for that, doesn't exclude experiencing mortal terror. Joe Lillis, an insurance salesman from Milwaukee, had just gone through another atrocious date. After a mediocre meal and an uncomfortable 35 minutes of inane babble, sensing the whole time that she really wasn't that interested, his date excused himself to take a quick phone call outside. Sadly for Joe, she never returned, leaving him to pick up the check. Of all the many words you could use to describe poor Joe Lillis, the most pertinent would be lonely. Ever since Carol, his wife of 10 years, had passed away in a freak accident, he'd been trying to find some kind of way to fill the void. They'd been high school sweethearts, intent on spending the rest of their lives with one another. As fate would have it, only Carol would get that tainted luxury. Joe would be forced to endure life after the joy of living had run its course. He only hoped he might be lucky enough to find love again. However, Joe was on the wrong side of 40, and as so many others his age were already hitched, he could feel his options going out one by one. Would he be destined to live out the rest of his days alone? Joe didn't feel like spending the back half of his life catching reruns of Seinfeld and tending to his fish. He needed to get out there. And thankfully, like the rest of us, he lived in the internet age. He had more apps, websites, online services, and hot Russian singles in his area than he knew what to do with. So surely one would have the right person for him. He tried them all. Tinder, Hinge, Match.com, Plenty of Fish, eHarmony, Bumble, Zeusk, OkCupid, FriendFinder, Deeply Lonely Singles with Low Expectations.com, and so much more. However, all it seemed to achieve was setting him up for more disappointment. None of the dates he'd managed to get ever resulted in anything getting serious. Heck, it was a minor miracle if he even managed to get any of them on a second date. Was this it? Was this his life now? Had he only ever gotten one shot at love, and the grasping claws of fate yanked it away from him without a second thought? Would life continue on the hamster wheel of loneliness? Sleeping, getting up, eating, working, and sleeping again? Every day getting somehow both faster and slower as life trudged on to a disappointing yet inevitable conclusion? What a terrible fate to find yourself trapped in. Whenever Joe started feeling maudlin like this, he knew it was time to get proactive again. Maybe the right woman was out there. There were billions of them, after all. Surely at least one of them would be the perfect person for him. He just needed the perfect app. He'd burned through all of the most reputable apps already, and was now perusing some of the slightlier, seedier options, most of which were likely data mining fronts from the Balkans. However, as generic app after generic app passed, something different caught his eye. The icon was a smiling cartoon dog, and its name was Mallow, version 1.0.0. This gave him a little chuckle. At the very least, it was very different branding from the rest of the dating apps he'd seen. Maybe it had just been sorted into the wrong section of the app store. He decided he'd check it out and take a look at the app's description. The description read, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mallow will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Well, it certainly provoked Joe's curiosity at the very least. He did want to banish his feelings of loneliness, and seeing as the app was free and apparently had no ads, he'd surely be foolish to not at least give it a whirl. What's the worst that could happen? 
He began the installation, and only then noticed that the app had no listed developer. It took up 9.8 megabytes of memory, which he wasn't tech-savvy enough to see any issues with. More than anything, Joe was just enticed by the prospect of finally having another chance at companionship with Mallow. After all, it is the next social substitute, whatever that means. However, Joe's excitement was quickly quashed when he hit the home screen button and noticed that the icon for the app never actually materialized. Strange. He checked the App Store portal again and saw that, according to them, the app had completely downloaded. What gives? Was it a glitch, or was Malo actually just malware? Either way, he was disheartened by the fact that this immaterial app certainly wouldn't be getting him any companionship. Or so he thought, anyway. Joe was used to disappointment by now, so he didn't take it too personally. He decided to just play out the rest of his evening on autopilot, making himself some soup, doing the laundry, watching more Seinfeld reruns, taking a cold shower, and preparing to cry himself to sleep again. Malo was already becoming a distant memory, just like all the deceptive sources of home. But one strange thing happened that disrupted Joe's finely tuned evening routine. He received a text message. This was incredibly strange, because nobody ever seemed to text him. The last text he got was from Carol just before her accident, so it was almost surreal to hear that alert sound now, after everything that happened. He checked and saw that the text was an image attachment sent from an unknown number. Perplexed yet curious, he decided to open it. His curiosity soon gave way to a kind of melancholy nostalgia when he saw that the photo was of his and Carol's favorite cafe in town. They'd spent many a morning there, back when she was alive, treating themselves to a nice cup of coffee and perhaps a croissant. Just seeing it again caused an involuntary smile to spread across his face. It never even occurred to him, as it probably would have to others, that this could be seen as a little creepy. He hadn't frequented the bakery since Carol died. How would anyone even know that this place held any significance for him? Was it a stalker, a ghost, or just a spooky coincidence? None of these thoughts even crossed Joe's mind. He was just grateful for the surprising reminder of the happiness he'd once had. For the next couple hours, things seemed lighter. He went about his evening, checking the photo every so often and smiling, until eventually he found himself in bed, still looking into the glow of his phone. It was such a beautiful little cafe. Then he froze. He noticed something in the picture. It'd been there the whole time, but only now he was seeing rather than just looking. It was in the corner, staring through the glass of the cafe's door. So faint, he almost wanted to dismiss it as a trick of the light. It was a face. Well, not a face, more like a skull. Not a human, not anywhere near human. Long, slender, and canine, with protruding fangs and vacant white eyes. The pure white of the skull was buried in a nest of thick black hair. It looked like it was crouching behind the door, looking out and grinning, whatever the hell it was. Just seeing it changed the entire tone of the picture. It was no longer a simple reminder of bygone joy. Now, all that was radiating out of that image was a palpable sense of dread. Was someone playing some kind of awful prank on him? Just then, he was jogged from his contemplation by another alert. A new message from the same number as before. With great hesitation, he hovered his thumb over the push notification and clicked. That's when everything got a lot worse. It was a photo of a bus stop. Not just any bus stop, of course. It was stop C16 the one that Joe always took to get to work. It looked like it was taken relatively early in the morning, but nobody was there. Well, not quite nobody. There was that figure again. It stood at full height, behind the partially frosted glass that makes up the back of the bus stop. The same large black humanoid shape, with a white, grinning dog skull where the face should be. Something about it terrified him on such a primal level, like the way our lizard brain reacts to some ancient apex predator. And whatever this thing was, it clearly knew something about him. How else could it stage all these photos? Joe got out of bed and looked out of the window, down onto his dark front street. Empty, thankfully. But after this surprise nightmare, he wasn't going to take any chances. He grabbed a kitchen knife from downstairs and placed it on his bedside cabinet, right next to his phone, with 911 on speed dial. 
Joe Lillis, a 43-year-old man, slept with the lights on that night for the first time in over 30 years. Sadly for him, the nightmare was just beginning. The next morning, Joe woke up unharmed, but he wasn't pleased to see that he'd gotten several more texts in his sleep. There was one taken outside of the local insurance company office where he worked. The strange creature with the skull for a face was looming around the corner, peering at the camera with its lipless grin, like it was mocking him. Another photo was taken at the local supermarket where Joe did most of his grocery shopping. The frame was centralized on the cereal aisle, bordered on both sides by walls of garish mascots endlessly repeated. Down at the far end of the aisle was a looming dark figure with that cold canine skull where a human face should be. There were a few more, but worst of all was the last one. It was taken at the cemetery, in the foreground a headstone reading, Carol Lillis, beloved wife and daughter. Joe was horrified to see that skull-faced beast was rising up behind his wife's grave, long clawed fingers curling around the top of the headstone. That was the moment that Joe decided to go to the police about all of this, before things got even more out of hand. He called an Uber to get down to the station. He certainly didn't feel like he was going anywhere near his regular bus stop after last night. He showed the photos he'd been sent so far to an officer posted at the station, and they agreed that there was certainly something strange about it. While the behavior undeniably bordered on harassment, it hadn't yet delved into criminal territory, so he would sadly be on his own until then. The best they could do was stay in touch and kept abreast of any new developments. The only sage advice they could give him was not to delete the photos, as they could always be used as evidence in court later if things escalated. This was literally the last result that Joe wanted out of this. Considering how bizarre and threatening things were getting already, he really didn't want to find out what escalation looked like in this case. But what else could he do but carry on, just trying to exercise as much caution as he could in these strange new circumstances? He went to work and tried his best to stay productive, despite the fact that every three or so hours, a new photo would arrive. Places that he liked to sit in the local parks, stores he'd frequent, restaurants he liked to eat at. The nightmare skeleton dog thing would be standing in all of them, just mugging for the camera. On one hand, every time he looked at one of the photos, Joe felt like he was giving this freak exactly what they wanted. On the other hand, how could he possibly look away? What if he missed something that could save his life? It carried on much like that until later in the evening. Joe may have not been a genius, but he was no fool either. He'd seen too many of those seedy true crime documentaries about kidnapping to take his normal route home. He took a real detour, frequently checking over his shoulder the entire time. Much to his relief, he didn't see anything out of place. Good. When he got home, he locked every door and bolted every window. Nothing would be getting the jump on him tonight. That's when the next picture came in. A photograph of Joe's empty office cubicle, with the bony face of the creature looming over the divider with a grin. He could feel his heart pounding away in his chest just looking at it. How did this thing get around like this? How was it able to infiltrate everywhere in his entire goddamn life? Suddenly, he felt a smile spreading across his face. This freak had just messed up big time. Before all these creepy photos had been taken in public places, but the one taken in his office? Oh, this crossed the line into trespassing. The police would have to do something about it now. It had given him an ace up his sleeve. That confidence faded a few hours later when he received another photo. This time, it was the skull-faced monster just standing on the sidewalk. The sidewalk that Joe remembered walking on his covert alternative route. He could feel himself break into a cold sweat. It seemed, whoever this was, he really did hold no secrets from them. Now more than ever, Joe didn't feel safe in his own home. So you can only imagine how he felt when a few hours later, he received a photo of the skull-faced stalker standing right outside his own front door, staring into the camera. It sent him rushing to the window again to check outside, but of course, nobody was there. The next day, when he called the police and updated them on the situation, they told him that they were doing all they could. The best thing he could possibly do was to remain calm, but vigilant. He needed to keep an eye on the photos being sent to him, so he could notify them if ever he was in any immediate danger. This put poor Joe's paranoia at a fever pitch. 
Even when he went to work, surrounded by his co-workers, by witnesses, he could scarcely tear his eyes away from his phone. He was a slave to the photos, forever waiting for the next one, only to experience crushing regret when the photo actually arrived. It looked like it was taken moments before it was sent to him. Joe saw himself looking at his own phone in his office cubicle, with that huge skull-faced figure looming behind him. He screamed out loud upon seeing it, and turned to see if anything was behind him. But of course, there was nothing there. The police inspected the office, talked to potential witnesses, and analyzed the photo. It showed no signs of any photographic manipulation, but there were also no witnesses around the office who claimed to see anything strange that day. There was also no security camera footage in the last several days that showed this figure coming in or out. Joe Lillis started to feel like he was going insane, and perhaps he was, but that didn't change the tangible and ever-present feeling that he was in great danger. He didn't come into work the next day. He'd received more photos like that in the night, of himself, taken in real time, with that skull face freak looming. He didn't want to leave the house. He didn't want to go anywhere anymore. He just didn't feel safe out there. How could he, with all this madness unfolding? There was a time where he could have said something like, at least it only seems confined to my phone. He might have even suspected that it had something to do with that strange Malo app he downloaded a few days prior that hadn't seemed to do anything. But this situation had evolved since then. He wasn't just seeing the creature in photos anymore. It was here. He kept seeing quick flashes of it on the other side of windows, in reflections, in the corner of his eyes, always darting away if ever he turned towards it. It was everywhere and nowhere. It was here just for him. He just knew. The police couldn't help. Nobody could help. Joe just sat in the corner of his bedroom, clutching his kitchen knife, afraid to close his eyes. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. We know one thing for sure. Joe Lillis never felt truly alone ever again. He always had his new friend, waiting, just out of sight. And if ever you're feeling lonesome and decide to download Malau version 1.0.0 yourself, then you'll never feel lonely again, either. It was July of 2004, and Bill Murray was enjoying the peak of an extremely successful career. Not only had the iconic actor starred in some of the most beloved comedies of the 20th century, including Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day, he'd voiced the main character of the recently released live-action Garfield movie. It'd been a financial success, but it was a critical flop. Not that this bothered Bill. He was happy with the performance. And the paycheck. What he wouldn't be quite as happy about was the horrifying encounter he was about to have with SCP-3166. On July 8th, Bill was enjoying a cold drink on the porch of his luxurious Beverly Hills home. The sky was beginning to darken as the sun set in the west. It was a blissful evening. His wife Jennifer was inside, watching TV. Nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary until he noticed a quick flash of orange in the distance. It was almost too fast to register, this large orange shape darting past the corner of his eye. For a second, he entertained the thought that it might have been an escaped tiger, but it was gone too fast to really tell. Bill finished his drink and headed inside. He had enough for one night. The next morning, he got up to read the paper and found the Garfield movie getting slaughtered by the critics. One review stated, No one can accuse Garfield the movie of infidelity to its source. It faithfully conveys the banality of Jim Davis's cartoon. Another called it, A film without energy and without spirit. He put the paper down and ate his breakfast. A few blows to the ego were worth it for the paydays that came with big-budget family films. Just then, his wife came to him with a strange question. Were you walking around downstairs in the middle of the night? No, he hadn't. He'd been sleeping like a baby. Why did she ask? Well, Jennifer said, I heard some rustling downstairs last night. It sounded like something big. He hadn't heard anything, though, and told her it was probably just her imagination. He put it out of his mind and continued about his day. He decided he would keep his eyes peeled for that orange blur again, though. Bill didn't see anything peculiar the rest of the morning and went to a local cafe for lunch. He ordered a coffee and a cream cheese bagel, then made a quick trip to the bathroom while his food was prepared. When Bill returned to his table, though, there was something strange. Instead of a bagel, 
There was a large heaping of lasagna on the table. What was going on? This cafe didn't even serve lasagna. Bill knew something was terribly wrong. Things only got stranger when Bill came home to find a small tuft of orange fur snagged on the frame of his front door. And it wasn't synthetic fur like you'd see on plush toys or stuffed animals. No, this was real animal fur. Maybe someone was just goofing off or trying to play some weird prank on him. But it didn't feel like it. Deep down, Bill Murray knew that he was in grave danger. Whoever or whatever was behind this. It wanted to hurt him. That night, his worst fears were realized. Bill's wife had left town for the week, and he was headed to the kitchen in the middle of the night for a glass of water, when he saw something. A huge figure moving up against the glass door leading to his backyard. The thing was huge, nearly seven feet tall, with a bloated, fur-covered, misshapen body that was pressed up against the door. Its fur was bright, garish orange, a cartoon orange. Strangest of all, though, was the sound it was making. It sounded like it was purring. Bill backed away from the door and then ran back to his room to hide. The whole night he sat cowering as he heard scratching against the walls, like something was trying to get in. He was terrified and too scared to do anything, even move. Finally, as morning broke, the noises seemed to stop. Bill had to do something. He couldn't let this nightmare go on another night. What if things got worse? What if that thing managed to get inside? He called the local police and when they arrived, he explained the incredibly strange situation as best he could. He told them he was being stalked by some kind of huge cat, or at least someone dressed like a huge cat. Also, there was lasagna involved. The officers interviewing him could barely contain their laughter as he told them his story. A giant orange cat? Perhaps one of them theorized. He angered some kind of obsessive Garfield fan through his involvement in the live-action movie. After all, the original comic had been running for years and had been extremely popular. Who knows what kind of nutjobs were obsessed with seeing only a faithful adaptation of the source material. As the officers departed, Bill was confident that they weren't taking him seriously. He couldn't rely on any of them for protection. Thankfully, from a multi-decade movie career, he had plenty of disposable income and decided to hire a private security team to protect him while he looked into this mystery. He had two trained bodyguards positioned around his home at all times for the next month. They were armed and given the cryptic orders to fire on anything orange. Meanwhile, Bill began to fall down a Garfield rabbit hole. He felt strangely compelled to research all the Garfield media he could find, as though the answer to his terrifying situation was somehow hidden between the lines. Bill explored the entire backlog of thousands of comic strips. He read the books and interviews with Jim Davis. He watched the cartoons and straight-to-DVD animated movies. Ironically, for a guy who'd recently portrayed the lasagna-loving orange cat, Bill had never felt quite so immersed in the character before. He found the strange pathos in the routine of Garfield and his friends. One particular comic really piqued his interest, though. Originally published in October of 1989, the comic began with Garfield being woken up by a strange chill, an almost eerie sensation. The character observed aloud that he didn't feel like he was in his own home. He explored his little home further, trying to find his owner John or his housemaid and sometimes nemesis, Odie, but found nothing. As Garfield remarked on feeling alone, a purple speech box delivered the sinister message. You have no idea how alone you are, Garfield. He then finds that his home looks like it's been abandoned for years. The for sale sign outside is practically ancient. Garfield slowly comes to a horrifying revelation. Everyone really is gone, and his adventures and friends now exist only in his imagination. He's trapped in a prison of his own creation, trying to stave off his endless loneliness in denial about the reality of his situation. The comic ended with a quote directly from Jim Davis himself saying, an imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shade perceptions of the present, or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending upon how we conduct ourselves today. As he read those words, hmm. Bill Murray felt a chill down his spine. Why had he wanted to get involved in the Garfield movie in the first place? What had he gotten himself into? Before he could slip any deeper into his own mind, Bill heard a faint, choked scream downstairs. 
He felt his breath catch in his throat. He was terrified, but needed to see what was happening. He carefully and quietly began to creep down the stairs. At the bottom, he poked his head around a corner, and that's when he saw a member of his security detail lying dead on the floor. His face was blue from asphyxiation. His mouth was stuffed with lasagna. It looked like he had been force-fed to death. Bill wanted to scream, but he couldn't, or maybe knew he shouldn't. Just then, he heard a soft, meaty thumping noise coming from the nearby living room. He didn't know why, but he felt compelled to approach, as if by forces beyond his control. He made his way to the living room, and when he'd got there, he saw where the noise was coming from. Bill's jaw dropped in pure horror. There was the other member of his security detail, lying limp and lifeless under a giant orange figure. It was a grotesquely huge creature, wearing what looked to be a kind of crude Garfield outfit made of sewn-together cat pelts. It stank of pasta and rotten meat. In its giant paw, it held a golden trophy, which it was using to pound the security guard's head into mush, while making quiet, cat-like purring noises. The creature suddenly stopped and looked up, locking eyes with Bill. The fear of death came over him. He froze as the giant, freakish Garfield stepped over Donnie's corpse and began to come towards him. Bill turned and ran, but Garfield was gaining on him. Before he could make it to the front door, the creature knocked him over. He was laid out on the ground, looking up at it as it reached into its own body cavity and began to pull out handfuls of lasagna. He was about to shove a wad of the horrible decaying pasta into Bill's mouth when suddenly a ding was heard and the creature stopped. It looked up as if sniffing the air, and then suddenly turned and lumbered towards the kitchen. Bill watched as the Garfield monster entered the kitchen where, somehow, there was a steaming hot fresh lasagna sitting in the open oven. The creature had sensed the presence of external lasagna and felt the compulsion to integrate it into its body, grabbing fistfuls and shoving it into itself. Just then, a group of highly trained SCP Foundation personnel burst into the room and subdued the creature. It had been an ambush. The Foundation had been tipped off to the presence of the creature by monitoring the local police department dispatches, and the report of a seven-foot-tall comic book cat terrorizing a Hollywood actor was definitely worth looking into. The monster that had almost taken Bill Murray's life was SCP-3166, a deadly pataphysical being that tends to manifest around people somehow involved in the Garfield intellectual property. It appears whenever the public perception of Garfield falls out of favor, and because Bill had starred in the critically panned Garfield movie, he was currently at the very top of SCP-3166's hit list. Thankfully, he managed to survive his terrifying ordeal, and was administered amnestics by Foundation personnel so that he could return to his normal life. This frightening and mysterious creature has been around since 1989, appearing after the publication of the haunting Garfield comic that Bill had read that very night. It appeared in the office of United Media, who were the publishers of the Garfield comic strip at the time, and began wrecking havoc. Since then, the creature's manifestation has been a constant threat whenever Garfield loses its popularity or audience. As a result, the Foundation has spent years as the funding source behind all Garfield media, and even planting hypnotic mimetics into the comic strips to ensure that there is always a loyal fan base. The fur is indeed real organic cat fur, albeit an unnaturally orange color, and instead of organs, the creature is filled with lasagna. Worst of all, though, is that testing has revealed that the meat in the lasagna is genetically identical to the flesh of Garfield's creator, Jim Davis. How did this thing come into existence? Perhaps it was Jim's sheer force of imagination that dragged it into being. As he himself said, an imagination is a powerful tool. All in all, it's lucky that Bill Murray was able to survive his encounter and return to his normal life. Well, as normal as life can be for Bill Murray. And if you see Bill Murray, don't bother asking him about SCP-3166. The amnestics were quite effective, and just as he's fond of saying himself, no one will ever believe you. Josie is a half-cat. No, she isn't half-cat, half-something else. And she's not a humanoid with feline features either. She is literally half of a cat. Actually, to be more precise, she is the front half, but an otherwise ordinary black and gray tabby cat. 
that is ordinary apart from having no visible back legs or hindquarters. You might think that'd make it hard for Josie to get around, but if you asked her on how only being a half-cat affects her on a daily basis, well, she wouldn't be able to answer you due to the simple fact that cats generally can't speak. But nevertheless, Josie will happily and effortlessly walk around on her own two legs, moving as if she had a second pair of hind legs in place behind her. Her back half isn't invisible, it's as if it's not even there at all, not showing up on x-rays, and yet it can give a slight yield when touched, being almost tangible but not fully. Despite this, Josie suffers no adverse health problems or any other complications despite lacking one half of her body. Occasionally, she doesn't mind having her semi-corporeal hindquarters stroked, although she will usually get a little bit scratchy if people try that. So how does the SCP Foundation keep an anomaly like Josie contained? Well, it turns out that they don't really need to. She's perfectly harmless and is actually allowed to roam freely around the lower levels of the facility she's kept at. Casually as you like, she slinks around the corridors, passing from one room to the next. Of course, if cats could talk, then Josie would probably tell you that she has the run of the whole facility. The only real question left is, what does a half-cat do when she's left to wander around a Foundation facility completely unsupervised? Easy, she starts looking for a ball of yarn. Josie was sure she'd seen one somewhere around here. One of the researchers had carried it off for testing not too long ago. Her small front paws padded against the ground as Josie navigated her way to where she last remembered seeing that coveted ball of yarn being taken. She passed a group of researchers, one of them kneeling down to give her a friendly scratch behind the ears. Just as she closed her eyes and purred at the greeting, a sound coming from down the hall startled her. It was a low, distressed sobbing. Having never been taught that old saying about curiosity in cats, Josie slunk past the researcher's legs towards the source of the noise. The room that the crying was coming from had no windows, no way for her to get in. Luckily, Josie, despite only having half a body, had enough determination and resourcefulness for two whole cats. Around the corner, she knew there was an open air vent, and sure enough, she leaped gracefully up to it with ease. The cold metal tunnel was just big enough to accommodate her little furry self as she crawled through, the echoing sound of sobs guiding her. As she reached the grate looking out into the windowless room, Josie spotted a tall, thin creature sitting with its back to her. Its arms would have been long enough to reach the ground if it had stood at its full height, but for now they were wrapped tightly around its legs as the creature rocked back and forth. Its loud wails showed that it was clearly in a great deal of distress, although Josie wouldn't be able to understand why having someone look at its face would make this slender creature so upset. Nearby, there was a giant metal cube with a hole ripped in it, and while the rest of the room was empty, there seemed to be several large red smears on the ground. How strange. She cocked her head to one side and meowed, tapping one paw against the air vent grate. It seemed pretty loose. With a few good pushes, the screws came free, and the adorable half-cat hopped down into the room. As she got closer to the creature, she noticed it had a black bag covering its face. Little did Josie know, an hour earlier, a junior researcher had made the terrible mistake of putting on a pair of X-ray glasses he ordered from the back of a comic book. As it turns out, these were the only ones to ever actually work. He saw right through 096's containment cube, and all hell had broken loose. But Josie didn't mind. She decided to endear herself to the strange, shy creature by rubbing up against its long leg. Returning the same affection that it had so rarely been given, it bent down and gently scooped Josie up in its spindly arms. The pair of them sat in the corner together, Josie getting herself comfortable on the tall creature's lap, purring as long fingers ran over her tabby fur. The creature, being so careful not to harm the half-cat, treated her like she was as delicate as glass. It had briefly stopped crying thanks to its visitor, and as much as she noticed the sounds of sobbing had ceased, Josie would never understand the difference she had made to SCP-096's day. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before their encounter was cut short. A legion of guards in scramble goggles burst into the room to retake control of the situation. The last thing they expected to see was 096 sitting calmly with Josie on its lap and a bag covering its face. 
but the sudden entrance of a security team startled the poor half-cat. Within a second, she had bolted out of the room, shooting under the legs of the guards and back out into the facility. Now that she was back outside, Josie recalled her earlier hunt for a ball of yarn to play with. She still wasn't sure where it had gotten to. Maybe someone had moved it. Pacing over to the elevator, she stared up at the heavy steel doors. The numbers above were gradually ticking down, denoting which floor the elevator had currently stopped at. Of course, Josie couldn't read, so instead she sat and meowed loudly at the elevator. Maybe if she made enough noise, the doors would eventually open. Eventually, after a few short minutes of waiting and growling, the doors slid apart. Another gaggle of researchers passed her by, and Josie plodded into the elevator, spotting a familiar face. One of the researchers, a doctor by the name of Sophie Cartwright, was still inside and smiled down at the half-cat explorer. Dr. Cartwright had come across Josie a few times, enough for the intrepid little tabby to consider them friends. Where to, Josie? Dr. Cartwright asked, her hand hovering over the elevator's buttons. As if in reply, Josie looked up and meowed. Humans always seemed to smile if she meowed after they'd said something to her. Sophie chuckled and pushed the door close button. Hold the elevator, another much gravelier voice called. A hand, or rather a paw, reached out and caught the doors before they could slide closed. It was another of the Foundation's doctors, one with both a considerable reputation and a very distinguishing look to say the least. Dr. Kane Pathos Crow stepped inside the elevator and pushed one of the buttons. Sophie had to force herself to keep her head down, but couldn't help herself from stealing the occasional glance up at Dr. Crow. She heard the rumors about a peculiar anomalous event changing his appearance, but had never seen him up close before. Josie, on the other hand, couldn't take her eyes off Crow, staring up at him, frozen to the spot and letting out a low, cautious whine. If her tail was visible, Sophie would have seen it swaying from side to side as the brave little half-cat kept her defensive ground, standing between her friend Dr. Cartwright and her mortal enemy. You see, Dr. Crow was a dog, or at least a man who had been turned into something very much like a dog, still capable of speech but with a distinctively canine body. Crow kept to himself the entire ride down, although Sophie could feel the tension between the dog-bodied doctor and her little half-cat friend. Out of the corner of his eye, Dr. Crow spotted Josie, trying his best to ignore her. He let out a low, discomforted growl, the kind a dog makes when they're on edge. To his credit, he couldn't really help it. The man had been turned into a canine after all, but it took all his stoicism to suppress a bark and to stop himself from chasing Josie around the cramped elevator. Arriving at her floor, Sophie stepped down, followed by little Josie, who moved as far away from Crow as quickly as she could. The doors closed once more and sent him further down into the depths of the facility. As she turned to look, Sophie noticed Josie had craned her head up to check on her. Aw, were you protecting me, Josie? She asked with a smile, bending down to thank the half-cat with a scratch behind the ears. Before she could stay for too long, Josie and her human companion parted, each heading down separate winding corridors. There was a funny smell hanging in the air, like something gradually melting and bubbling, only to reform and melt again filling the half-cat's pink nose with a strange burning scent. As she passed a holding cell, something broke Josie's concentration yet again, the noise of a hand tapping at glass. She turned and instantly meowed a greeting to the second familiar face of the day, albeit a more beaked face. Kneeling down on the other side of the glass, the black-robed plague doctor waved politely at the dual-pawed passerby. Sitting in front of the glass, hoping to be let in, Josie gave another meow. I am quite well. The doctor mused. And how are you, my dear? He asked politely. Josie got up on her back legs. Or rather, that's what it would have looked like if she had hindquarters. Instead, it looked like she was almost floating in place from halfway down, stretching her front paws up, reaching towards the bird-like face as the masked doctor playfully tapped his fingers against the glass to amuse his feline friend. No, I cannot let you in, I'm afraid. He sighed, sounding a touch more melancholic. Not that a half-cat can understand the difference in someone's cadence. Not all of us here are gifted the freedom you enjoy, my furry friend. Freedom is not something this organization would ever understand. No matter how much they claim to know us, the fact of the matter is they never really listen. 
From the other side of the glass, Josie blinked and cocked her head to one side, confused. She'd barely heard a word he said. Oh, but listen to me go on. The plague doctor chuckled, wrapping his fingers in front of the half-cat again. I suppose you'll be looking for that ball of yarn they took for testing. I saw them carrying the box. It was in that way. He pointed, and Josie's little green cat eyes followed the direction of his finger. Barely able to comprehend what had been said to her, she simply meowed up in thanks and plotted the way she'd been directed. Farewell, little Josie. As CP-049 said quietly from inside its cell, watching the half-cat until she had disappeared from view. As she continued through the lower levels of the facility, Josie slipped through doors seconds before they closed, leapt up onto tables and dashed between legs. That strange smell was back, having caught her attention and distracted her from her quest again. Tracking it to its source, Josie suddenly felt uneasy. She entered a room with a huge vat of acid, the source of the burning scent she'd picked up on. Though it was what was inside the vat, trapped in a loop of regenerating itself only to be melted over and over again by the acid, that got her feeling defensive. The vast reptilian monstrosity sensed a small life form outside its tank and opened one yellow eye, squinting through the searing, burning acid at the tiny little creature staring up at it. The reptile snarled, screwing its now healed eyes shut and swiping what was left of its limbs at the glass. Rearing back, Josie gave the monster her fiercest hiss, burying her fangs at it. The beast usually abhorred other beings, finding all other forms of life unnatural, unforgivable, and so detestable that it would normally stop at nothing to eradicate them. But today a tiny tabby cat with her entire back half missing was standing up to the crocodilian nightmare, and it barely had enough will to retaliate. Maybe it was just too lethargic, too tired to try anything today. Perhaps it didn't think she was worth the effort or figured it would see to her, along with the researchers and guards, next time it broke free from containment and went on yet another killing spree. But in Josie's mind, this facility was her home, and the brave little half-cat had scared SCP-682 into staying put. As she trotted away again, she knew that the monstrous reptile would have to think twice before messing with her. Back on track at last, Josie rounded the corner and arrived in a familiar-looking corridor. She was certain this was where she'd seen a researcher carrying the box containing the string that she coveted. Sure enough, she could see into the room where the box had been left, noticing a group of researchers and a human in an orange jumpsuit were gathered around it. A few were making notes on their clipboards at a safe distance, while the one in orange stepped closer to the box. Josie watched as a single bee flew out of the box. Her feline eyes followed it, ready to pounce if it came close enough. The man wearing the jumpsuit was waving his arms, trying to swat the insect away. A moment later, he grabbed his arm in pain. The bee had gotten agitated, stinging him and flying away, somehow surviving. As she waited, Josie's patience was rewarded. The researchers and the man wearing orange bustled their way out of the room, offering her the chance she needed to zip between them and get one step closer to her prize. The room was entirely empty, save for the box in the center, sitting precariously atop a table. Wiggling herself as she readied her invisible and intangible back legs, Josie shot up, just missing the table's edge. She clawed and scratched at the surface trying to pull herself up, but her lack of hindquarters made it impossible to climb the rest of the way. Dropping back to the floor, she looked up at the table and gave it a loud, indignant meow. Changing tactics, she started to hop up on one of the table legs, digging her claws into the woodwork to hoist herself up bit by bit. Sure enough, her new strategy worked a treat, and Josie was presented with what she had been searching for. One final hurdle was left, however. The box was closed. Now the struggles of only being a half-cat are one thing, but not having opposable thumbs is a difficulty that has plagued all cats since the dawn of time. But not being able to grab or hold things with the ease of a human, there's one thing that cats are great at, and that's pushing things over. Nudging the box to the table's edge with a gentle boop of her nose, Josie eventually tipped the whole thing off, causing it to land on its side on the floor, the lid falling open. Triumphantly, she jumped back down to claim her prize, expecting to find the ball of yarn and spend the next few hours playing with it. But something was wrong. The yarn had changed and now it was… looking at her. The ball had started as yarn and ribbon, the perfect plaything for any half-cat or full cat for that matter but the Foundation had been running their usual invasive tests on it, and since cutting a portion of the string off, it had transformed. It was now a ball of meat, 
functioning, blinking eyes staring out of a mass of overlapping sinew and blood-red matter. The multiple eyes looked up at the half-cat that had knocked it to the floor and asked a single question in a deep voice emanating from somewhere within its lipless form. Are you Eric? Completely unfazed by this, Josie whacked the ball with her paw and watched as it rolled halfway across the room. Tentacle segments of its body gradually pulled the amorphous mass back to where it started and then asked once again, Are you Eric? Once again, Josie slapped the ball and watched it roll away from her, both completely unaware of who Eric was and a little perturbed that someone had replaced the ball of yarn with such an inadequate toy. Turning her back on SCP-066, Josie the Halfcat searched for a way out of the room and went back to prowling around the facility for something to entertain herself. She noticed that she was starting to get hungry. Maybe if she got lucky, one of the researchers would sneak her a piece of cheese. In an old house, an old woman gathers her knitting supplies. This is a special project for a little boy named Tommy she loves dearly. She knits furiously, and soon the mix of cotton, synthetic fiber, and cloth of every color turn from raw materials into something else. A teddy bear. She puts the finishing touches on the bear. This is a very special bear, after all. And sends the patchwork bear off to its destination with a red Get Well card. The card is labeled Kairos the Bear, and inside she writes a personal note. To Tommy, because only time can mend all wounds. Love, Grammy. But this package of love would never reach its destination. SCP-2295 was found at the side of a crashed mail truck, and it looks exactly like a standard handmade teddy bear, with one difference. On the left side of its chest, just under its jaunty tan bow, it wears a heart-shaped pin. But not a standard cartoon heart. This is a disturbingly realistic, anatomically correct pin of a heart organ. And that's because SCP-2295 has a specific purpose, and it's one that has everything to do with actual human organs. SCP-2295 spends most of its time completely inert, spending its days as just another cuddly stuffed toy. Tests performed on the toy revealed that it had no unusual properties and seems to be a normal handmade keepsake. That is, until someone is injured in its presence. Not any injury will do. A paper cut or even a broken arm, for example, won't do much to activate its anomalous properties. But if it detects a critical injury to a human organ nearby, it will trigger a secret power. One that the Foundation is still trying to figure out how it works. Because SCP-2295 is a miracle worker. When it senses the presence of someone with a serious injury to an organ and is within two meters of them, SCP-2295 springs into action. Suddenly, from unknown sources, the bear will produce objects including scissors, white thread, and sewing needles or a crocheting hook from its mouth. If there are any crafting supplies on hand, it will incorporate those as well. And then it gets to work. Despite only having hands made of fabric and stuffing with no fingers, the anomalous bear is still able to craft what will end up being a patchwork recreation of the damaged human's organ. Cute, if a little creepy, but that's just the beginning. The injured person mysteriously falls unconscious, and the patchwork organ, which the Foundation has designated as SCP-2295-1 instance, will disappear. The SCP-2295-1 instance will then physically replace the damaged organ inside the person's body. It's unknown how this happens. The patchwork organ will simply appear inside of their body, taking the place of the original lung or kidney, or whichever organ was failing. It's unknown where the original organ goes to, since it seems to just disappear as soon as the 2295-1 instance takes its place. Surprisingly, having this new cotton-stuffed heart or liver does not seem to cause any harm, and in fact, it works exactly like the real thing. There are never any of the usual issues that come with a transplant, like the risk of it being rejected by the body, as the organic tissue seems to have no issue connecting with the organ and treating it like it was there all along. In all instances of SCP-2295 performing this adorable but rudimentary surgery, the subjects have made a full and complete recovery. SCP-2295 might sound like a miracle worker, but that isn't to say that its abilities aren't without their own set of complications. When faced with two injured subjects, SCP-2295 seems to always gravitate towards fixing the younger subject up first, maybe owing to its creation by a grandmother who wanted to heal whatever was ailing her grandson. 
No one knows who Tommy was or exactly what disease or injury he was recovering from, but his grandmother clearly felt it was serious enough to create this special bear for him. While SCP-2295 will heal anyone, it seems to be primarily a guardian for the young, and it takes its duties very seriously, even to the point of self-sacrifice. While SCP-2295 is able to pull some of its supplies out of thin air, it still always needs some raw materials to craft the new organ, including fabric and stuffing. And if there are none available, SCP-2295 will obtain them the hard way. The patchwork bear will sacrifice its own body, tearing itself open and removing any fabric or stuffing it needs without any concern for its own well-being. In order to craft a new organ for its patient, it slowly regenerates its own stuffing, at the rate of around a gram of stuffing per day, but it needs to harvest fabric to repair its outer layer, which the Foundation happily makes available to it, offering it a variety of patterns and types. It's no surprise that a teddy bear capable of healing mortal wounds would be of great interest to the SCP Foundation, and as soon as it was recovered from the crash mail truck, they immediately began tests to find out more about it. Could it heal literally any organ? Were there any limits to its abilities? There was only one way to find out, and the Foundation had the perfect test subjects, D-Class personnel, whose interactions with non-cuddly teddy bear SCPs frequently left them with critical external and internal injuries. The first test subject brought in, D-2353, a 38-year-old man who was in poor health not due to his work as a D-Class personnel but from his years and years of heavy smoking. His lungs were seriously damaged, which gave him trouble breathing and made any serious physical exertion extremely difficult. He wasn't critically injured or in danger of dying immediately, but that didn't matter to SCP-2295. D-2353 quickly passed out, and the bear sprang into action. It proceeded to take two textile swatches, one black and one red, and create a pair of fabric lungs which it installed in the patient. When he awoke, D-2353 found he had full healthy lung function again, as if he never picked up his deadly habit. But now the Foundation researchers needed to know how SCP-2295 would do with even more complicated ailments. D-3542 was 50 years old and his heart was not in good shape. Not only did he have a serious case of atherosclerosis, which is a disease where cholesterol plaque builds up and blocks blood flow and can put you at serious risk of a heart attack, but he also had an irregular heartbeat. This D-Class was in bad shape, but that was no problem for SCP-2295, who took a collection of different colors of yarn and a crochet hook and created a plushy heart. Just like the lungs had acted as if they were completely regular organs, after the heart anomalously ended up inside the man's chest, it began to beat normally and performed all the complicated functions of a human heart. But there was one detail that shocked the onlooking doctors. Before the yarn organ had vanished, the doctors had seen that it was beating. So is there any organ that SCP-2295 can't replace? That was about to be tested when D-7894 was brought in. A 24-year-old woman, she had suffered serious burns all over her torso, left abdomen, and right leg. She was brought in and sedated to numb the agonizing pain, and researchers were worried that they had come up against the limit of SCP-2295's abilities, since the skin is the largest organ after all. But SCP-2295 wasn't phased at all. The bear immediately started sewing segments of patchwork fabric and layering them onto the damaged skin, replacing the dermis and epidermis layer by layer. Unlike the other cases, these replacement organs are visible, and D-7894 now has patchwork skin, just like her talented surgeon. And amazingly, the fabric has the same sense of touch that her regular skin did. The final test of SCP-2295's abilities came with D-2723, who was only 18 years old. This last-minute D-Class test was performed because he was showing signs of severe cerebral hemorrhage, the kind that would cause brain damage in only minutes, and would be followed soon after by complete brain death. SCP-2295 sprung to life, but as soon as it examined the test subject, it became distressed. It started frantically grasping at random material around it, as if it didn't know what to do with them. Then it reached inside itself and provided a large chocolate bar, 
which it offered to the subject, sadly to no effect. It then seemed to admit defeat as it grabbed tightly onto the subject's leg. Observers reported that it was leaking a tear-like solution from its small knitted eyes as it embraced the dying D-Class in his final moments. Sadly, it seems that the human brain is the one mystery that even SCP-2295 can't solve. SCP-2295 appears to pose no threat to anyone and was classified as safe after testing. It is inactive when not in the presence of an injured person and has never displayed hostile instincts when active. The Foundation determined that it should be stored in a standard containment locker in Site-37, where it can be kept safely until it's needed for tests or to repair an injured SCP personnel. Access is limited to those with Level 3 or higher security clearance, and any contact with the bear is highly regulated. But there is one element of SCP-2295's existence that continues to worry Foundation staff. SCP-2295's full origins and the grandmother who crafted it are unknown. The note it was found with is the only clue as to where it may have come from, but there are plenty within the Foundation who are suspicious of the veracity of this letter, and they have good reason not to be too trusting because another bear with similar abilities exists, and it is distinctly less benevolent than SCP-2295. SCP-1048 is also a teddy bear, but it is capable of moving on its own and communicating through gestures at all times. It was initially allowed to wander around independently and seemed to make its home at Site-24 a happier place, but then it began to display its own crafting abilities. SCP-1048 is able to craft duplicates of itself, and while the original was seemingly harmless, the ones it made were not. These similarly shaped bears were made of disturbing materials and were extremely hostile towards any humans they encountered. The first, SCP-1048-A, was made entirely out of human ears, and when it shrieked, it caused anyone nearby to generate ear-like growths all over their bodies, eventually causing them to suffocate. The creature disappeared, and an on-site researcher was found to be missing an ear. The creations of SCP-1048 only got stranger and deadlier from there. SCP-1048-B was found in the site's cafeteria, where it was moving around in a halted, jerky fashion. It then started bursting at the seams and revealed what appeared to be a human fetus inside. When the creature screamed, it sounded like a much louder version of a human infant, and its crows caused massive internal damage to anyone around it. SCP-1048-B was killed in the ensuing conflict with Foundation agents, ending its threat. But SCP-1048 was learning deadlier techniques. When SCP-1048-C was discovered, it looked to be a teddy bear made entirely out of rusty scrap metal. When it was spotted by Dr. Carver and targeted by Foundation personnel, the creature turned violent and proved to have incredible strength, jumping through the agents who were trying to neutralize it, tearing through their bodies like tissue paper. Attempts to damage it were unsuccessful, and both it and the bear made out of ears are still on the loose along with the original SCP-1048. Capturing it is major priority for the Foundation, because no one wants to see what it will create next. Is there a connection between these two very different mm -hmm. teddy bears? No one has been able to answer this question. The origins of SCP-1048 are unknown, and so is any connection to the mysterious grandmother, who may have made Kairos the bear, but their abilities are similar, with both able to craft living objects out of seemingly any material. They just have very different ideas as to what a good use of their crafting abilities are. It is fortunate that an anomaly as potentially powerful as SCP-2295 seems to only want one thing, to help those in need, especially those who are the most vulnerable. Dr. Gears was having another boring day at the SCP Foundation, and that was exactly how he liked it. He treated himself to a cup of decaf black coffee, no cream, no sugar, a simple plain donut, and an apple. The breakfast of champions, to him at least. His duties today were ones he'd overseen so many times before, watching his ever-rotating legion of subordinates shove various items into SCP-914 the clockworks, just to see what on earth would happen. This machine had the ability to transmute matter in a variety of fashions, depending on the input selection, whether rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or even very fine. 
They tested everything, from Dr. Gears' watch to a chimp, which, as we all know, resulted in the beloved hyper-intelligent chimp scientist, Dr. Bobo. There were in fact such extensive testing records for SCP-914 that Dr. Gears had started taking an uncharacteristic hands-off approach to testing. As long as the researchers working under him were reasonably sure that the results of their testing wouldn't result in a containment breach, a fundamental alteration of consensus reality, or some massive loss of life, they could just go ahead with whatever dumb little experiment their heart desired. This, however, would turn out to be a way longer leash than Dr. Gears ever should have given to the kind of weirdos who work at the SCP Foundation. There had been certain, let's say, incidents in the past that have proved members of the SCP Foundation aren't above using anomalies inappropriately for their own personal enjoyment. There was, of course, the incident with SCP-662, the butler's handbell, and the supernatural butler it summons, Mr. Deeds. During the early stages of testing, Dr. Mirth, under the guise of experimentation, made Mr. Deeds make him tea, wash his car, cut his hair, and even do his laundry. Dr. Mirth was given a stern talking to by the O5 Council for this abuse of power. Good job, O5 Council. It's not like you ever use anomalies for your own benefit. Um, <clears throat> let's move on. Nothing to see here, folks. Speaking of people working for the Foundation using anomalies inappropriately, who could forget the extremely uncomfortable incident involving SCP-137, a real toy? This anomaly has the ability to become a real-life version of any toy brought into its vicinity, from the Masters of the Universe to Barbie in her dream house. But one researcher was hiding a horrifying secret. He was a brony. And that's why he sneaked a Twilight Sparkle toy into the testing chamber so he could have a conversation with his favorite My Little Pony character which all in attendance agreed just had incredibly rancid vibes through and through. And that brings us back to today. Dr. Gears deciding to let his subordinate researchers throw pretty much anything into the clockworks as long as it was unlikely to cause physical harm. And leaving this metaphorical door open allowed people like Dr. Siegel to step through. You see, while Dr. Siegel was considered by most to be an incredibly diligent and hardworking junior researcher, he did have one vice in his downtime. He was a card-carrying furry. And we're not just talking about a guy who watched Disney's Zootopia a few too many times. He had his own... <sighs> fursona. A wolf, if you were curious. I personally wasn't. He attended cons for fellow furries semi-frequently, and even had his own expensive, custom, high-end fursuit. As such, there was one SCP he found particularly interesting. SCP-1471, also known as Mal-O, version 1.0.0, an anomalous mobile app with some extremely strange properties. If you access it on an app store of your choice, you'll encounter an image of a strange, skull-headed canine creature with the following iconic description. Mal-O, version 1.0.0, free, Reviews, zero. Description, never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mal-O is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mal-O, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is so quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mal-O will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Dr. Siegel was certainly eager to forget all his painful emotions of disappointment and embrace the new social substitute. But he'd read all the documents and seen all the pictures on the file. Those who download the Mal-O app will be texted a series of photos, becoming closer to home over time, both literally and figuratively would show the strange creature known as Mal-O getting closer and closer. For some, this would be a complete nightmare. For those inclined in the direction of Dr. Siegel, it would be a dream come true. There was only one issue. They were just pictures. But Dr. Siegel didn't get a job at the SCP Foundation by having a lack of intelligence. He would very quickly figured out a potential solution to the digital barrier between him and his canine crush. He'd buy a burner phone, download the Mal-O app onto it, and put the resulting infected device directly into the clockworks. 
It was one of the best ideas he'd ever had, in his own humble opinion. But of course, it would all be about selecting the right setting. On rough, the most likely result would be the phone itself just being transformed into a pile of broken glass, metal, and a variety of conflict minerals reduced to dust. On course, the result would likely be the metal chassis of the phone, the front glass panel, and a neatly arranged interior gutted from within. On one-to-one, -one, considering he'd bought a slightly older, cheaper model of Samsung's smartphone, he'd probably get the Mal-O app on an iPhone. And on fine, perhaps the best he could hope for was getting Mal-O version 2.0.0, which may have some minor improvement, like the pictures appearing twice as fast as they would with the normal app experience. Dr. Siegel knew that the only other option that could potentially bring Mal-O into the real world was the highly unpredictable, very fine option which would either produce the desired result or cause something utterly horrifying to happen. But at the end of the day, Dr. Siegel thought to himself, isn't anything worth having also worth incurring a little risk? Who dares wins after all, right? He downloaded the fateful app and made his way into the testing area for SCP-914. He'd booked the slot, so it was all official, but he still felt his heart racing as he put the infected phone into the input chamber. He set the control panel to very fine, exactly as planned, and activated the machine. Cogs twisted and churned, engines rumbled and sputtered, pipes wriggled and hissed. It was clear that something was going on here. When the process was complete and the output chamber opened with a billowing carpet of steam, Dr. Siegel could barely contain his excitement. He hoped that Mal-O would come strolling out of the smoke like Darth Vader in Star Wars A New Hope, so you can only imagine his extreme disappointment when the chamber was completely empty. It didn't make sense. He thought everything through. How could the result possibly be so anticlimactic? This had gone from one of the most exciting days of his life to the most depressing. Dr. Siegel sighed and decided to call it quits, heading out of the test chamber, having no idea what he'd just unleashed onto the Foundation. Across the site, Dr. Alto Clef, one of the Foundation's most infamous researchers, was polishing his favorite shotgun in his office. He was whistling a cheerful tune to himself, just loving life, when he heard some strange rustling by the door. He turned around on his swivel chair just to make sure it wasn't Dr. Bright putting another bucket of battery acid on top of his door as a, quote, fun, harmless prank. Instead, he was shocked to see Mal-O, an actual, physical Mal-O, standing in his doorway, grinning. For a moment, Clef was too shocked to even react. This didn't make any kind of sense, but when Mal-O gave him a cheeky wink, he immediately loaded his shotgun and fired, blowing away a chunk of his own doorway. But sadly for him, by that time, Mal-O had already darted away, intent on causing mischief elsewhere. It's favorite pastime. Dr. Clef was still wondering whether that rascal Dr. Bright was somehow behind this fiasco, but he was not because he was actually about to become Mal-O's next victim in its ruthless reign of mild to moderate inconvenience. Dr. Bright was swanning around the break room with his favorite morning snack, a coffee with extra cream and a Danish from his favorite bakery in town. He was looking forward to enjoying these two simple pleasures in his otherwise incredibly stressful life, but little did the poor doctor know, tragedy was about to strike, and nothing would ever be the same. Just as the immortal doctor was about to disembark from the room, Mal-O appeared right in front of him, giving him the mild shock of his life. It was such a surprising occurrence, in fact, that he momentarily lost his grip on his coffee mug and his Danish, causing both to tumble to the ground. The mug shattered and the Danish splattered. By the time Dr. Bright looked up, Mal-O was already gone, just like his breakfast snack. Dr. Bright fell to his knees and screamed, Why? up to an indifferent break room ceiling. But Mal-O was just getting started. Dr. Kane Pathos Crow was on his way from his kennel, <clears throat> we mean his private quarters, to the soul extractor, when Mal-O suddenly manifested in front of him. This resulted in a brief barking match between the two for dominance over that particular hallway, which ended in Mal-O demanifesting to bother someone else, which technically made Dr. Crow the winner, though Crow himself resented ever being forced to act like a mere mutt. How, he began to wonder, had Mal-O escaped its app and begun to harass the real world? This would warrant further investigation. Mal-O continued its rampage of irritation across the site, intended to leave no stone of frustration unturned. 
And it wasn't just the Foundation staff it intended to freak out. It was just as eager to go and bother its fellow anomalies now that it had access to the meat space. Yes, that is a real term, we're not just being weird and gross, we promise. Over in the cell of SCP-173 The Sculpture, three members of D-Class personnel were cleaning up the homicidal creature's blood and poop. They were engaged in the standard procedure. One of them mopped, while the other two kept a close eye on SCP-173 to keep it frozen in place. That's when Mal O popped into the cell behind them for a split second before disappearing, scaring the living hell out of all three of them. Though the fright was, of course, secondary to the fact that the second they looked away, SCP-173 snapped all three of their necks. Oops. May have gone a little too far on that one, eh, Malo? But this newly embodied burdensome beast was just getting started, friends. No anomaly was safe from its new antics. Next, it appeared in front of SCP-682's acid tank and made rude faces at the hateful creature from the other side of the glass. This only served to sour the creature's already utterly horrific mood. It thrashed around in the chamber, attempting to get out and perform an act of great violence, but by that time, Mal O was already long gone, and SCP-682 was left grumbling in immense frustration. SCP-049 the Plague Doctor was having another very boring day. He'd been denied his animal cadaver test subjects for several days as a disciplinary measure after the latest incident, and as such, he was finding other ways to pass the time. Today, he was meticulously removing each piece of medical equipment, polishing them, and putting them in a neat line on his desk in his containment chamber. Scalpels, forceps, speculums, bone saws, all wonderful, shiny, and pristine. The plague doctor found it to be an incredibly calming activity, so, of course, Mal O couldn't just let him be. The cantankerous canine, driven mad by the power of suddenly being able to interact with the world physically, manifested in the middle of the containment chamber and used its tail to knock all of the meticulously arranged medical equipment onto the ground with a thunderous clatter. The plague doctor, devastated, lifted both of his hands to his beak and yelled, Sacre bleu! in horror. In that same instant, Mal O once again disappeared, leaving the tragic doctor to start from scratch. It was a serious setback on an otherwise lovely day. Curse you strange dog creature! He thought to himself while bending over to pick up the pieces, curse you and your entire bloodline. A group of hardcore mobile task force members was engaged in the comically manly activity of playing poker while smoking in the barracks. And before you judge them for that, remember that if your job was as stressful as being a member of a mobile task force, you'd probably smoke too. But their job was about to get a little more stressful when Mal O suddenly materialized and gave the poker table a sharp kick sending the towers of poker chips and decks of cards all over the place, before disappearing without a trace yet again. It completely ruined their game. One of the more junior members asked, Should we have, uh, done something about that? A more senior operative shook his head and said, Well, uh, we'll do something when we get the official call from up top. Until then, ah, uh, let's reshuffle the deck. In the Site-19 cafeteria, Dr. Agatha Wrights was preparing to eat a delicious salad that she'd been waiting all day to enjoy. As we've often established, working at the SCP Foundation can be an immensely stressful job, so you need to take the small joys where you can get them. For Dr. Wrights, this delicious premium salad that she'd bought from Harris Teeter earlier in that day was indeed a joy. She even got a fancy vinaigrette dressing for the occasion. Before she took the first bite, she noticed SCP-073 Kane approaching. Dr. Wrights smiled and gave him a polite nod. Kane waved back. That, our dear viewers, is when tragedy struck. Mal O suddenly manifested in front of Kane, propping out one of its canid legs right in front of where the hapless anomaly was walking. By the time Kane began to trip and fall over, Mal O had already vanished, but it was too late. Kane kept falling forward until one of his metal hands landed right into the bowl that contained Dr. Wright's salad. Due to his anomalous abilities, the salad immediately withered away into nasty, dead nothingness. Dr. Wrights began to cry as Kane, who felt profoundly guilty, tried his best to apologize. Truly, nobody in Site-19 was safe. Mal O popped up behind Iris and ruined all of her photos. Mal O popped up behind the immortal Hitler clone in his cell and gave him a good kick in the rear. Mal O even popped up right behind SCP-343, also known as God, who smugly replied, I knew you were going to do that, my son. 
Needless to say, it had been one hell of a day. Dr. Siegel, completely ignorant to the chaos his actions had caused around the site, had cried in the bathroom for 40 minutes out of sheer disappointment. He'd barely been able to focus on the rest of his duties for the day on account of being severely bummed out. This was a day he'd been looking forward to for so long, and it all had been for nothing. That evening, he was driving home on the highway, listening to sad songs on the radio, thinking about the fact he'd probably just crack open a beer and get some sleep when he got home. He sighed again and looked up to adjust his rearview mirror when he saw a skeletal face with huge white eyes staring at him in the reflection. A quick, almost reflexive turn revealed a huge black figure with a canine skull for a face was indeed just sitting in his back seat, watching him. It was so shocking that he immediately veered off the road and crashed his car into the concrete divider in the middle of the road, breaking his nose and collarbone in the process. Really a perfect cherry on top for this kind of day. Dr. Siegel was sitting in the hospital not long after that, with a cast around his upper body. This was also where he received a bouquet of flowers from Dr. Gears with an attached note saying he was put on three-month disciplinary leave for the irresponsible use of SCP-914. Dr. Siegel looked up and saw that Mal O was peering around the corner at him with its dead white eyes, its fang-lined maw twisted into a permanent, ominous grin. At this point, Dr. Siegel realized that being chased around constantly by a demonic skull-faced anomaly in real life wasn't nearly as whimsical as he expected it would be. In hindsight, that probably should have been obvious, shouldn't it? Though, please, let us know if you'd like Mal O to stalk you in real life in the comments below, you bunch of weirdos. Joseph and Frank were two lifelong squatchers. No, that isn't an insult. That's a self-given title for Bigfoot enthusiasts who are willing to head out into the woods and search for the legendary Sasquatch firsthand. While most Squatchers will go their whole lives without ever encountering one, Joseph and Frank were about to get lucky. They just didn't know what kind of luck. During a journey through the forests of the Pacific Northwest, Frank spotted something moving in the distance. A huge ape-like creature with grayish fur and human-like movements. Frank thought he was finally laying eyes on the mighty Bigfoot after decades of searching. What he didn't know was that he just made a deadly mistake. He had looked directly at SCP-1000, and there would be terrible consequences. Frank was excited. He just achieved the life goal of any Squatcher. He tapped Joseph on the shoulder and directed him to look in the direction of the creature. Joseph followed Frank's direction and stared into the distance. When his eyes finally came into focus on the ape-like beast, he froze. His brain just short-circuited. One second he was about to encounter the holy grail of his hobby, and the next, he was literally brain dead. Joseph collapsed. In the distance, the ape-like creature disappeared back into the woods. Not that Frank even noticed. He was too busy trying to wake Joseph, but it was no use. Joseph was gone, and Frank had no idea why. The headlines read, Bigfoot killed my friend. Most people either ignored it or laughed it off. Just a couple of cranks goofing off in a forest and one of them had dropped dead. Who cares? Well, one organization cared. The SCP Foundation. Mobile Task Force Zeta-1000. The Foundation's specialized SCP-1000 detail were alerted to the reports. They sprang into action, tracking down and detaining Frank for questioning. They process a million loony Bigfoot lovers every year and usually find nothing, but the death of Frank's friend made it all too clear. They hadn't encountered a Bigfoot, but a real, genuine example of SCP-1000. SCP-1000 rarely ranks among the scariest or most dangerous SCPs, but underestimating the creature is a terrible mistake, because just looking at it gives you a 2% chance of dropping dead on the spot. Frank, despite losing his friend, was one of the lucky ones. The Foundation debriefed him before administering amnestics and making sure that he'd never venture back into those mysterious forests in the Pacific Northwest region. Director Jones, the site director charged with the management of SCP-1000 populations, was given the information on this latest case of an SCP-1000-related fatality. It was a story he heard many times before. For Director Jones, they all seemed to bleed into one another. So what exactly is SCP-1000? And how did it leave poor Joseph dead in the woods? SCP-1000 is a whole species of large, hominid ape-like creatures. They're largely nocturnal, but sightings of the creature during the day aren't unheard of. They're omnivorous, mostly seeming to consume plants and insects, and their fur is usually gray, brown, black, red, or occasionally white. The creatures have large eyes capable of impressive vision nestled underneath a pronounced Neanderthal-like brow. 
Another defining feature is the ridge of bone on the forehead, much like that of a gorilla that is present in both sexes. According to Foundation studies, the creatures exhibit a level of intelligence on par with that of the common chimpanzee, but nowhere near that of us humans. What they lack in intelligence, though, they make up for in size. The adults can be as large as 10 feet tall and weigh up to 600 pounds. Despite their great size and impressive strength, the creatures are neither aggressive nor territorial. In fact, they seem to instinctively avoid humans, mostly residing deep in the forests of the American mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest and in the Himalayan Alps. There have been sightings of SCP-1000 on every continent, though the Foundation has taken pains to exterminate all SCP-1000 populations situated near human population centers to prevent a potential disaster, considering the 2% chance of instantaneous death upon visual contact. That brings us to our second question. What is it that makes these seemingly harmless creatures so dangerous? Sadly, for both these unfortunate creatures and us humans, the danger is beyond the control of SCP-1000. According to Foundation research, SCP-1000 likely evolved alongside us Homo sapiens until a tragedy occurred between 10 and 15,000 years ago. A mysterious extinction event eliminated the vast majority of their species, leaving only 1 to 5% alive in the aftermath. What happened? It's believed that around this time, SCP-1000 contracted what the Foundation refers to as an anomalous pseudo-disease. Meet SCP-1000-F1 a disease that is passed along at the genetic level and is so durable that it persists in the species to this day. The tiny fraction of the population that are immune to its effects manage to survive, but the majority who aren't immune die shortly after birth. This is why the overall population remains relatively low to this day. It's a disease that only appears to affect hominids, including humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and non-immune instances of SCP-1000. Any hominid that lays eyes on a carrier of the disease has a 2% chance of experiencing immediate brain death. While a 2% chance of instant death may not seem all that threatening, at least when compared to some other nightmare-inducing SCPs, the truly scary part is that the percentage is cumulative. In other words, the longer one observes a carrier of SCP-1000-F1, the higher that percentage rises, the greater your chance of experiencing an abrupt death. According to Foundation studies, the percentage rises by around 1% every 20 minutes, and the percentage also varies between specimens, with some exhibiting a terrifyingly high death chance of 90% upon viewing. This death chance continues to occur in dead specimens if they carry the anomalous pseudovirus while alive though thankfully the risk doesn't appear to apply to small fur or tissue samples. The Foundation's true concern actually goes far beyond SCP-1000 themselves. Because of the species' close relation to Homo sapiens, there's a worry that SCP-1000-F1 could transmit to humans, causing our own species to meet a similar fate. If humans did indeed become carriers of SCP-1000-F1, it's extremely likely that humanity would undergo an unprecedented extinction event, with billions across the globe dropping dead as brain death sets in en masse. While full extermination of the entire species has been deemed unlikely, this existential threat they pose to humanity more than justifies the occasional culling of SCP-1000 populations. That was a lot to take in, right? First, the creature we thought was Bigfoot was actually a new species of SCP out in the wild. And second, these creatures could end human life as we know it if they made it into a population center. But what you're about to hear next, a dark secret only available to people with Level 3 SCP Foundation clearance, is the most shocking SCP-1000 fact of all. Are you ready? The true secret of SCP-1000 is that what you've just heard is a lie. There is no anomalous pseudo-disease, and SCP-1000 poses no pathogenic threat to humanity whatsoever. Who would spread such a thing? The SCP Foundation, of course. Strictly speaking, the Foundation has disseminated two direct lies about the nature of SCP-1000. The first is that of the disease, which does not exist, nor has it ever existed. The second lie is about the creature's intelligence level. They're far smarter than the average chimp. In fact, they're every bit as intelligent as human beings. These were all lies formulated by Director Jones and the Foundation, as was the very existence of the Bigfoot myth. The Foundation has been spreading information that makes the very concept of the Sasquatch out to be a joke for decades, all to discredit and further push the very concept of SCP-1000 into the shadows. But why? 
The Foundation is no stranger to coming up with cover stories, but why would they put intentional lies into their own files to anyone below a level 3 clearance? Well, that all comes down to the horrifying truth behind the origins of today's SCP-1000 population. The creatures were first brought to the attention of the Foundation by outcast members of the Serpent's Hand, an organization dedicated to defying the Foundation's activities. These members, known as the Children of the Sun, told them the secret history of SCP-1000. While at first, Foundation personnel like Director Jones didn't want to believe what they were hearing, they soon came to terms with the horrifying truth. Humans and SCP-1000 did evolve alongside each other, with humans occupying the day and SCP-1000 the night. However, while humans were still basic hunter-gatherers, SCP-1000 were undergoing vast intellectual and societal development. They were able to create tools, weapons, agriculture, stable settlements, domesticated animals, and eventually even fully developed cities. It was like nothing the world had ever seen, and wouldn't see for thousands of years to come. Their numbers swelled into the tens of billions as they created culture and technology hitherto unimagined, including weapons of devastating power. Meanwhile, humanity was pushed to the brink of destruction by their competitors' rapid and seemingly unstoppable growth. It looked as though the human species had lost the evolutionary arms race and would have to bow out. But according to the Children of the Sun, a trickster forest god smiled upon humanity and gave them the power to use SCP-1000's weapons and technology against them. 70% of SCP-1000's population were wiped out in a single horrific day, known to the Children of the Sun as the Day of the Flowers, as every flower supposedly bloomed that day during the massacre. Humanity destroyed the entire civilization, and with the same technology they stole from these unfortunate creatures, the vengeful humans drove the apes mad. Their higher consciousnesses were blocked out, reducing them back into the states of mere animals. Once the massacre was done and everything that was built had been destroyed, we, the human race, used the SCP-1000 weapons to wipe any memory of the atrocity from our own minds. The advanced civilization of SCP-1000 had been wiped from history. Humans returned to their plodding path of evolution, none the wiser. For thousands of years, all the way up until today, this time remained a mystery to us. So again, why did the Foundation lie to us? What did they have to gain by convincing us all that it was dangerous to even look at these creatures? While well, as the frequency of sightings and the attempts of communication increased, people like Director Jones became aware of a frightening possibility. What if the pendulum was swinging back? What if the apes were regaining their lost intelligence and worse, still harbored feelings of revenge for what we did to their species thousands of years ago? Even the mere possibility that they could do to us what we once did to them is a chance that the Foundation simply cannot take. And thus, limiting contact between humans and SCP-1000 at all costs is an absolute must. However, in spite of the Foundation's fears, one intercepted message from the apes suggests that their paranoia may be misplaced. This message, translated from an attempt at communicating with Foundation personnel, reads simply as follows. We forgive you. Given choice for now, not forever. Let us back in. It's enough to make you wonder what species the Foundation should really be keeping tabs on here. After all, when it comes to meting out violence and death, humanity has a track record to rival the worst creatures in the Foundation containment cells. And few examples illustrate that better than the tragic case of SCP-1000. All hell had broken loose. Sophie could barely believe she had survived for this long. Getting used to one dramatic change in her life was hard enough, but almost immediately after, the entire world had seemed to go crazy. As a result, she now had a whole new existence to try and adapt to, scavenging for what little scraps of food she could find in the ruined, desolate city. The monsters could appear at any time, day or night, either one on their own or whole droves of the nightmarish creatures that had been let loose on the world. This life was somehow far more dangerous on a day-to-day -day basis than her old one had been. And given Sophie used to work for the SCP Foundation, that really was saying something. Formerly known as Dr. Cartwright, she had been a researcher at the Foundation for a number of years. While she had been far from reaching the upper echelons of the organization's most notorious staff, with the likes of Drs. Jack Bright and Kane Pathos Crow, nobody could deny Sophie was an expert when it came to studying the anomalous. As much as she understood the importance of their directive to safeguard humanity, 
The Foundation had, first and foremost, been a job to her, a means to an end, something to earn a living from and then move on. It wasn't worth giving up everything for, and when her life needed more focus than her work, Sophie wasn't hesitant to step away. Her mother had fallen ill, terminally, and as a result needed around-the-clock care. So Dr. Sophie Cartwright had no choice but to hand in her resignation from the SCP Foundation. There were times when she missed it, and moments after her mother eventually passed that Sophie considered going back. But she came to realize it wasn't the work itself she missed, not even her co-workers at the Foundation. It was the occasional rare anomaly that was just a completely harmless little oddity, not a monstrous abomination. Often in her new, unfamiliar life of resignation, Sophie would find herself looking wistfully at a picture of herself and one such anomaly. Technically, it was against the Foundation's rules to possess any photographic evidence of SCPs, but Sophie had made sure it didn't look like anything out of the ordinary. The picture had been taken on her phone and showed Sophie crouching down with a face of a curious but completely normal-looking black and gray tabby cat poking up in the foreground. Nothing about the picture gave any indication that the cat, named Josie, was actually missing her hindquarters and back legs. SCP-529, as the Foundation had designated her, was one of the few completely harmless SCPs in their care. Her only anomalous trait being that her entire back half was missing, either because it didn't exist or had somehow been displaced in another dimension, hence her nickname, Josie the Half-Cat. Given that she had been allowed to roam freely around the Foundation facility she was kept in, Josie had run across Dr. Cartwright a number of times, the pair of them eventually becoming friends. With a sigh and smile, Sophie had been looking at the photo on the day everything went wrong. Steel cap boots came rushing up the stairs and down the corridors to her apartment, worn by a group of black-clad mercenaries. You see, unbeknownst to Sophie at the time she had tendered her resignation from the SCP Foundation, a number of the organization's higher-ups had also done the same. While Sophie's reasons for leaving were purely personal, the wave of resignations from other high-ranking Foundation personnel came as a reaction to something called Project Numa. This was an operation that had uncovered a disturbing truth about the psychosphere, a shared human unconsciousness that had led to the O5 Council proposing a new directive for the organization. Those that objected left the Foundation, others were killed by their former employer and its merciless hit squads in cold blood. Perhaps thanks to some administrative error filing Sophie's resignation alongside those that had left after learning about Numa, or maybe because the Foundation didn't want her extensive knowledge of the anomalous being used against their newfound directive, they had sent a mobile task force to her apartment. Filing down the corridor, the soldiers lifted a battering ram and swung it forward, shattering the door, wooden splinters littering the floor as they breached the entrance. But Sophie had heard them coming, escaping as fast as she could, descending a fire escape ladder until she reached the street below. At that moment in time, Sophie had no idea why the Foundation had sent a hit squad out to kill her. Of course, the answer to that question quickly became obvious. Shortly after, reports came pouring in from all over the world, broadcast over every news channel before they were ultimately blocked. The SCP Foundation had gone public, revealing its existence to the entire world and declaring its new mission statement. Rather than protecting the world from anomalies, the Foundation had declared war, calling for the total and utter extinction of humanity. While Sophie had no way of knowing the reasons for the Foundation going rogue, it was clear that working for them in the past had put a target on her back. Luckily, she managed to avoid the MTF coming after her, getting swept up in a crowd that was fleeing from something far more horrific. SCP-682 had been released and was devouring people in broad daylight. The waking nightmare didn't stop there. Over the next few months, the Foundation released a number of dangerous anomalies on the world, using them to slaughter innocent people in droves, assassinate world leaders and cripple organizations like the Global Occult Coalition to hinder humanity's chances of fighting back. And amongst it all, living through the chaos and carnage were tiny pockets of survivors. Although those two were starting to be rapidly picked off by the Foundation, deploying more of their mobile task force operatives or compliant SCPs to eliminate the refugees. Sophie had witnessed firsthand the Foundation's attacks, 
and as a result, had found it best to keep moving from camp to camp, only staying with one group of fellow survivors for a few nights each before moving on. She wasn't sure if the Foundation was specifically attacking the refugee camp she stopped at, or if it was a continuous, systematic extermination effort. She'd been noting down her ponderings in a half-burned notebook she had found while scavenging abandoned grocery stores for any remaining food that was still edible. A cynical part of her thought that it was perhaps pointless to document what was happening, but the former researcher and Sophie wanted to preserve any information she could about what the Foundation was subjecting people to. If anything, that knowledge might prove useful to someone in the future. Although, what future was a question Sophie Cartwright kept returning to, with no optimistic answer in sight. It was easy to miss how things had once been, to yearn for life, to get back to the way it once was, even though it was impossible now that the anomalies were rampaging the world over. It made sleeping hard, the fear of waking up to see the face of SCP-682 or SCP-096 staring back at her the moment she opened her eyes. One night, it was worse than ever. Every sound, no matter how faint or far away in Sophie's mind, could have been made by a carnivorous creature or an approaching Foundation foot soldier. A bottle clinked, waking Sophie from her restless sleep. Something was nearby, and from the sound of it, it was getting closer and closer. Sitting up in the alleyway she'd been sleeping in, Sophie looked around her, feeling her heart thumping against her ribs in fear. Then, through the dark, she caught the sight of a pair of beady, reflective eyes, followed by the sounds of a drawn-out, defensive yowl. For a second, she wondered if it could be. No, surely not. The eyes approached, a small, shadowy form behind them. Sophie could barely make it out in the night's darkness, even with the glow of distant fires in the sky on the horizon. But from what she could see, the creature approaching her was small, just about smaller than an average cat, about half the size. Her fingers trembling, she reached out a hand towards it as gently as she could, allowing it to sniff her for a moment. Then she felt it duck under her open palm, letting her stroke up its arched back. When her hand reached about halfway, Sophie could feel the slight yield of a barely tangible back half, which could only mean one thing. Josie? Sophie asked, holding a sob at the back of her throat. The little half-cat replied with a meow, recognizing the voice of her human friend from the Foundation. Immediately she leaped into the former researcher's lap, allowing Dr. Cartwright to hold her and stroke her. Giving in so glad to be reunited with Josie, Sophie started to let out stifled sobbing sounds, careful not to attract attention, but allowing herself to be the happiest she'd felt in months since this had all started. Although she had no way of understanding Josie's meows, Dr. Cartwright assumed that the brave little half-cat had managed to escape the Foundation facility she used to call home with relative ease. And she was right. Since Josie was allowed to roam freely, she had been able to make a break for it when the Foundation's MTF kill squads opened fire on their own personnel at their various sites across the globe. The loud noise had caused Josie the half-cat to flee and hide, until the sounds of gunfire and screams had all died down. By the time she emerged from her hiding place, a number of the anomalies once kept in containment had now been set loose on the world. With the facility busted wide open, SCP-529 had taken it upon herself to leave and had been surviving in much the same way Sophie had. Scavenging for scraps, passing from one refugee camp to the next, usually greeted with curiosity by any ordinary civilian who had never seen a cat with its entire back half missing. Now that they had been tearfully reunited, Josie and Sophie stuck together on their continuing travels through the now treacherous and SCP-infested world. Sophie's entries in her makeshift journal started to take on much more positive tones. While it was hard to be entirely optimistic living through an anomalous apocalypse, her spirits were at least lifted by having her little half-cat companion alongside her. Josie never seemed to stray too far from Sophie's side as they hiked their way across the country. Occasionally, SCP-529 would climb up her human friend's back and rest on her shoulders as they traversed more open terrain, her missing back half making it look like the little half-cat was perched precariously on her front two legs next to Sophie's head. And, of course, whenever they stopped for the night, Josie would sleep curled up and purring contentedly right next to Sophie. When the next morning came, she would awaken, stretch out her front paws with a yawn, 
then nuzzle at Sophie's sleeping face to wake her up. At first, Dr. Cartwright's plan had been to head due west from where she had started, hoping to reach Yellowstone National Park and access SCP-2000. There was a Foundation facility there, hidden deep underground and filled with all manner of anomalous technology. It was all intended to be used in case the world ended and the human race was wiped out, even capable of mass-producing new human beings with customized memories, as well as holding a backup of all cumulative knowledge and data on Earth. Every book ever written, every terabyte of information on the internet, everything. However, passing through another camp, Sophie and Josie received word from one of the other survivors. Apparently, the Foundation had predicted that somebody with knowledge of SCP-2000 might try something like that, and how it would undermine their plans to wipe out humanity. During one of the moments where rebelling groups were able to temporarily restore TV and internet service, it was reported that the Foundation had already put a stop to that potential option from reverting their apocalypse. They had intentionally triggered an eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano, totally obliterating the facility housing SCP-2000 and one of humanity's last hopes at survival. Well, thanks for telling me, Sophie sighed. By now, she had long given up almost all hope that things would ever be the same again. But hearing the news about Yellowstone had extinguished the last little ember of optimism that she had left. There was no way back. Sensing her friend was upset, Josie meowed at her, either as if to tell Sophie, it's okay, or I'm hungry. As the pair turned to leave, though, the other survivor called out at them. Wait! They said. Look, I, I heard another rumor, and it might be a total myth, but there's meant to be a sanctuary not far from here. What do you mean, sanctuary? Sophie asked. Like, another camp? The Foundation will wipe it out within a week. No, not a camp, the survivor replied. It's just a rumor, but supposedly there's a refuge, some place where the SCP Foundation can't get to. Apparently there's a shelter, as well as plenty of food and water, probably enough for you and the little one. Sophie looked out of the corner of her eye at Josie, balanced on her shoulder. The pair of them had gone weeks without eating before arriving at this camp, and she had no idea how long it would be before they reached the next. The sight of her half-cat companion motivated her. They needed to survive. As long as they did, the Foundation couldn't win. Given the other survivor a nod, they pointed her in the right direction. That way, a few miles at least, but you gotta be careful getting through the forest, they explained. Be Careful. The Foundation's got people out on patrols over there, and they're real weird too. I've seen them doing this strange ritual, letting their commander stab them, testing whether they can still feel pain or not. Within a few hours, the sun had set, with both Sophie and Josie deep in the heart of the woods. Just like every night since the Foundation had initiated their war on humanity, every sound, every snapped twig or rustling leaves in the breeze filled Sophie with dread. But this time, at least she knew with certainty that there were MTF troops nearby. She could see their flashlights, beams of light bleeding through between the trees. Carefully holding Josie in her arms, she stepped carefully and quietly as she could through the forest. The half-cat was trembling, clearly feeling just as fearful as Sophie was. The former researcher was praying that her little friend wouldn't make a sound. She knew she wouldn't be able to help it if she did. Cats did instinctively make defensive yowls if they felt threatened but even the slightest noise from Josie would give away their position to the MTF sweeping the area. Fan out, she heard the task force's field commander call. Even spread, if there's anyone here, you all know what to do. Sophie ducked down behind a fallen tree, covering her own mouth with her free hand, trying to stop her panicked breathing. Her only option were to make a break for it, dashing through the forest in hope she and Josie weren't caught, or worse, killed. Though these days, there was really no difference between the two or she could wait for the MTF to pass by, continuing their search. She had spent months trying to survive in this anomalous, apocalyptic nightmare. By now, the Foundation couldn't have known she was there. Their forces were just combing the forest looking for any survivors they could find. But if she stayed still, there was still a chance one of the MTF would find her and Josie, and would either alert the others or just open fire on the spot. All things considered, neither option sounded ideal. Josie was getting restless, trying to wriggle free of Sophie's grip. The half-cat's incorporeal back half meant Sophie could only hold what little underside the feline friend had. Slowly, she started to get up and made her way out from behind the tree, right into the path of an MTF trooper's flashlight. Got a live one! He yelled. A flash of light and a loud bang echoed through the forest. 
The bullet had torn through Sophie's chest, nearly missing her half-cat, but the noise of the shot had been more than enough to startle her. As Sophie dropped to the forest floor, gripping her heavily bleeding wound and writhing in pain, Josie leaped into the air towards the Foundation operative. Either in shock or because she somehow understood her protector had been shot, the brave little cat started clawing at the soldier's face. Despite her sharp front claws tearing at him, leaving red lines over his face, the armed man didn't react. It was as if he couldn't feel pain at all. The MTF trooper gripped Josie by the neck fur, pulling her away from him. Before he could reach for his sidearm, someone charged at him, knocking the Foundation operator over. Another shot rang out as he fell, tackled by Sophie. Meanwhile, Josie had dropped to the ground, landing on her two visible feet and hissing at the soldier. Scrambling to her feet, Sophie picked up Josie and ran, the sounds of the rest of the task force receding into the distance behind her. The little half-cat was looking back over her human friend's shoulder, watching as the sweeping flashlights of the MTF kill squad fanned between the trees until they eventually disappeared from view. Her earlier adrenaline spike began to drop sharply in time with the gradual rise of the sun. Sophie had long since slowed down, certain that she'd be able to give the Foundation's foot soldiers the slip. Josie had taken her favorite perch on Sophie's shoulder again, meaning she could use her hands to apply pressure to her two wounds. But with every step, the former researcher could feel her limbs getting heavier. Her pulse, which had drummed faster than ever as her and her half-cat had fled, was now slowing down with every fading beat. She was tired, so much that she could barely keep her head up, until eventually, Sophie had to stop. She sat at the edge of a lake in the middle of the forest, exhaustedly trying to catch her breath. Calmly, Josie hopped off her shoulder and sat down at her side, licking her paw and cleaning behind her ears. Sophie looked at her little friend and smiled, feeling a tear run down her face. She reached into her bag and produced her journal, tearing out a page and scrolling down a note with the last of her strength. To whoever finds this half-cat, her name is Josie. She's my only friend left in the whole world. I've taken care of her for as long as I can, but I'll be dead soon. Please take care of her for me. Take her to safety. Be good to her, and she'll be good to you. And if you scavenge any cheese, only give her a little as a treat. After tying the note to Josie's midsection, so it rested atop her semi-corporeal back half, Sophie looked around one last time. The lake was calm, a tiny pocket of remaining peace in a world gone mad, overrun with anomalies. Guess we did make it to a sanctuary after all, Josie, she whispered weakly. Giving her little half-cat one last scratch behind the ears, Josie meowed gratefully. Finally, unable to keep her eyes open and her head up any longer, Sophie Cartwright let herself drift off. Josie was left meowing at her friend to wake up. She sat with her all day. She didn't move, didn't even wake up when Josie nuzzled her face against hers like she had before. Sophie's face felt much colder now against the confused half-cat's fur. Eventually, Josie wandered off into the forest, towards an uncertain future. Maybe if this future wasn't set in stone, if it could be reset, then Josie the half-cat would see her friend Sophie again. To paraphrase noted scientist Dr. Heinz Doofenshmirtz, If I had a nickel for every time there was a safe class anomaly that manifests an absurdly long entity that's stuck on the ground and pops up at multiple points around the world, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Incidentally, that happens to be the case with SCP-1193, the Buried Giant, and SCP-2952, Corgi. They're a pair of mysterious creatures with very thought-provoking similarities between them. But while both are exceedingly long entities, neither are particularly long stories. So today, we're giving you a rare SCP-explained anomaly double feature. Let's begin with the first of our two very long boys, SCP-1193. The exact nature of SCP-1193's anomalous qualities are challenging to define. It appears to have biological, spatial, and even temporal elements. SCP-1193-01, the primary component of SCP-1193, is a human arm that appears completely normal in a genetic sense, but exhibits a freakish length and bone structure. This absurdly long arm was first discovered in a drainage pipe inside the basement of a telephone switching station in Scottsdale, Arizona where it had somehow become trapped. How this anomaly was first discovered, or by whom, is not recorded. Approximately 10 centimeters below the drainage gate of the pipe, 
The arm terminates in what seems to be a human hand of indeterminate gender that is unremarkable in both size and structure. Upon initial examination, the Foundation believed that the arm somehow threaded through 35 meters of drainage pipe. But the use of an endoscopic camera within the pipe revealed that the reality is much more severe. The arm extends to at least 71 kilometers beneath the Earth, which is around double the overall length of Scottsdale, Arizona itself, with elbows regularly spaced across every 4 kilometers of arm. Elbows below a depth of 26 kilometers are slightly retroflexed to accommodate a 9 degrees southward bend in the drainage borehole. Interestingly, the arm was also somehow able to pass through the Mohorovich discontinuity, which is the lower limit of the Earth's crust and the volcanic hot upper mantle. The arm could actually be longer than what we're currently aware, but the Foundation doesn't have any technology hardy enough to follow the arm all the way down into the Earth. Conversations that Foundation staff have had with what is believed to be SCP-1193-01 via the use of SCP-1193-02 indicates that the entity may have no thermoreception. It has described itself as being stuck in environments that, contextually, should have either extremely high or extremely low temperatures. This does not seem to register with SCP-1193-01. This may serve as an explanation as to why it is experiencing no discomfort, despite the borehole temperatures having been measured in excess of 674 degrees centigrade. But what exactly is SCP-1193-02? SCP-1193-02 is a GPO-746 rotary telephone with a topaz yellow plastic exterior manufactured in 1971. Because of the physical dimensions of the phone, it is too large to have been delivered from below via the borehole, so we know that SCP-1193-01 didn't put it there. The working theory of Foundation researchers assigned to the 1193 case is that the phone was installed here specifically to facilitate communications with the trapped SCP-1193-01. It is attached to a conventional twisted pair line, which enters the drainage pipe containing SCP-1193-01 and descends parallel to SCP-1193-01 until endoscopy is no longer practical. Who or what installed the phone? How? And to what end beyond just chatting with the entity? The Foundation doesn't presently know, and the investigation is ongoing. One clue to the purpose of SCP-1193-02 is the fact that its rotary dial has been permanently glued in place, rendering it unusable for any kind of outgoing calls. Instead, the phone only receives calls, and the only calls it seems to receive are from a being that seems to be SCP-1193-01. Every weekday between 8.32 a.m. and 10.34 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, the phone will ring up to five times. When answered by a member of Foundation personnel, an unidentified voice believed to be that of SCP-1193-01 will willingly engage in conversation with the person on the other end of the line. The Foundation has used this opportunity to question SCP-1193-01 about its own nature, but it's impossible to really know how reliable the entity's answers are. The voice on the line always refers to itself as a human being, and often mistakes the Foundation personnel for authority figures such as doctors, firemen, or police. As a result of this, the voice has been forthcoming with information, and the interviews have been relatively straightforward. There have been notable similarities between the information that the voice voluntarily gives about itself and the known facts about the condition of SCP-1193-01, lending credibility to the idea that they are one and the same. The Foundation fastidiously records conversations with the voice and has created a list of anomalous details the entity has surrendered during the phone calls. These include having human features, but an anomalous body plan. So the voice seems to have all the right pieces for a human being but in a bizarre configuration. This may explain the extremely long, many-jointed arm. Whatever species or subspecies this entity is, it may not be alone, as the voice often refers to a cousin or some kind of other relative who's on the way to pick it up. The voice often talks about its feelings of discomfort or boredom at its state of being confined. It also makes reference to strange seismic activity along the Little Chino Fault Complex an upper branch of the Elsinore Fault Zone of Southern California, over 300 miles away from Arizona. 
This may be because the source of the voice is so far underground, it's still able to feel the tremors resonating upwards. But one of the most frequent trends of all in these conversations is that the voice venting frustration that its arm, or some other body part, is stuck in an inconvenient place. This list of places has been exhaustive, but includes handcuffs, a jelly jar, a pipe, a cast, or in one instance, a gopher hole. Naturally, this has been seen as a cause for concern among Foundation staff. If SCP-1193 does have spatially anomalous components, is it possible that someone could find a 70-kilometer arm sticking out of a gopher hole or a jelly jar sometime soon? Only time will tell. The Foundation currently regards any information about the physical form of the entity beyond the exposed section of the arm reached via endoscopy as provisional. In other words, they really have no idea what they're dealing with here, and are unlikely to find out for sure anytime soon. Two phone conversations with the voice via SCP-1193-02 have been transcribed in the addendum to 1193's main file. Both are conversations between the voice and Dr. Hassan Iqbal, director of research at the local SCP containment site. In the first of two conversations, recorded on March 24, 2008, Dr. Iqbal asked who was calling, and the voice identified itself as David. The voice, or David, appeared to be in its usual state of frustration and distress. Incorrectly believing that Dr. Iqbal was a medical doctor at the hospital he was currently trapped inside, David implored him to remove the cast from his bottom arm. When Dr. Iqbal questioned David on what exactly a bottom arm is, he responded with confusion. When Dr. Iqbal told him that he was a research scientist, not a medical doctor, David became frustrated, implied that Dr. Iqbal was incompetent, and hung up. The next recorded call between Dr. Iqbal and The Voice occurred exactly a year later. In this call, The Voice incorrectly believed that Dr. Iqbal was a fireman. The Voice complained about having reached into its oven to pull out some cakes, becoming stuck in the process. He pleaded for help, saying that the oven was a tight fit. When Dr. Iqbal showed concern about the potentially high temperatures within the oven, the voice didn't seem to know what he meant. In the end, the voice became frustrated and resolved to instead call its cousin. It apologized and hung up. Most calls appear to follow this general structure. Because of the static and incredibly subdued nature of the anomaly, the Foundation has deemed that SCP-1193 poses no meaningful risk of containment breach. As a result, it has been given the rare, safe classification. In order to keep it properly contained, the drainage borehole containing SCP-1193-01 is capped with a tungsten steel grate containing a locking 2.5cm endoscopy aperture, meaning a small hole through which to feed the endoscopic camera. Every 48 hours, the drainage borehole is inspected with an endoscope for any further developments concerning the anomalous arm. Seismographic monitoring devices are posted at 2, 7, and 11 km depths alongside the SCP-1193-01 borehole. Seismic readings consistent with a subterranean movement are reported immediately to Site Director Iqbal. In the event of what is referred to as subterranean containment breach, researchers and guards working around 1193 are ordered to perform Protocol 473A. This involves severing SCP-1193 below the fifth elbow and backfilling remaining portions of the borehole with pressurized concrete to seal the hole forever. The SCP-1193-02 phone is monitored at all times by a trained Foundation interrogator, and standard procedure dictates that SCP-1193-02 is to be answered on or before the third ring. During these calls, the interrogator will attempt to elicit valuable information about SCP-1193 from the voice, and all valuable intel will then be recorded and logged. The Buried Giant is one of the more perplexing safe class anomalies handled by the SCP Foundation. So much about its true nature is unknown to this day. But a concern that both we and the Foundation share is not knowing where the entity's other limbs are currently residing. For all we know, they could be sticking out of an oven, a gopher hole, or even a jelly jar somewhere near you. Weird, right? Well, if you think that's strange, let us now introduce you to SCP-2952, or Corgi. Trust us, if you're not familiar with this one already, you are not ready for the strange turns this is about to take. In the simplest terms, Corgi is a cheerful Welsh Pembroke Corgi with an adorable face and a thick, shiny coat. He's also over 30,000 kilometers in length, with his head and front legs sticking out of the ground in Portland, Oregon, and his hindquarters being all the way over in a rural area of Japan's Karawa District. His body weaves all across the globe with sections of it surfacing all over the Americas, Europe, and much of Asia. 
Studies to find African or Australian sections of SCP-2952 are still ongoing. Despite its massive length, there seems to be no delay in reaction times either. You pat his head in the USA and his tail will immediately start wagging over in Japan. He's honestly just precious. He also doesn't appear to need food or water, and thanks to the somewhat sadistic experiments of one researcher, Mills, we know that he can quickly regenerate from all damage done to him, too. Okay, now you're familiar with this very good, albeit very long lad. It's time for things to get really, really strange. You see, on the different exposed section of SCP-2952's body, there are tiny openings designated SCP-2952-1. Stay with us here. There are 324 openings all over the world, some in major cities, others in suburban areas, some in the tiniest and most rural of hamlets. At this point, you probably have the very reasonable question, why are there over 300 openings in this dog? Well, we're going to answer that, but we can't promise it won't just give you more confusing questions. When the openings appear, humanoid beings designated SCP-2952-2 will begin to exit the corgi. For the sake of clarity, we'll refer to these little creatures as the Welsh Fair Folk, or the Fae, though there are many different subgroups of Fae, and we really do mean little in this case. On average, they're a puny 3 centimeters tall, and they're also invisible to the naked eye, with indirect methods like photographs or videos being the only way to view them. Though they do leave evidence of their presence beyond their direct physical appearances, like shadows or footprints. Corgi acts as a kind of transport system for these little people. Openings on the dexterous side of SCP-2952 take passengers west, while those on the sinistrous side take passengers east. Passengers can be seen entering and exiting at regular intervals. The Foundation has even been able to track a group of passengers getting on the Corgi transit system and getting off at a later stop. From this, the Foundation has been able to estimate that the speed of the system is 120 kilometers per hour, excluding stops to let passengers on and off along the way, which, for the record, is a pretty leisurely pace by train standards. Naturally, the SCP Foundation weren't exactly thrilled to learn about an anomalous transit system that worked to spread further anomalies all over the world. In fact, that's kind of a nightmare scenario for them. So, they marshaled their global forces, located each of the openings along the torso of the Corgi system, and blocked them up. At this point, the SCP Foundation were ready to give themselves a pat on the back, close up shop for the night, and go out for after-work drinks. However, there was one thing that they'd all forgotten. Hell hath no fury like a society of Welsh Fae who've just had their daily commute ruined. The Council of Tywith Teg, their ruling body, doesn't take kindly to having their public services messed with and the manner of their retaliation was less like a group of disgruntled, anomalous civil servants, and more like a kind of fey mafia. They would make the Foundation rue the day they messed with Corgi. With a series of retaliatory strikes, that group of interest, like Chaos Insurgency and the Children of the Scarlet King, could only dream of. It began with the kidnapping of Project Director Stevens, who'd authorized the containment project. He vanished from his apartment and was replaced with an adult European mole which seems to be the fey equivalent of leaving a horse's head in the bed as an offer you can't refuse to send a message. But it didn't stop there. Over the next three weeks, 17 different members of personnel, specifically construction workers, who'd worked on the project woke up to find the walls of their houses had been entirely replaced by poison ivy and death cap mushrooms. And after two months, researcher Mills, the weird dog torturer we told you about earlier, woke up with a highly poisonous nightshade berries in his mouth and hawthorn stakes driven through his hands and feet, crucifixion style, all perpetrated by some very upset three-inch transport workers. At this point, the Foundation put together who was behind these attacks and decided to try to make amends with the Fae whom they'd understandably upset with their treatment of Corgi. A plan was drafted to have all the SCP-2952-1 entrances unburied. After this undertaking was completed, the Fey retribution came to an end, and most of the damage was undone. Director Stevens was returned unharmed. The construction workers got their walls back. And, well, researcher mills didn't get better, but I think we can all agree that animal cruelty isn't really a crime that we should be forgiving lightly. After all this chaos had transpired and the SCP Foundation had fully made amends, Director Stevens had a note left on his desk by a starling, which then flew off before it could be caught. 
By the way, can we just take a second to appreciate that the SCP Foundation has contained literal demigods and interdimensional horrors, but Director Stevens was outfoxed by a bird? Wonderful those, Faye. Truly are built different. Anyway, the note on his desk, translated from Welsh read, Thank you for your prompt response to commuter complaints and wonderful customer service. As such, we have granted all members of your organization complimentary transportation on our Corgi system. Please send a sparrow to the Council of the City Office nearest you if you have further questions. G. Foxglove, Director of Transportation, the Council of the Tywith Teg. And with tremendous relief that the slate had finally been cleared, the Foundation decided that they would accept the kind offer extended to them by the Council and send one of their field agents to take a look inside the Corgi system. The field agent in question was Agent Elizabeth Davies, chosen for her pleasant social skill and proficiency in Welsh. With the intention to take a ride in mind and connected to an audio and video feeds linked back to Central Command, Agent Davies touched the side of Corgi. This caused her to shrink down to a height of 3.2 centimeters, much like all the other commuters. She stepped into the SCP-2952 entrance and found that on the inside, it looked not unlike a regular train, though some carriages seemed to be in disrepair and everything was written in Welsh. Oh, and everything was made with wood and plant matter, too. The chassis appeared to be constructed from birch, and all the seat cushions were made of flower petals. It was all very whimsical, honestly. Agent Davies struck up conversations with some of the other commuters. One complained about delays caused by the fact that Corgi was suffering from kidney stones, a problem that the Foundation is eager to help the poor animal get over to keep the transit system running smoothly. She also chatted with a sweet elderly lady on the train who was getting people to sign a petition to allow mice back onto the Corgi transit system. When Agent Davies departed the system, she patted the dog and told him he was a good boy before returning to normal size. Since January 5, 2017, the Corgi system and its passengers have become invisible to everyone who wasn't officially under SCP Foundation employ. This has allowed it for its reclassification as a safe anomaly. So there you have it, folks. At least one of our two very long boys got everything sorted out. We love occasionally doing a happy ending here at SCP Explained. Remember to stay tuned for our next episode about the time that SCP-106 managed to get onto a school bus. What? We did say, occasionally. The helicopter hovered over the back streets of Manhattan. To the untrained eye, it would look like any commercial or news helicopter. The kind of thing that might catch your attention for a moment and then leave just as quickly as your mind wanders over to wondering what you'll have for dinner. Nobody would know from a mere glance that Mobile Task Force IOTA 5 were inside, a four-man team on a dangerous mission. This has always been the greatest power of the SCP Foundation, hiding in plain sight, using the mundane as a cloak to go unnoticed. But this time, the monster they were hunting was capable of doing the exact same thing. And for the personnel of the Foundation, this ability is an affectation, a learned and adopted skill. For SCP-247, this ability, that it employs to deadly effect, comes as naturally as breathing air. The helicopter was monitoring local police scanners and phone activity, as well as receiving direct radio orders from command back at a classified containment site. The latest intel was incoherent, horrified screaming over the phone traced back to a nearby alleyway. Someone had seen something horrifying. This was IOTA 5's cue to intervene. They rappelled down from the helicopter onto the roof of a nearby tenement building, clad in thick tactical armor, anti-memetic scramble goggles, Dan Inject IM injection rifles loaded with 10cc S10 syringe darts, each one carrying an immobilizing payload of potent fast-acting xylazine, and high-powered conventional weaponry in case of emergencies. If anyone in the world was capable of tracking, securing, and containing SCP-247, it was these four operatives. And yet, by the end of today's mission, one of them would be dead. But they didn't know that yet. Like all good MTF members, they had tunnel vision for the mission at hand. They used a fire escape ladder on the side of the building to reach the bottom of the alleyway quickly. There they came upon a gruesome sight. The aftermath of an attack. On the ground, a dead body with what looked like claw marks all over it. IOTA 5 found another civilian, half mad with confusion and terror, hiding behind a nearby dumpster. 
She just kept shaking and repeating, but she was so little, over and over again. One member of the task force, Corporal Rico, elected to stay behind and secure the area, while Foundation cleanup team zeroed in to sweep the scene and provide amnesty sticks to witnesses. The remaining three continued the high-stakes chase on foot. Their eyes in the sky radioed in. Stay frosty, Iota. We've got unusual incident reports from an apartment building a quarter click north of your position. Potential fatalities. 247 is an extremely hostile state. Engage with caution. Over. The trio engaged quickly, running towards the source of the disturbance at breakneck speeds. They knew they were getting closer when they heard the shrieking and the deep, guttural growls. That low, primal rumbling of a true apex predator. Already, this containment breach was turning out to be a horrific mess. It was going to be a nightmare for the higher-ups at the cleanup and misinformation departments to handle. Paying to repair inexplicable property damage, providing amnestics to tens if not hundreds of traumatized witnesses, creating plausible cover stories for upwards of at least 10 dead New Yorkers. But even all that mess would have to wait until the creature was actually captured and contained once more, which would be an ordeal unto itself. They found SCP-247's access point into the building, a wooden door torn to splinters by huge claws and fangs. Iota 5 charged inside, injection rifles at the ready only to find carnage in the hallway. Three more bodies, with deep claw marks cutting into their flesh. It was a harrowing sight, but the team didn't have time to waste processing it. They needed to stop 247 before it killed again, and again, and again. The team followed the trail of blood, and the claw marks carved into the ground where 247 had passed. After killing the three people in the hallway, it destroyed another door and gained access to a nearby stairwell. The blood continued up the steps. Iota 5 pursued. The next splintered door, clawed and bashed off its hinges, led them further. They could hear the growling again, distant but clearly audible. They were close. There were another two attacked corpses in the hallway. Previous corpses had been partially or even entirely eaten. These two had just been clawed to death. Defensive kills. They'd backed the beast into a corner, and now it was panicking, slaughtering anything it perceived as an interference. They pressed on now. This was the end game. Soon they found the final busted door. This one led into one of the building's private apartments. There'd be no other way out from here. 247 was trapped. The three members of IOTA 5 shouldered their injection rifles and crept inside, full stealth mode. Something about the apartment was haunting. It portrayed all the signs of belonging to a young, single mother and her only son. This was confirmed when they found the dead body of the mother in the living room, eyes glassy and throat clawed out with one feral strike. They could hear something else in the apartment too, a soft, gentle cooing, too human to be anything else. They followed the noise until they reached the child's bedroom. What they saw there caused even the most hardened member of the trio to break out in a cold sweat. This was the one thing they didn't want to happen. The child, utterly oblivious to the atrocities that had unfolded in his building, to even the death of his own mother, was sitting in his bedroom petting a kitten. It was the sweetest little cat you've ever seen. A fluffy, harmless creature with an orange striped coat. This is the dreaded SCP-247. The child just kept repeating, Good kitty, good kitty, while petting her. SCP-247 purred and rolled around playfully. To the untrained eye, it would seem that a kitty like this couldn't hurt a fly. But that's where you couldn't be more wrong. Iota 5 stared at this display in a state of nerve-shredding terror, thinking fast, trying to calculate their next move. Aw, what an adorable little cat! One of the IOTA 5 members found themselves blurting out. It was clear that 247's effects were starting to have an impact on even these hardened soldiers, and they needed to act quickly. They could fire a tranquilizer dart right here or right now, but in the ensuing panic, SCP-247 would almost definitely lash out and maul the child. It wasn't a risk that they could take, but time was already running out. 247 would only allow the child to play for so long before something terrible happened. It was an inevitable part of SCP-247's process. 
That's when Private Kowalski, one of the remaining members of IOTA 5, stepped forward. He was about to do the only thing he could do, knowing that it would cost him his life. As he took his final action, the Foundation credo looped once more through his head. We die in the dark so that others can live in the light. Fighting against the urge to rush forward and start petting the cat, he instead lunged forward and struck the cat with his foot. Immediately it turned and pounced, knocking Kowalski against the wall with terrifying force. It gave the most ferocious growls as it tore into the screaming Kowalski, eviscerating his abdomen. The child screamed and retreated into the opposite corner of the room. Kowalski was done for, but now his teammates had a clear shot. They secured 247 in their sights and unloaded several darts into its flank, sedating it with their powerful tranquilizers. Soon after, it gave a lethargic growl and collapsed onto the ground. An evac and containment team were already on the way, along with the cleaners. Many had died that day, but at least SCP-247 would be brought back into containment, preventing further bloodshed. Kowalski would be given a posthumous Medal of Bravery for his selfless actions in the line of duty, as well as a generous stipend to his grieving family. By this point, you're probably wondering, how can a harmless kitten cause so much carnage, mayhem, and despair? The answer is simple. It's not a kitten at all. It's a fully grown female Bengal tiger, 9 feet and 400 pounds of pure muscle, with 4-inch claws, 4-inch canines, and an inbuilt killer instinct. But due to an anomalous mimetic effect, 247 can only ever be perceived as a sweet, tiny house cat. But even worse, due to its additional cognitohazardous properties, almost everyone who sees 247 is compelled to approach and begin dotting and fawning over it. And that's exactly how it gets its prey. Its mimetic properties are actually so flawless that, regardless of Foundation countermeasures, it has never been perceived as anything other than a kitten. It's actually only through forensic analysis into things like bite and claw marks left on victims, measurements of weight, and abnormal water displacement in aqueous environments that we can tell it's really a tiger at all. For a brief period, SCP-148, a metal that seems to counteract cognito hazards and mind-warping anomalies, was used in the containment of this Euclid-class creature, but these measures were abandoned after SCP-148 proved to have a negative impact on nearby Foundation staff after prolonged exposure. Now, strict protocols of surveillance and distancing are required to prevent hapless Foundation staff members from being lured into their doom by 247. The head researcher on the SCP-247 case wanted to conduct a series of experiments on SCP-247, hoping to find out more about the interplay of its unique traits with other members of the animal kingdom. Two control animals were brought in to represent the duality of SCP-247. Control A was a yellow kitten, roughly matching 247's apparent shape and size. Control B was a fully grown Bengal tiger, representing 247's actual shape and size. A mixed breed cat chasing terrier was brought in for the first test. It immediately followed Control A around, barking wildly until it retreated up a tree. Unsurprisingly, it fled in terror from Control B, cowering in the corner. Control B paid no mind to the dog, perhaps considering it beneath its attention, even as prey. With SCP-247, the dog initially ran towards it, barking until it was only 5 meters away. At this point, 247 let out an irritated mewling noise, and the dog fled to the corner in terror, suddenly aware of its true nature. For test number two, a male tabby kitten was brought in. As expected, it simply played with Control A and was terrified of Control B. In the first part of the test with 247, the anomalous attributes of the creature led to some surreal, mind-bending footage. At multiple points, 247 picked up the other kitten, as an adult female tiger might do with a cub, and lifted it higher than 247 seemed to be capable of. It was like watching a glitch in real time. In the second part of the test, the kitten immediately fled in terror, suggesting 247 can control how it's perceived. Next came a deer, prey typical of a Bengal tiger. Neither Control B nor 247 were fed for three days prior to this experiment and both killed and ate the deer. However, curiously, 247 killed the deer with a single merciful bite to the neck before eating, 
compared to its more brutal methods with human targets. And when this experiment was repeated with 247 after it hadn't been starved, it showed little interest in the deer until it became hungry again, suggesting it inherently prefers human or human-like prey. This theory was further reinforced during tests with a chimpanzee. The chimp fell under 247's cognitohazardous spell and began to pet it. Seven minutes later, 247 attacked and brutally devoured the chimp as it would its human prey. But strangely, the most frightening result of all came when SCP-247 was paired with an adult male Bengal tiger. They engaged in standard mating behavior, which later led to the duo reproducing a new creature, designated SCP-247-1, which had all the anomalous traits of SCP-247. But the frightening realizations don't stop there. Studies into genetic material provided by SCP-247 show slight deviation from a typical Bengal tiger's genotype, suggesting contamination from another creature that mated with one of its non-anomalous tiger parents. For context, tiger broods have an average of three cubs, but can have as many as seven, a common practice given how tiger cubs are vulnerable to cannibalism from rival adult males looking to court the females. This leads to only one frightening conclusion. There could be more creatures just like SCP-247 out there, apex predators that seem to the untrained eye like cute harmless kittens. They could be anywhere. And if they're close enough to each other or other non-anomalous tigers, they could breed even further, becoming the scariest invasive urban species you've ever seen. Because after all, we know what their preferred prey is now. So the next time you see a cute little orange tabby cat and feel the instinct to pet it, take a second to think about it. It may be the last thing you ever do. What's the largest animal you can think of? Okay, that's probably too vague of a question. Your mind probably went straight to the oceans, picturing deep sea leviathans like the mighty blue whale. Let's go a little bit closer, shall we? What about on land? What are the biggest animals that live up here with us above the water? Elephants, maybe? What about rhinos? Then again, hippos are up there too, in the same kind of ballpark. All pretty huge. What about cows? They can grow pretty big, right? Especially with all the crazy growth hormones that meat manufacturers pump into them these days. Well, what if there was something out there bigger than all of those? Imagine it. Some huge beast roaming the wilderness that easily towered above any creature you've ever seen in your life. This thing would be massive, striding across the world, towering above the meager height of a human being. Now, imagine that this thing, whatever it was, wasn't just big, but kept getting bigger. Sure, all of this might sound like the premise for the next Godzilla or Cloverfield movie, but while Big Charlie might not be the king of the monsters, it certainly lives up to that first part of its nickname. Of course, the SCP Foundation calls it SCP-4158. Big Charlie is just the playful nickname that the owners gave it, although none of them are sure who was the first to call the creature by that name. Standing on four long legs at 3.4 meters tall when the Foundation first discovered it, SCP-4158 was about one and three-fifths times as tall as famous professional basketball player Shaquille O'Neal. But since then, well, like we said, Big Charlie is getting bigger day by day. The creature appears to be tangentially related to the bovine family of mammals, essentially making it a ginormous cow. However, SCP-4158 lacks the facial structure and features that you might expect to see on the faces at your local farm. The creature has thin, translucent skin, which is so fragile that it often tears easily, and anyone observing SCP-4158 can often see the bones and internal organs within. Ugh gross. It possesses a large bulbous head, with a protrusion at the front almost like a beak. As well as that, its huge eyes are foggy, a milky white color which seems to suggest that SCP-4158 is, at least, partially blind. The large cattle-like mammal is incredibly skinny, almost to the point where its bones stick out from underneath its skin. Its legs are longer than the rest of its colossal body, and seem barely able to support the animal's weight. On description alone, you can't help but feel sorry for the poor creature and its sorry state of living. Normally, Big Charlie is mostly calm and docile, barely acknowledging the Foundation personnel that come to examine it, feed it, or clean its containment cell. 
Held in a heavy containment zone, SCP-4158 is fed through a 5-meter trough on the far east wall of its cell, surviving on a diet of raw beef, hay, wood, and bricks. Not the typical grass-only eating habits you'd expect from normal cows. But according to the Foundation's extensive testing on the creature, its diet doesn't seem to be what is causing SCP-4158 to keep growing at the rate it has been. The mass of Big Charlie is in some sort of state of perpetual increase, meaning its size and weight are always growing. And it is because of this continuous growth that every week the Foundation is forced to shear off great swaths of excess meat from the creature, cleaving off its flesh and incinerating the mass, all while Big Charlie is still alive. Now, before you start dialing PETA's hotline, it's also worth mentioning Big Charlie can't feel pain. What's more, testing has revealed that the meat taken from SCP-4158 is USDA utility-grade beef, the kind that would normally come from older cattle. Utility-grade meat has no fat marbling, so it isn't as tender or as flavorsome as other more premium grades, but would normally be used in canned and processed food products. And despite the Foundation destroying the excess that they cut off of Big Charlie as a precaution, in theory the meat is still good to eat and possesses no anomalous properties. Then again, would you really want to eat a burger made from SCP-4158? I didn't think so. If left unchecked and allowed to grow for longer than a week, SCP-4158 will begin to form new features. Limbs, organs, and sometimes even genitals will sprout from random places all over its body. The previous record for Big Charlie's most substantial growth was when he increased to 8.5 meters tall. That's over three-fifths the height of the Hollywood sign, and over one and a half times the average height of a giraffe. At this immense size, Charlie has developed seven legs, four stomachs, three tongues, and numerous other extremities before the SCP Foundation cut him back down to size. And we mean they literally cut him back down. So what exactly is this thing? It's like a giant cow, but not actually a cow, even though its flesh is identical to beef. And it's not a destructive, rampaging monster either, showing no hostility towards humans, even when they are shearing its excessive body mass away. Could it be some kind of failed genetic experiment? An attempt to solve hunger by engineering a creature that could not only stay alive, but keep growing after having its meat cut away? If that were true, it would make SCP-4158 a literal cash cow for the meat industry. Well, we've got kind of a funny story about that, actually. Big Charlie was first encountered by the Foundation back in December 2004, in Crudson, Indiana. A number of calls had been made to the area's local animal control services, with reports of a large cow with mange roaming the nearby Highway 17. Two officers belonging to the Animal Control Department were sent out to investigate these reports, and what they found was SCP-4158, wandering aimlessly, but unlike any cow they had ever seen. The officers called local police, where a Foundation plant caught wind of what they had found and called in containment specialists. The case was closed after the animal control officers were given amnestics, and a cover story was put in place about a cow with mange that was put down where it had been found. In reality, the SCP Foundation rounded up old Big Charlie and transported it to safety with little resistance from the animal. They were able to trace the creature's origin back to somewhere called Butcher's Block, a nearby slaughterhouse. The manager of the establishment, one Jeff Fine, and a single employee named Barney Mossman were brought in by the Foundation for questioning. Another employee, Rory Gildson, was also retrieved from his home after having called in sick to work that day. Barney Mossman, the first of the Butcher's Block employees to be interviewed, stated that SCP-4158 had been called Big Charlie since long before he had started his job at the slaughterhouse. According to his testimony, he knew nothing about where the creature had actually come from only that it was fed hay, but would also occasionally eat anything else it could, including other cows. Since joining Butcher's Block four years earlier, Mossman had been told not to ask questions or to tell anyone else about SCP-4158. The morning after the huge creature had seemingly escaped, Mr. Fine had apparently angrily accused both Barney and Rory of selling him out and giving Big Charlie away to the competitors of Butcher's Block, even though they were the only slaughterhouse in the area. But Mossman was convinced that neither of them were capable of doing something like that. Rory apparently treated Big Charlie like his own child, and Fine had an even stranger relationship with the creature. 
Rory Gildson, the other of Fine's employees, was more helpful in shedding light on SCP-4158's origin than Barney had been. Rory explained that he and Jeff Fine had bought a pregnant cow from an unknown person nine years earlier, considering it to be a steal, a two-for-the-price-of-one bargain. However, one day without warning, the calf fell out of its mother. It wasn't born like any ordinary cow, however. According to Gildson, it had ripped through the mother cow's chest and looked disgusting. While Rory and Jeff had initially thought the calf to be dead, they discovered it had tried to get back into the barn after they hauled it outside. Their original intention had been to sell the creature off for scientific study, or failing that, to a freak show. However, after their attempts to sell the calf failed, Jeff and Rory had decided the best course of action would be to put the animal down. They had reason that releasing it into the wild could have negatively affected the ecosystem, so instead they took a bolt pistol and pushed it between the creature's eyes, then fired. But nothing happened. Rory tried again, but ended up breaking the gun instead. They slit the animal's throat, but it barely bled. Even butchering it on the spot while it was still alive did nothing. Fine and Gildson reduced the calf to little more than a skeleton, but it simply refused to die. The pair of them packaged the meat they had removed with the rest, hoping no one would notice or ask where it had come from. It was a few days later that Rory realized SCP-4158 was capable of regrowing whatever was cut off of it. He and his boss even tried some, and couldn't tell the difference. They had their hands on a cow that would eat anything put in front of it, and that could produce infinite meat. The Foundation probed Rory Gildson further for more information on the creature, learning that SCP-4158 was sterile and incapable of reproducing, the only one of its kind. Rory argued that the Foundation legally couldn't take Big Charlie away, that the creature was still private property. Little did he realize he was wrong. But he, just like Barney Mossman, also knew nothing about how the animal had escaped in the first place. Finally, Jeff Fine, the owner of the Butcher's Block Slaughterhouse, was questioned by the Foundation. He repeated Rory's earlier story about the strange calf that had been born, and how it could regenerate the flesh that was sheared off of it. Fine remarked that he considered it to be a blessing. When asked about his whereabouts on the night SCP-4158 had escaped from Butcher's Block, Jeff admitted that he had been praying, but not to God, to Big Charlie. He had apparently been doing this every night since realizing what the creature could do, viewing the animal as a provider and a savior. I just felt something when I was around him. I could tell that he wanted to make this sacrifice for us. Ever since he tried to get into the barn after we threw him out, I knew he cared for us," Fine told the Foundation. I would open his pen, take off my clothes so that I was pure before him, lay down and receive his blessings. And how would he receive those blessings? By drinking the animal's blood. Yeah, Jeff Fine was a real eccentric like that. One night, when Fine had entered the pen to perform this weird ritual, Big Charlie had escaped. But his owner was convinced that there must have been a reason for this, that the animal had some sort of goal. When the Foundation staff conducting Fine's interview dismissed this idea, the slaughterhouse owner became enraged. How dare you question Big Charlie? He knows what's best for all of us. I'm done here. I don't need to keep answering questions like this. Let me out. I need to see Big Charlie. I need to see if he's safe. The Foundation believes that Jeff Fine's practice of worshipping SCP-4158 was not due to any anomalous effect caused by the creature itself. None of the Foundation personnel tasked with feeding, studying, and shearing meat off of Big Charlie have displayed any similar behavior of performing abnormal religious rituals. He really was just a huge weirdo. As for the Butcher's Block Slaughterhouse, Fine and the rest of his employees were given amnestics to forget Big Charlie had ever even existed, and the slaughterhouse was closed under the false pretense of a health code violation and its staff being arrested for malpractice. The one question that remains unanswered, however, is the identity of the individual that first sold Jeff Fine the cow that gave birth to SCP-4158. It just goes to show you, though, Sometimes you don't know where your food is coming from. If you lived in Indiana in late 2004, who knows? You might have eaten some of Big Charlie and not even realized it. A D-Class prisoner enters the chamber. It is quiet, save for the subtle whipping sounds coming from a bizarre shape in the middle of the room. Upon closer inspection, it becomes clear that the floating object isn't one entity, but a mass of smaller objects, all floating and thrashing in the air. 
their ammunition of various calibers and sizes spinning around in a spherical form. The D-Class becomes nervous, but is ordered to proceed by Foundation personnel. Slowly, inch by anxious inch, he advances closer towards the mass of bullets. His heart knocks harder against his chest with every step he takes. The thumping begins to deafen his ears. He could feel his throat tightening up as the blood rushes to his head and sweat starts to form on his brow. The sound of the thrashing gets louder. With legs trembling and fingertips numbing, the D-Class opens his mouth in an attempt to let in a gasp of air to calm his nerves. But before he could even take a full breath, and in the blink of an eye, countless bullets suddenly burst forth from the mass, spraying the D-Class relentlessly with ammunition and killing him instantly. The Foundation personnel watching this from safety note down the events as they ponder the question. Why does this mass of living ammunition act so volatile? Why are some able to approach it safely while others are killed? What is the secret of SCP-577? Classified as Euclid, SCP-577 began as one of the most mysterious objects in Foundation custody. An animated mass of ammunition, those who are able to get close enough to it observe that the plurality of bullets inside were 9mm accompanied by a selection of 10mm and 45 caliber rounds. The bullets are normally calm, moving in predictable patterns and occasionally shifting the mass to reflect other shapes, including cats and dogs. But something else about the mass concerns the Foundation more and more. The mass is growing. It is dramatically larger than it was when it was first acquired by the Foundation, and it seems to be adding approximately a thousand bullets per year. This raises the question, can it be contained permanently? Currently, it is held in a standard large containment unit, but its quarters have been reinforced with the Foundation's best steel blast shielding. Due to the danger to anyone who opens the door, the entire facility is handled with remote technology and can only be opened by approved personnel. But someone needs to check that everything is stable. The Foundation learned the hard way that entering the containment unit was a bad idea. Any Foundation staff, ranging from a high-level scientist to a standard security officer, is met with immediate hostility from SCP-577's massive bullets the second they approach the entity. The bullets shoot out from the mass with speed of a standard handgun, aiming directly at their target. This indicates that SCP-577 is intelligent, it is capable of seeing and reacting, and it hates Foundation personnel with a passion. Fortunately, the Foundation doesn't have to sacrifice its permanent staff. SCP-577 is not the first entity to react with hostility towards its captors. After all, few of the specimens are happy to be permanently contained in secure facilities. So it was determined that D-Class personnel would be sent into the facility twice a year to inspect it for any damage, making sure the entity was still secure, and test SCP-577's reaction to the presence of different people not from the Foundation's staff. And that's where things got interesting. Many of the D-Class personnel didn't trigger the entity at all, resulting in neutral behavior. However, those D-Class who were initially Foundation staff and demoted due to broken policy were met with the same hostility as current staff, indicating that SCP-577 was not going to be fooled easily. The same happened with some D-Class with a specific background, who was immediately sprayed with a violent hail of bullets causing injury or death. Upon investigation, every single one of those D-Class was revealed to previously be a member of law enforcement. However, some D-Class personnel were met with a very different reaction. These people were the most likely to see the other side of SCP-577 when it reduced its hostile stance and instead took on a friendly form. Appearing as a dog or cat, it would even approach the D-Class in a welcoming manner. This was most likely to happen when the D-Class was formerly homeless or had spent time in the prison system. But one incident brought SCP-577's true nature into a new light. D-28126 was the latest unfortunate conscript to be sent into SCP-577's chamber for an annual cleaning and inspection. His duties were simple, including to inspect the walls for damage, clean out any stray material left around by the bullets firing, as well as any corpses that were left behind, and make any needed repairs to the walls. He would be wearing protective gear, but that wasn't always enough to protect someone from the hail of bullets and no one knew exactly how the volatile mass of bullets would react. But from the second the D-Class entered, it was clear that this would be a very different encounter. 
As soon as D28126 entered, SCP-577 seemed to take on a friendly posture. It shapeshifted into the form of a large cat and would frequently approach the D-Class while he was cleaning. The D-Class was confused at first, but soon seemed to appreciate the company. He would occasionally stop cleaning to pet the cat made out of bullets, but as the work went on, he seemed to slow down. He appeared to be crying, and eventually he stopped working entirely and slumped against the wall. The Foundation attempted communication with him, but the D-Class didn't respond. Soon, SCP-577 joined him against the wall, and the D-Class held him. His hand was guided into the mass of bullets, and it soon emerged holding a single bullet. The D-Class held the strange entity for a few more minutes, before the staff's insistence that he exit the chamber grew stronger. He eventually left, and the Foundation took him back into custody and examined the bullet he was holding. It was not a normal bullet. The bullet was moving, almost as if it was a beating heart as it throbbed up and down. Upon closer inspection, it was revealed to be covered with blood. But D-28126 had not been hit by the bullet. He was completely uninjured, but when he emerged from the chamber, his hand was covered in blood, exactly where he had inserted it into the mass of bullets. The bullet was sent to SCP facilities for testing. The blood was not a match for D-28126, but it was genetically similar, like a relative. The D-Class was brought back into the interrogation chamber and the bullet was returned to him. He was apparently linked to SCP-577 somehow, and identified himself by his name, Arturo Rojas. His interviewer, Dr. Vanderbilt, asked him to explain what happened, and Arturo explained that the mass of bullets didn't just turn into a cat, it turned into a cat he knew as a child, which had a uniquely shaped tail that he would recognize anywhere. The cat that was once helped by Arturo and his brother. Arturo was questioned why he quit working and began crying, and revealed that he heard the mass of bullets say something, barely audible. SCP-577 had whispered, I'm sorry, but what would a cat have to be sorry for? Arturo became angry when Dr. Vanderbilt questioned this, but Dr. Vanderbilt continued and conceded that Arturo recognized the cat somehow. He prodded Arturo to share the rest of his story, and Arturo eventually revealed the root of his bond to SCP-577. Arturo and his deaf brother Ricardo were homeless at a young age, after their mother threw them out. While they were living on the streets, they met a cat that they gave a little of their food to from time to time. The little cat became their constant companion. They named him Duck after Arturo's brother's favorite sign language gesture. But tragedy was just around the corner. Duck and Ricardo were inseparable, with the little cat essentially becoming a therapy pet to the boy. But one day, Ricardo encountered a police officer. The deaf boy couldn't understand the officer's orders, and the officer didn't know or didn't bother to use sign language. Ultimately, bullets were fired. Ricardo was killed. Another unarmed young man killed in a police shooting, and Duck was left alone. But the cat had one more job to do. He had led Arturo back to his brother. The area was swarming with police, and Arturo never got a chance to say goodbye. He lashed out at the only one he could, Duck. The cat tried to comfort his surviving person, but Arturo threw rocks at the cat and chased him away. He never saw the cat again, and was left alone with his grief. He saw on the news days later that the officer was cleared in the shooting. His brother was blamed for threatening the officer, and the news implied that Ricardo was a gang member. Arturo was left without closure, until SCP-577 entered the picture. Dr. Vanderbilt expressed his sympathies, but wasn't sure what any of this had to do with the entity. Arturo explained further why he started crying when he felt the pulsating bullet. He spent years sleeping next to Ricardo, and he recognized his brother's heartbeat. The bullet was his brother's heart, or at least contained his essence. And for the first time in 10 years, Arturo was able to make peace not just with the cat he had rejected out of grief, but with the brother he had lost far too long. The Foundation had answers, but they only led to more questions. Arturo had pulled a single bullet out of the mass of SCP-577, and it was the one containing his brother's heart. Was this the bullet that killed Ricardo? Was every bullet in the mass one that killed a person? Was the mass growing with every new death? And if that was the case, did the mass contain the memory and pain of every life a bullet took? If so, that would explain the compassion the entity seems to hold for those who had been homeless or imprisoned. 
as well as its intense hostility for any sort of law enforcement figure. For now, SCP-577 remains stable and contained within its unit, needing only standard upkeep of its cell to avoid any breaches. But as it continues to grow, Foundation authorities worry that it may get strong enough to eventually breach containment. But this is a tricky case for the Foundation. The entity's growth is out of their control, and nothing they've done to date has stopped or slowed it in any way. It seems something on the outside is making it grow and shows no sign of slowing down anytime soon. Who doesn't love dogs? They're friendly, energetic, and can be beneficial to their owner's happiness and mental health. On top of all those positive qualities, most dogs are fiercely loyal to their masters. You'll often hear stories of dogs defending their owners or even staying by their side through their very last days, and even sticking next to them beyond death. As sad as that thought might be to many dog owners, it provides us the perfect context for today's topic. It's about time you met SCP-1111, sometimes also known by the nickname The White Dog. This moniker actually refers to one of the two halves of SCP-1111, namely the former, SCP-1111-1, while its counterpart is simply known only as SCP-1111-2. As you may have already deduced, SCP-1111-1 is, or at least appears to be, a fairly common domesticated dog. Sporting white fur that gives it its nickname, the white dog is a cross between two different popular breeds, the German Shepherd and the Labrador Retriever. However, upon closer inspection, this particular pup is a far cry from one you might see fetching sticks or chasing squirrels at the park. For one, this dog never eats or drinks. Under normal circumstances, that would be worrying behavior in any dog. But in SCP-1111-1's case, it comes second to the fact that this dog is partially see-through. Now that's definitely not normal. In actual fact, this pooch is pretty far from ordinary. It seems to be at least semi-translucent, not quite as much as we usually picture a ghost or hologram, but also not fully visible like a living being. In fact, how clearly visible the white dog is can vary depending on how close it is to 1111-2. Any further than 500 meters away and the dog will gradually grow more and more transparent, but not fully invisible. But visibility isn't the only thing that shifts with 1111-1's distance from its other half. The size of the dog also changes. It remains standing at 150 centimeters when directly beneath 1111-2, and gradually gets smaller the further and further away from 1111-2 it gets. Finally, there's its eyes. SCP-1111-1 possesses a distinct pair of glowing red eyes, the brightness and intensity of which increase the closer it is to 1111-2. So let's recap. So far we have a strange white dog with glowing eyes that changes size and becomes more or less visible the further it gets from a secondary element. But if the white dog is SCP-1111-1, then what forms this second part of SCP-1111? Well, if you were to look close enough at the white dog, you'd notice the red collar that it wears around its neck. And hanging from that collar is a tag, on which is printed one single word. Loyal. It's certainly a fitting word to describe 1111-1. Why? Because SCP-1111-2 is presumably the dog's master, or rather, its master's dead body. Dressed in an old worn business suit and formal dress shoes, SCP-1111-2 appears to be a deceased male of indeterminate age. The precise identity of this man has proven next to impossible for Foundation researchers to determine. The condition of his suit and shoes have deteriorated so much that it has been difficult to even identify the original company that produced the clothing worn by the corpse. As for his cause of death, well that unfortunately seems all too obvious, given that the 1111-2 body always appears the same way hanging from a tree with a noose around his neck. Foundation staff observed the two parts that make up SCP-1111 have noted that 1111-2 will occasionally make quick, violent twitching movements. These random jerks and spasms of the corpse are consistent with those exhibited by a person who is dying from asphyxiation, and often researchers have heard the body making desperate gasps for air. The closer his white furried canine counterpart is, the more frequent and violent these motions and sounds will become. 
It's almost as if SCP-1111-2 has somehow been trapped on the very brink of death, reliving those final moments over and over again, all while guarded by his loyal white dog. If left alone and not interfered with, the white dog will lie down just beneath where its master's body is hanging. The dog never sleeps, nor does it require any food or water, and does not even seem to breathe. And as long as Foundation research staff keep their distance, both parts of SCP-1111 seem content to remain in a docile state. To keep them contained, the SCP Foundation has established a 2-kilometer safe zone around SCP-1111 keeping them monitored through cameras attached to weather balloons. The restricted enclosure is, according to a public cover story, a weather monitoring station, hence the balloons. No member of Foundation staff is permitted anywhere within a kilometer of SCP-1111, unless they are given express permission from a superior member of the Foundation. Should SCP-1111-1 ever stray away from the tree where its master hangs, though, then the area must be evacuated of all personnel until the dog returns to its normal position. However, Foundation staff are urged to be wary when approaching SCP-1111, because the white dog may well be more ferociously loyal than any pet. Emphasis on ferocious. The moment that 1111-1 becomes aware of anything coming towards itself and its owner's body, the dog will become viciously hostile. Regardless of the person or object coming towards it, the semi-corporeal canine will attempt to attack and destroy the intruder. In this state, the white dog exhibits even more dramatic physiological differences from a normal domesticated dog. Video footage recorded by the SCP Foundation shows that the dog is capable of reaching incredible speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour, which is, of course, considerably faster than an average canine. The white dog can also reach a height of 6 meters when jumping up into the air, and has teeth and a bite strength powerful enough to tear through armor plating composed of 15 mm thick titanium. Given the entity's speed, aggression, and translucent qualities, any attempts by the SCP Foundation to neutralize the white dog or even capture it for closer examination have ended the same grisly way for the staff members who tried. The creature's fierce loyalty defending its owner's body also make it incredibly difficult for Foundation staff to even get close enough to SCP-1111-2 to properly study the remains. As we said before, that loyal tag around the dog's neck is certainly an accurate description. On a date which has been redacted from its file, an incident occurred involving SCP-1111 and a team that consisted of a number of Foundation agents. This team had been ordered to neutralize the white dog and transport the anomalous animal to a containment facility. Attempting to evade the creature's direct line of sight, the agents approached the hanging body of SCP-1111-2 from the north the opposite direction to the way the dog was facing. Possessing a sense of hearing and smell far beyond that of a human being, the white dog was able to quickly detect the agents approaching its master. When the team got within 300 meters of the tree where the body was hanging, the canine set upon them, tearing at clothing and shredding protective armor with its teeth in order to get to the agent's soft flesh underneath. One of these agents fled, running as fast as they could from the area. But of course, this was a futile move as the white dog quickly noticed and began to pursue the Foundation agent with its super-powered speed. As it chased them, the surveillance cameras recorded SCP-1111-1 decreasing in size, becoming harder to see with the naked eye the further it ran from the tree. The dog's speed began to decline too. The further the dog got from the tree with the noose, the less the body hanging from it seemed to be spasming too. When the white dog had reached 900 meters from SCP-1111-2, the corpse was seen to stop moving entirely, frozen and stiff as one would normally expect a deceased body to be. Realizing how far away it was from its master, SCP-1111-1 froze. Appearing unsure for a moment, it turned to look towards the body of its master, perhaps sensing that the random jerks and post-mortem movements had stopped. At this point, the dog howled and sprinted back towards the tree, causing the corpse of its owner to begin twitching yet again. Footage of this incident showed that the white dog was impervious to conventional weapons, and any rounds fired at the canine by Foundation agents merely passed through its ghostly body. 
However, its claws and teeth were very much solid, and it was able to slaughter almost all the agents, save for the one who fled, who ended up being the sole survivor of the encounter. Following this disastrous mission, the O5 Council issued an order that, in order to protect the lives of Foundation personnel, only remote-controlled drones and expendable D-Class personnel would be permitted anywhere near SCP-1111. Shortly after the previous incident, a group of D-Class were sent into the area around the tree where SCP-1111-2 was hanging, this time approaching from multiple directions at once. But this only led to the same results, as the White Dog began to quickly move between each of the D-Classes, killing them one after another. Only one, D-83011, was able to make it close enough to the corpse to make any noteworthy observations. As they approached, the hanging corpse of SCP-1111-2 seemed to slow its jerks and twitches, and the body did something that had never been seen before. It opened its eyes. It raised its arms towards the approaching D-Class in what looked like a welcoming hug, only for D-83011 to be torn to shreds by the white dog moments after. Cameras nearby picked up more previously unseen movement, namely the owner's mouth moving almost as if he was saying the words, No, down boy. But soon after, the corpse fell limp again and resumed its normal twitches. Following this, the Foundation have theorized that the White Dog could possibly be contained by somehow removing its master's body from the area. Some staff have also noted that SCP-1111 shares certain traits with SCP-023, a similar anomalous creature also referred to as the Black Shuck. Much like the White Dog, the Shuck also possesses a ghostly canine form and appears to be the same large, dog-like creature that is referenced in ancient folklore from throughout the British Isles. According to legend, the Shuck appears to travelers at crossroads, serving as an omen of bad luck, impending disaster, and is even thought to be one of the hounds of hell itself. SCP-023, like SCP-1111, also has anomalous abilities that focus on geographic space. In the Black Shuck's case, Anyone it detects approaching it will die or lose a member of their family within a year. Researchers working for the Foundation believe that SCP-023 and SCP-1111-1 could be related, or even instances of the same phenomenon, a sort of dog yin and yang. But since they have still as of yet been unable to capture the white dog, it has been impossible to verify this. The SCP Foundation will no doubt keep trying though, while testing may have been suspended for the time being. They always know where to find SCP-1111-1, beneath its master's hanging body, guarding it for all eternity. When you think of the biggest, most money-making, merchandised, and capitalized game series of all time, there's only one franchise that comes to mind. Pokemon. For the entirety of its lifespan, Pokemon has been a financial powerhouse, and every year the series seems to grow in popularity and revenue. Whether it's games, cards, a show, toys, or even Pokemon-branded clothes that you need, you'll have no difficulty finding a product that appeals to you. Everyone knows Pikachu's face, and nearly every child born within the past 20 years has had a first-hand experience with Pokemon. It is, in some respects, inescapable. If you hate Pokemon, too bad, because this little electric mouse runs the world, and you'll just have to sit back and deal with it. One could even say that Pokemon is uncontainable, which poses quite the issue for the SCP Foundation, who work tirelessly to ensure that no facet of life is withheld from its reach. But the Foundation rarely deals with major franchises, beloved by millions upon millions of people across the world, and for good reason too. An anomaly tied in with a major franchise poses a lot of problems on the containment side, namely its ability to spread uncontrollably and without care, being witnessed by countless individuals before the Foundation comes up with a way to contain it. Global supply lines have to be interrupted to prevent anomalous products from hitting shelves, corporate espionage committed, and most of all a massively expensive cover-up operation to remove said products from consumers' hands. If the Foundation had to deal with an anomaly affecting the Pokemon franchise, there's no telling how out of hand it would get before they'd be able to get a handle on the situation. But in 2019, that's exactly what happened. Today we're going to be looking at SCP-5254, 
an anomaly dubbed Gotta Catch Em All in the Foundation's database. The year was 2019, the place, Japan, the home country of the Pokemon franchise. Every year since 2014, the Pokemon Company has held a festival named Pikachu Outbreak in the city of Yokohama, in which hundreds of costumed actors dressed as Pikachu would crowd the city's Mirai district and perform, dance, and even participate in a parade. The event was intended to celebrate the Pokemon franchise and promote whatever the latest venture the series is pushing, whether it's a game, a movie, or something else. The festival proved to be successful and has been held every year since. After all, who wouldn't want to see a legion of Pikachu running amok through the streets? But the fun would be short-lived during the 2019 outbreak, where something incredibly unusual occurred. Picture this, a large crowd, hundreds of fans dressed in Pokemon-themed attire, standing on both sides of the streets. Men, women, children, anyone and everyone came to see the Pikachu outbreak, and they weren't disappointed. Parading down the street was a horde of Pikachu, just as advertised. They danced, bounced, and walked together in routine fashion, all while the crowd cheered and yelled. Even the spectators in the crowd showed their spirit with Pikachu-themed hats, yellow tails fastened to their backs, and yellow face masks with two electrified red circles on the cheeks. The parade proceeded as normal. That is, until one of the parading Pikachu started behaving oddly. It began as out-of-sync movements, strange wobbles and deviations from the parade path. For the heavily coordinated Outbreak Festival, this was unusual. The rest of the Pikachu line danced to the beat of the music, sticking in formation as best as they could. Then, as if pushed by an invisible force, the strange Pikachu raced forward, diving headfirst into the crowd, barreling into the group of people and eventually colliding. The crowd moved out of the way, slightly shocked, no pun intended, by what had occurred. But then it happened again. Two more Pikachu ran into the crowd, and then again. Over 15 Pikachu ran themselves into the crowd, resulting in a massive disruption of the parade and the shutdown of the event entirely. The Foundation quickly caught wind of this and sent their closest operatives to assess the situation in a controlled fashion. After blocking off the crowd and shutting down the event, another strange detail emerged. One that ensured the Foundation that there had been some sort of anomalous significance to what was occurring here. Some of the crowd members involved in the collisions were suffering very peculiar medical injuries, namely blunt force trauma way stronger than what a clash with a costumed actor would induce, and severe electrical burns. The Foundation was positive there was something occurring here, and with a franchise as vast and popular as Pokemon, they didn't want to take any chances. Immediately, Foundation agents began collecting information on the event, setting up probes in the offices of Game Freak and the Pokemon Company, and attempting to get to the bottom of what exactly happened during the parade. When the Foundation interrogated the 15 mascots who collided with the crowd, they were shocked to learn that they weren't mascots at all, but instead fully separate entities that resembled the Pikachu costume. X-rays revealed that their once human skeletons were now fused to their costumes, and touching them produced a minor electric shock. The performers had become Pikachu, and now they were unable to be removed from their costumes. Every captured instance had expired before the Foundation was able to fully study and discern what was occurring to them, their bodies unable to support themselves after such a lethal, extreme transformation. Later observation found that the synthetic components of the costumes, such as the cotton and plastic composites, had fused into their flesh and muscle tissue. Bodily fluids were found to contain foreign DNA and numerous strange structures, to the point where an ordinary human's genetic makeup would be incomparable and unrecognizable with that affected by the anomaly. The Foundation tentatively opened a file on SCP-5254, the anomalous transformation of a human into the rough approximation of a Pokémon character, and began carrying out tests to determine what occurred during the festival. What caused SCP-5254 to manifest? It couldn't have been random, could it? The Foundation needed to know. One theory that the researchers working on the SCP-5254 file had come up with was that it was the large gathering of Pokémon-related clothing worn by the crowd that prompted the transformation. But that begged the question, 
Why hadn't this occurred at any previous festivals or large Pokemon-related gatherings? It was a huge franchise. There were absolutely more events that had masses of costume fans donning Pokemon-related gear. Did something happen in recent years to manifest this anomaly? The only way to find out was to conduct testing. In one of the easier experiments that a D-Class personnel was tasked with carrying out, the Foundation ordered a group of them to dress entirely in Pokemon-related clothing, which the Foundation provided themselves. Some items, such as a full-bodied Gardevoir onesie, were taken from Dr. Clef's personal collection itself. No, he is not taking further questions. Anyways, with the D-Class looking utterly ridiculous in full Pokemon getup, the observing researchers began their tests. First was a D-Class outfitted solely in a Pokemon Pikachu big face with ears hat, as the product's official title stated. After standing there for 15 minutes, the Foundation determined that there was no discernible effect. Next was a Pokemon Detective Pikachu cosplaying mask latex, which the Foundation placed on the same D-Class. After another 15 minutes with no changes observed, the D-Class closed the experiment, remarking that it was stupid. The research team told the D-Class to remain composed and to just continue along with the trials unless they wanted to be reprimanded. After that was a Daboon Adult Onesie Pikachu Animal Pajamas. A few researchers held back laughter as the hardened, muscular D-Class in front of them stood around in a Pikachu onesie that barely fit him. After asking him how he was feeling, the subject quickly turned aggressive. The results from this test were deemed inconclusive, due to researchers being unable to determine if the quick snap in anger was as a result of a potential anomaly or whether the D-Class was just getting fed up with having to do this. In my opinion, this test was hilarious. For the next test, two D-Classes were brought in, clad in Pikachu onesies. The D-Class were placed four meters apart. After a period of time, a tingling sensation was reported in the arms and legs, akin to that pins and needles feeling you get when your arms fall asleep, or when you get shocked by static electricity. The next one had four D-Classes, all dressed similar to the previous group. Instead of being meters apart, they were asked to hold hands, which the D-Classes begrudgingly did. Severe migraines were reported, as well as throbbing pain in the cranium and lower jaws of the face. Near the tailbone, some D-Classes reported a dull aching. Most curiously, several areas on their body had begun to change in skin coloration, namely a mustard yellow. Eventually, the Foundation began to test for an affiliation or emotional connection to the Pokémon franchise. Could that be the key to understanding SCP-5254? Another 4D-class, all noted Pokémon fans, were brought in. One had owned a copy of Pokémon Yellow for the Game Boy when he was a child, and another had a high-leveled account on the Pokémon Go app. The Foundation discovered that these D-class reported muscle spasms along the extent of their spines with one complaining of tightness in their chest before coughing up tufts of fur, and another physically recoiling upon an attempt at physical contact in fear they would electrically shock the researcher. These experiments proved to be fruitful for the Foundation, as they learned that SCP-5254 was irreversible. Removing the clothing or items did not result in the transformative properties of SCP-5254 reversing. Furthermore, the testing went on beyond this point just to cover all possible bases of what SCP-5254 was before the details were properly ironed out. A total of 56 D-Class personnel were lost during these experiments, and testing paused due to concern by Foundation higher-ups of a potential security breach and damage being done to the site's power grid. But most importantly, a connection to the Pokémon brand was what enabled SCP-5254 to truly take effect. That's what occurred at the Outbreak Festival, where the bodies of costume Pikachu fanatics fused into their costumes and barreled towards the crowd. Now that the Foundation understood the how of SCP-5254, they still had to get to the why. Even by Foundation standards, this is a pretty odd and random anomaly. Did the answers lie with Game Freak or the Pokémon Company itself? After the festival incident, the Foundation put web probes into the servers of the Pokémon Company's Japanese branch and had their web crawlers scan through millions of correspondence emails to find any hint of unusual behavior. A series of emails between major shareholders in the company were found. The first was from Kimishima Tatsumi, the CEO of Nintendo, the overseeing company above the Pokémon Company, and Sunikazu Ishihara, 
the latter's CEO. Do not ask questions. If this Sir Viper wants manpower for his project, give it to him. Our society will not mess with these irrelevant individuals. He, whoever he claims to be, may be charging us a small fortune, but at least he seems genuinely interested in bringing our creations to life. Bringing their creations to life? How curious. The email was dated to 2017, two years before the outbreak incident. The Foundation decided to dig deeper. Another email from 2017 exchanged between the two individuals months after the first. Tuesday will mark the fifth visit by the Fukushima Orphanage to our headquarters. I told the press it's part of our global outreach program to spread the joy of Pokemon to the rest of the world. Early results have been positive. I should have a specimen to show you the next time we meet in Tokyo. Your daughter likes Eevee, yes? It seemed like these executives were talking about creating real Pokemon somehow. What did the orphanage have to do with this? Another email read, Play anytime, anywhere, with anyone. Yes, the slogan for the Switch is very apt for what we're trying to accomplish. Your marketing team deserves a raise. I am pleased to report Pokemon Go has hit 750 million unique downloads in July, and 5 million daily average users this past week. The popularity of the franchise continues to grow. Think of the possibilities once we integrate augmented reality AR technology into the project. Altaria as a clean and efficient form of air transportation, Charizard serving in the self-defense forces, and yes, Pikachu making our reliance on nuclear energy a thing of the past. Soon Pokemon will come to life before our very eyes. The Foundation couldn't believe something as absurd as creating real Pokemon was a genuine possibility for these companies. It was going on right beneath their noses. But the emails from 2018 began to show cracks in the Pokemon Company and Nintendo's plans. The accidents are growing in number. Are you sure Sir Viper has everything under control? We cannot hide these incidents from the public forever. We already have our hands full trying to catch the runaways. If we don't take action soon, more people will get hurt. Or worse, the Pokemon brand will be tarnished forever. Whoever was responsible for creating Pokemon for the companies was going by the alias of Sir Viper, and it seemed like their experiments weren't working the way they planned. An email directly addressed to Sir Viper fully encapsulated the Pokemon company's disgust at the individual once they realized the experiments weren't succeeding in creating an immersive, fun Pokemon experience in the real world. You promised us Pokemon as pets and companions, not these mutations. I've had to recall thousands of faulty merchandise, with tens of thousands of defective products still circulating the market. Just what kind of sorcery have you forced upon our hands? The government is breathing down my neck. Tatsumi-san has had to resign, and I'm starting to hear about this foundation poking around. Tell me the truth. Is there any way to reverse the effects, or have you doomed us all? Sir Viper 1995, as their screen name read, responded with this. I don't know what to tell you. I've given the people what they want. Only true fans will get a Pokemon of their own. Your company was the very best at building your brand. Congratulations. Today Pokemon has taken over our hearts and minds. Perhaps one day, we will see them take over the world. And with that, the company had cut off all communication with Sir Viper. But now the Foundation had to get to the bottom of what was happening in these boardrooms and offices. Making Pokemon in real life? It sounded crazy. And from the way the emails were worded, they had apparently succeeded in making something even if they considered it a failure. Three months later, after all of the research on SCP-5254 was conducted, the Overseer Council authorized a raid on the Pokemon Company offices in Minato City, Tokyo, on June 16, 2019. From the way the emails were written, they had reason to believe that civilians were potentially being held against their will and used in these experiments. Failure to deal with them now could potentially spell disaster if they got out, and the cause of SCP-5254 wasn't immediately neutralized. Following the Japanese government's authorization of the raid, a Foundation Mobile Task Force detachment from Epsilon-11, Nine-Tailed Fox, was stationed outside the offices. The task force broke into the building through the fire exit, and promptly cleared out tourists and civilians from the area. During the raid, they encountered a large creature that resembled a Charizard, an orange fire-breathing dragon Pokémon, that stopped them in their tracks in the hallway. Wings and elongated snout, the perfect color. It looked exactly as if a Charizard had leapt from the screen and into real life. 
It spewed combustible orange liquid at the team, but they quickly dispatched it with ease, using their weapons to put some water on the Pokémon's fire. Well, the water was actually a salvo of bullets, but the metaphor still works. Most of the building was cleared, and those inside detained for further questioning. But then the team came to a set of steel doors. Inside was a room littered with toys, brightly colored walls, and large metal cages. Inside the cages were some of the most disgusting creations the team had ever witnessed. Sir Viper's failed experiments, clearly. Entities at various stages of SCP-5254 transformation. One resembled a Vulpix, a fox Pokémon. It had engorged eye sockets and blood flowing down their cheeks. Another cage had a boy with cheekbones protruding high and sideways, pulling thin skin over the rest of his face. Another had a large bear-like entity with serrated claws, with alternate fingers peeling and decomposing underneath. Most horrifying of all were a pair inside cages near the other side of the room. A girl with an extended, flattened, engorged tongue, which pulled drool onto the floor at her feet. She was made to resemble a lick tongue, a Pokémon with a similarly large tongue. Another was an elongated purple snake, like the Pokémon Arbok, except its head was that of a toddler. It writhed back and forth, bawling and screaming. The team requested immediate medical pickup to remove the specimens from the room. Wherever Sir Viper, the individual responsible for this was, the Foundation could not locate them. The Foundation contained the experiments and detained Mr. Ishihara, the CEO of the company. He was brought back to the research site for an interview. Ishihara claimed not to know of the experiment's existence, but he quickly broke down. When asked about Sir Viper, Ishihara had this to say. We didn't ask too many questions. When we found out what he had been doing to the children, we terminated his contract immediately, but the damage had been done. Later, we discovered he had already tampered with our production lines and distribution infrastructure. At this point, it's impossible to tell which products had been affected on the market. Following this, global coordination between Nintendo, the Foundation, and the Pokémon Company in an attempt to figure out a solution to products that were affected by SCP-5254 is presently ongoing. All attempts to contact Sir Viper 1995's email result in the same automated message. Happy hunting, but even you can't catch them all. You're a child, awake at night. What a feeling. In your room, you cling to these rare hours of the evening and watch the hour hand crawl closer towards the parts of the clock you've never seen touched. Now you stare out your window, embracing the moon, the stars, and the darkness that engulfs them. You trace an owl's hoo-hoos up towards the densest evergreen in the neighborhood. You see a rat scurry across the top of a brick wall. You wave to your new nocturnal friends, bonded by the preference of night. Now you you open your window and inhale, smelling the dark sky like chocolate cake. You hold it in as long as you can. Very soon, you know, it will all be taken from you. Not by a god or a black hole or any of the universe's hypothesized collapses. At this age, you know nothing of physical cosmology. You know nothing of the Book of Revelation. You're just a child. The forces that give and take from you are not understood through physics, nor philosophy, nor through numbers, nor thought experiments. Look at you. Your thumb is still pruned from having just kicked the habit of sucking it. Your pajamas are still one unified piece of clothing, cradling your entirety with fuzzy cotton. Your teddy bear is still an extension of your arm, not yet removed by maturity. You're still another 15 years from believing your life is dictated by astrological signs or personal free will or mathematical outputs. It's not that you're ignorant. In fact, you're quite bright as a child. You don't bother to comprehend the forces outside your house because you know as long as you are living inside it, they have no governance. The only true comes from within, from the two gods you have seen with your very own eyes, sitting on the ripped sofa in gray sweatpants, watching a show about rich people drinking mimosas on boats in the Mediterranean. The almighty parents, rulers of everything. And with just one compound word called up the stairs, they have the power to take everything away from you. Bedtime. 
and suddenly the curtains are pulled over the world you long for. Now it's not the stars, but the ceiling you're staring at. But thankfully, you are not alone. You pull your teddy bear out from its hibernation beneath your armpit, and you hug him gently, careful not to squeeze out his stuffing. Laying there, you can't help but wonder how your bear got like this, so beaten and bruised, torn up like a dog toy, one eye dangling from a string. His left leg bends forward, impersonating the joint structures of a flamingo. Yet, as far as you know, your best pal has done nothing but sleep. How is he so battered? Can hibernation be that taxing? Do teddy bears expire? The questions for now must be ignored. You lay there together in your bed fighting the feelings of slumber, almost as if rebelling against mom and dad's tyranny. Thinking deeply only makes you sleepier, and tonight, you insist on staying awake. It's 9.30, and you've yet to be sucked into a dream, and that in itself is a small victory. But your parents' wishes will not be evaded that evening easily, if ever. They fight back by turning on the air conditioning. The soft, rhythmic humming of the white noise weighs on your eyes, and soon you can't resist it any longer. Sleep sneaks up on you. The battle is lost. A safe ten minutes later, your parents poke their heads into your room and see your body stiff and motionless, wrapped in sheets like a mummy. They celebrate their victory with a quick kiss and go back to the sofa to rest like gods on the seventh day. And while you are sleeping, dreaming of a tomorrow where you don't surrender to the same powers, there is yet another battle to be fought. And if all goes well, you'll sleep right through it. But some children won't be so lucky. On July 7th, 2001, a Portland, Oregon news headline reported a young boy missing from home in the middle of the night. His parents were quick to respond that their son wasn't the type of boy to go wandering out into the dark, and that something suspicious was sure to be discovered there in his bedroom. The first thing noticed was his stuffed animal, a jovial orca torn to shreds, its stuffing scattered across the carpet. Its head and body were stationed in the corner nearest the bed, soaked in a black substance similar to ink its eyes damp with water. The boy, however, was not to be found. As the parents held their son's dismantled orca in their hands, feeling the weight of mortality, they combed their fingers through the stuffed animal's organs, as if giving it an impromptu autopsy, trying to determine what kind of beast could have done this. But it wasn't justice for the orca they were after. By the time we are old enough to be parents, we have outgrown empathy for our inanimate counterparts. For them, the orca was simply a representation of the cruel fate that may have also been bestowed on their child. Its death was only respected for how it related to the living. And so, the poor orca was set aside, forgotten about, until investigators called upon the Foundation to intervene, at which point MTF IOTA-12 were dispatched. It revealed that the young boy's room had large trails of viscous black liquid streaking the walls, the very same liquid found on the orca. But where did this liquid come from? Unfortunately, there was no camera footage to give us the answer. Neither were there eyewitness reports reports or any residual signs of what specifically occurred. Neighbors who were awake reported hearing the thump thump thumping from the room, which, as expected, was useless by standard insight, leading to nothing more than a series of rumors and speculations. Maybe it was an extremely localized earthquake. Maybe he was just throwing a temper tantrum. But where does maybe this, maybe that lead us to? Can factual answers ever come from this level of uncertainty? Well, one specific maybe just may be the key to cracking this case. Allow me to explain. Two days after the event, the child was rediscovered, unconscious behind a hedge in the family's garden. A brief interview revealed that the child witnessed the final minutes of what he described as an intense battle. He claimed, My orca was fighting a big monster, and then the monster grabbed me and took me out the window. But someone saw it, so it dropped me, and I hid in the bush. A second interview revealed no other discoveries, but the child claimed that the monster ate his socks. Initial reactions to the two interviews were as expected. Adults reasoned the claims were imaginary, a fabrication of the child's mind manifested to protect himself from whatever the real trauma endured actually was. But heard beneath the skeptical murmurs of jaded grown-ups enslaved by their narrow perceptions was one individual who dared to suggest, maybe, just maybe, the boy is telling the truth. And it was in the spirit of this hopeful and trusting maybe that the Foundation would prove the boy's story to be truth. 
and the truth would be known as SCP-6330. SCP-6330 is a phenomenon affecting stuffed animals worldwide, though it is most common in teddy bears. Manifestation of this phenomenon is referred to as a sleepwalker event, occurring only within the households of families with young children, typically between the ages of 1 to 14. While you're asleep, vulnerable to what lingers awake, your favorite stuffed animal may find life, impulsively combating enemies referred to as SCP-6330-2. These creatures typically blend with shadows, though this mechanism is poorly understood. They somewhat resemble creatures associated with fantasy, such as dragons or ogres, always manifesting beneath your bed, no matter how messy or clean it might be. SCP-6330-2 instances depict behavior indicating that they intend to hurt or prey upon the sleeping child, and it isn't nightlights or security systems that stop them, but rather SCP-6330-1s. SCP-6330-1 are stuffed animals already present in a child's room that seem to be non-anomalous prior to SCP-6330-2 manifestations. SCP-6330-1 has been shown to instantaneously manifest small wooden weaponry in order to combat SCP-6330-2 to protect their child. Battles have been shown to last upwards of 20 minutes and are always near silent. There is an unspoken agreement between both sides to keep their history concealed as best as they can. In observed cases, SCP-6330-1 have emerged victorious, though are severely wounded during the skirmish. Torn wool and stuffing are common, and following all known events, SCP-6330-1 have died due to their injuries, but only after sacrificing themselves for the safety of the child. Prior to death, the instance will drag the SCP-6330-2's corpse back under the bed frame and demanifest. To understand this, the Foundation has conducted just one test. Given the volatile nature of recreating the events, the Foundation did not push their luck with subsequent studies, and so it's the lone research done in 1987 on Site-44 that they still lean on to this day to understand SCP-6330 and the instances that come with it. It began with a researcher volunteering his seven-year-old daughter, henceforth referred to as Subject, to be placed in a humanoid containment room and soothed to sleep using a teddy bear that she had a strong emotional attachment to. For 12 straight tests, our subject was observed to sleep through the night peacefully, her environment remaining in alignment with the trivialities of deep sleep. But on the 13th study, something would happen, something very unsettling, even for the Foundation standards. MTF IOTA-12 were stationed at the room's entrance for swift intervention if needed, and until that 13th attempt, they felt their focus to be pointless. Approaching the third hour, however, they felt a subtle and unexplained value in their presence. They felt something coming on, that feeling while danger is looming, that feeling that makes you clench your fists just in case. And just as they made eye contact with one another to acknowledge this shared feeling within the group, a quiet rustling sound was heard beneath the bed, and sounds reminiscent of a large animal's breathing became audible. Suddenly, a pair of large, scaly, clawed hands grasped the rim of the bed frame. A creature resembling a western dragon emerged. But was it actually a dragon? Were the sheets ready to be blasted to flames? If slain, would the next regrow and multiply by the hundreds? These thoughts raced through MTF Iota 12's head. One member instinctually ran for the door to go protect the child, but he was held back and restrained, reminded that the success of the experiment was dependent on letting the situation play out naturally. He was hard to console. Patience at this moment did not feel like a virtue. It felt irresponsible. A creature standing approximately three meters above the ground switching between bipedal and quadrupedal motion was stalking a sleeping child, and they were instructed to simply watch. For five minutes, the SCP-6330-2 patrolled the room, moving silently and methodically, unaware of the surveillance cameras. Then SCP-6330-2 turned towards the subject, positioning itself at the foot of the bed, stretching its arms out towards the subject. It gaped its jaws wide, 
exposing rows of large pointed teeth and a dark pink tongue. It looked like a snake in a field of mice. As it prepared to lunge at the subject, MTF Iota 12 was ready to intervene. But before they could, the stuffed bear stood up on the subject's chest and drew a small sword and shield from an unknown source, almost magically. Like switching weapons in an old Zelda video game, it positioned its sword's tip downward and held its shield at its side. SCP-6330-1 hunched over slightly and twirled its sword, maintaining eye contact with SCP-6330-2 the entire way through. After 10 seconds, the SCP-6330-2 threw its jaws at the subject, and SCP-6330-1 responds with a leap towards the subject's attacker, slicing SCP-6330-2's eye. The SCP-6330-2 responds with a quiet grunt and touches its wound, which leaks a viscous black liquid. The SCP-6330-1 jumps towards SCP-6330-2 and, mid-battle, uses fabric from the bedsheets to quickly stitch the wound, attempting to minimize mess and proof of its presence. Both instances went to battle for nine minutes before the first signs of damage to SCP-6330-1. Following the severing of one of SCP-6330-2's dorsal spikes, it strikes the SCP-6330-1 with a heavy slap, which sends SCP-6330-1 across the room. It stands back up, placing a hand on its stomach, and looks at its hand, which is now covered in wool and stuffing. They charge at each other once again, but as the subject moves slightly in her sleep, both instances stop and quickly agree on peace until the subject settles. When that happens, the instances resume fighting. Research notes that while the battle is genuine, there is an element of guidance. They do not follow a script, but it appears they follow a code. While both anomalies welcome the conflict brought on by the other, neither wants it broadcasted to the public. After 20 minutes of battle, both instances are heavily scarred and injured. After kicking itself off of the SCP-6330-2's nose, SCP-6330-1 sprints from one side of the room towards SCP-6330-2, leaping into the air and landing a fatal blow, slicing the neck of the other instance, which falls lifeless to the floor. SCP-6330-2 is dragged by the SCP-6330-1 back under the bed. A short while later, the SCP-6330-1 emerges. Damage sustained includes loss of one buttoned eye, exposed stuffing, and torn wool. It places its sword and broken shield on a nearby nightstand. SCP-6330-1 then drags itself up the bedsheets towards the subject, who was sleeping peacefully throughout the test. It rests beside the child lying motionless. It seems to glare directly at the camera, and a small digit protrudes from its round hand giving a thumbs up to the researchers. Its head flops onto the child's cheek before it ceases to move. The father who risked his daughter for research is pleased with the discoveries regarding both anomalies, but it brings about a new set of questions concerning children and their relationship with the dark. These very thoughts you might even wonder yourself. Maybe a kid's desire to stay up past bedtime isn't so much about wanting to watch cartoons with curse words or read Calvin and Hobbes. Maybe it's not about a desire to be awake at all, but rather a subconscious fear of being asleep. Maybe our senses as children are heightened to the anomalies that creep about. Maybe all the fabled fears of children aren't fairy tales after all. And maybe mom and dad checking under our bed is just performance parenting. Because even if something were there, would they even be able to see it? Or is everything beyond an adult's understanding misattributed to the imagination? As we age, does our perception of how reality should look alter the reality that is actually there? Do we indeed see clearer with our expensive glasses from our high-rise office space? Or did we see more accurately in the glow of our action figure nightlight, spying through stitches in our blankets, looking past crusty eye boogers at what moved in the shadows? It is hard to ever know. For every real encounter a child has with an SCP-6330, there might be hundreds of falsehoods. The ratio is truly impossible to calculate. But as long as teddy bears are universal, so too are their anomalous enemies. And so where does that fact leave us? How do we go forward? Should we be afraid to put our children to sleep? Afraid of the monsters under their bed? I don't think that's what our hero would want. Sometimes we have to learn to trust things, even if we don't understand them. 
like gravity or multiplication. We have to trust that the relationship between children and their stuffed animals are in fact real. We have to learn their loyalty is reciprocated, even if the adult world has taught us otherwise. And if we ever need a reminder of these lessons, we can look to event 184 in Cambridge, England, where we have our first recording of a sleepwalker event outside of controlled testing, and also our first piece of evidence proving SCP-6330-1 to understand language and how to use it to connect with humans in ways beyond being cute and cuddly. On November 11, 2008, a call was filed to local authorities by a family who claimed to have discovered footage of a sleepwalker event within their son's room. Mobile Task Force IOTA-12 Lucid Dreamers were dispatched to investigate. Immediately, the footage was seized by personnel, and all members of the family were administered Class A amnestics. The child's bed swayed lightly as an instance of SCP-6330-2 emerges. The instance resembles an unknown creature, though it is described as having a large, muscular frame. The instance walks to the opposite end of the room, hunching over and observing the child for exactly 10 minutes. As the SCP-6330-2 begins to stand further upright, it extends a retractable set of claws. Then, the child's teddy bear suddenly stands, drawing a bow and quiver. SCP-6330-2 assumes a quadrupedal stance and snarls before lunging towards the bed. The SCP-6330-1 fires a single arrow towards the SCP-6330-2, striking the instance directly in its canine-like snout. SCP-6330-2 responds with a loud huff, reminiscent of that of a bull or bovine. The instances battle for approximately 30 minutes, the longest recorded sleepwalker event to date. Both show abilities and skill sets consistent with other SCP-6330-1 and-2 instances. Eventually, SCP-6330-2 has SCP-6330-1 pinned to a nearby wall and tries to strangle it. The SCP-6330-2 then pulls one of SCP-6330-1's arrows from its arm, plunging it into the Dash 1's chest. Then the Dash 2 leans its head towards the Dash 1 and whispers into the instance's right ear, though audio recordings cannot determine exactly what was vocalized. The SCP-6330-1 lifts up its head, staring blankly into SCP-6330-2's eyes. It reaches behind its back, pulling out a small, entirely wooden Glock 19 handgun. The bear points the weapon into SCP-6330-2's forehead and fires. The shot is silent, and the SCP-6330-2's body falls limp. Black viscous fluid sprays onto the wall. The SCP-6330-1 hauls SCP-6330-2's corpse towards the bed, noticeably limping. It drags the body by its large forearm and demanifests upon reaching the underneath of the bed. SCP-6330-1 returns and briefly stares around the room before turning to the child. It climbs up a desk and finds a piece of paper and a pen. It goes on to write the following note. Hello, Timothy. Thank you for always taking care of me. It really was fun. I was able to repay the favor of protecting you. Unfortunately, I am hurt. I need to go. I'm too weak to stay, and I just hope you'll remember me. It's been fun helping you. I've enjoyed my time under your care. Going into this, I knew it would happen. The sleepwalker is coming for you. I'm just happy I could do my job. Goodbye, my friend. I hope I may see you soon. Why do so many of the indigenous cultures of the colder regions of North America seem to share the same legend? A legend that tells of a monster that lurks in the forests, bringing cold and death to any that meet it. This creature is an omen of famine, a territorial beast that preys on human beings. Some cultures describe it as an unholy abomination, a spirit of winter and a warning against the dangers of selfishness, one that is created whenever a person resorts to cannibalism in order to survive. It will gladly devour any man, woman, or child that wanders into its territory, holding a horrifying and insatiable hunger for human flesh. So how did so many cultures end up with the same story? Could it be because it's real? Depictions of the beast vary, but it is most commonly recognized by its tall skeletal form, like a body exhumed from the grave, even carrying the stench of death and decay with it. Anyone who encounters one risks being eaten or transformed into a creature just like it. 
The monster's name means an evil spirit that devours mankind, though to even say the name is taboo, as it's believed to give power to the beast. Of course, these are all just legends, right? Stories to warn against the dangers of greed and selfishness, but otherwise nothing to fear. There's no proof that such a beast could actually be roaming the frozen wastes. Many at the SCP Foundation felt the same way, until they heard about SCP-323, hmm. the Wendigo's skull. Kept under lock and key by the Foundation with around-the-clock surveillance, SCP-323 is an anomalous object with ties to the various Wendigo legends. As the object's moniker suggests, SCP-323 is a skull, not a human skull, mind you. It more closely resembles a cervid skull. Cervids are a family of mammals that include most varieties of deer, elk, and other similar animals. And this particular cervid skull sports a tall pair of antlers. SCP-323 is definitely not a fresh skull either. It shows signs of weathering and a few scars across the surface, looking as if the bone has been bleached and eroded through exposure to the elements. The skull is also missing its lower jaw, and has a sizable hole on the rear underside that may have been carved using stone tools. SCP-323 is kept restrained inside an armored container within a concrete containment cell, and personnel are only ever allowed near it to check the restraints for signs of damage. Additionally, any Foundation staff that enter SCP-323 cell must be accompanied by an armed security officer, and in the event of a containment breach, the entire site is to be evacuated. Seems like a lot of precautions and safety measures for an old piece of bone. Surely a harmless deer skull could never be that dangerous, right? <gasps> Wrong. You might be forgiven for thinking that a skull can't possibly cause harm. After all, SCP-323 is just a skull, then whatever animal it belonged to is dead. But this skull is far more than it appears to be. Through extensive testing, the SCP Foundation's researchers have learned that the skull isn't dead. No, this skull is awake and aware. It can see, hear, and has a sense of touch, and it can and will react to various stimuli. However, this does not necessarily mean that SCP-323 is alive or even sentient, but it definitely appears to have some level of sapience. It will target certain members of personnel that get too close and has attempted multiple times to breach containment. It also reacts violently to anyone speaking English or French near it the only two languages prohibited inside SCP-323's cell. So while the skull is not technically alive, it is definitely aware. Still, why the need for so many protocols to keep it contained? It's not as if a skull can just walk off on its own. Of course not. But SCP-323 can move, at least to a certain degree, often in a reactionary manner. SCP-323 will vibrate or move on its own, for example, turning to watch as personnel enter its containment cell. In most cases, these movements are tiny and insignificant, but other times the skull lunges, launching itself at Foundation personnel as it desperately tries to get free. Now you know why it's kept restrained. So, we have an antlered cervid skull that can move and has a low level of awareness. On their own, these would be more than enough to warrant the Foundation's interest, but the anomalous properties of SCP-323 don't stop there. The skull has an inherent ability to influence the minds of those around it. Anyone spending an hour within a 15-meter radius of SCP-323 is likely to experience the effects of this influential power. This will often result in them exhibiting uncharacteristic behaviors, thoughts, and urges, including cannibalistic tendencies and outbursts of random violence. Almost three-quarters of people that suffer the influence of SCP-323 will feel an overwhelming compulsion to take the Wendigo skull and fit their heads into the chiseled hole on the rear underside. If someone attempting this finds that their head is too big to fit inside the hollow skull, there have been cases of individuals trying to bludgeon their heads on any hard surface they can find nearby in an attempt to get their head down to a more manageable size. This will continue until one of three outcomes occurs. One, the person manages to fit their head into the skull. Two, they cause themselves so much cranial damage that they are rendered unconscious. Or three, they end up killing themselves through repeated violent head trauma. Of course, if a person actually manages to fit their head inside SCP-323, 
then that is a different story entirely. In these instances, the individual becomes classified as an instance of SCP-323-1. Within 10 minutes of wearing the skull, this person will suffer dramatic changes to their body. Any and all body fat will be rapidly shed as their hair also begins to fall out, leaving them looking starved and almost skeletal in appearance. Their distal phalanges, those are the bones at the tip of the fingers, will elongate and rupture the skin as they become bony, claw-like appendages. The subject will also find that their teeth have grown abnormally long and sharp while their limbs will blacken as if they were suffering frostbite symptoms. Along with their external transformations, SCP-323-1 will also get increased strength and heightened resistance to pain. They aren't invulnerable, though, and can still sustain damage and injuries. SCP-323 will also have a dramatic change happen to their metabolism which will occur a few minutes into the physical transformation. The subject will now need an almost constant intake of calories, which, if they don't receive, will cause them to starve almost instantly. With the transformation process complete, the new instance of SCP-323-1 has finally become the Wendigo, a terrifying monster with one goal to feed. The SCP-323 instance will seek out any human beings it can find so that it can feed upon their flesh. Those who have witnessed the 323 instance in the midst of a feeding frenzy have described the way it violently slaughtered any person it could find, leaving only a mess of blood as it devoured them their screams mixed in with the sounds of bones crunching. In the times that the creature cannot find a human to nourish its monstrous appetite, it will try to keep itself alive any way it can. Sometimes it will slow down its movement to try and conserve energy. Other times it will ration whatever food is available to it saving some of its last meal for a leftover snack. And on occasion, the monster will engage in auto-cannibalism, a form of cannibalism that involves eating parts of itself. Humans certainly seem to be its preferred food source, though. Even when other sources of meat would be easier to acquire, SCP-323-1 will zero in on human beings and will do anything it can to make a person its next meal. When chasing down its prey, human or otherwise, SCP-323-1 has been observed uttering phrases either spoken in the primary language of whoever was transformed by the skull, or in the Severn, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Cree languages. These are all native languages of the numerous indigenous creatures that shared legends of the Wendigo. Where do the phrases come from, though? Are they another side effect of SCP-323's influence? Or do they originate from the skull itself? The Foundation's researchers are still trying to figure that out, and at the moment, they have no clues as to where they come from. In one containment breach in 2006, during which an instance of SCP-323-1 was able to kill and devour 12 members of Foundation personnel, on-site surveillance recorded audio of the creature speaking. It rasped, while dragging a body behind it. After this, the sound of a wet cracking noise was recorded, possibly one of the victim's bones being broken by SCP-323-1 so it could get to the marrow inside. The 323-1 instance does at times seem to try and resist the influence of the Wendigo skull. Additional recordings capture the creature saying, the creature then said, followed by noises of it eating the body. It seems that even the Wendigo has its own internal struggles, perhaps showing that there is still something left of the human who put on the skull, and that deep down they are fighting against their cannibalistic impulses. But where exactly did the Foundation find SCP-323? And is it really the skull of an actual Wendigo? the famous creature from North American legend. In 1997, 
the SCP Foundation sent a detachment to Bitterin Lake in Saskatchewan, Canada. There had been reports of a local community murdering individuals and leaving their bodies in the forest to appease a dangerous creature residing nearby. This creature, as it was later discovered, was an instance of SCP-323-1. Someone had found the skull and succumbed to its influence placing it on their head and turning into a monster. Ever since, the locals had been killing people and offering up their dead bodies as sustenance, fearful of what would happen if they didn't after being brought up with legends of the Wendigo. SCP Foundation agents were able to capture the beast, however it died of starvation while being transported back to containment. They also covered up the recent deaths in the area by giving the local residents amnestics and creating a cover story about an unidentified serial killer. Prior to this, James Namagoose, a local man who was involved in the murders, was brought in for questioning. He remained oddly calm when interviewed, but admitted he had helped move the bodies that were being offered up as food for SCP-323-1, or as he called it, the Wendigo. According to James, a local story among the Cree people told of men who had once tried to control a Wendigo, and perhaps even tame it through offerings of food. Whether or not James and his fellow locals had the same intention, their primary concern was keeping themselves safe. He described first encountering the creature, a warped man walking out of the woods, killed our friends right in front of us. Sometimes it would stare more than it would make to kill, try to talk to you. It whispered at me, Pemisto, come and eat. It made me cold in my bones. As the interview continued, James claimed that he felt like he understood this warped man. He described feeling like the Wendigo was encouraging him to kill, that the creature would help him pass when his own time came. James told the Foundation doctor questioning him that he had heard the creature in his mind, and he felt it watching him almost constantly. Mr. Namagoo stated that he hoped in killing people as offerings to the Wendigo, that his own family would be spared. Like the other locals, James Namagoose was given amnestics to forget all about the creature and the murders he'd played a part in committing. So far, none of the Foundation's staff had experienced any similar behavioral effects to those James described. Those who work closely with SCP-323 or have witnessed an instance of SCP-323-1 have felt the creature communicating with them, or urging them to kill on its behalf. Ultimately, who is to say if SCP-323 is the skull of a Wendigo like those from Legend? It certainly seems like it is, but with no way to tell exactly how old the skull is, perhaps it's actually the reverse, and it was the Wendigo legend that spawned from instances of SCP-323-1 that were first encountered by indigenous North American cultures hundreds of years ago. One thing is for certain, if you ever come across a skull with tall antlers, you should try to resist putting it on. Otherwise, you might not be feeling like yourself for much longer. The SCP Foundation has dealt with plenty of things that no one could ever even imagine. Creatures and objects beyond anyone's wildest dreams. An evil old man that can walk through walls. An Ikea that never ends. A giant underwater eel that can erase your memories. And so much more. But sometimes the anomalies they discover seem to be plucked from a familiar nightmare. In Korea, shortly after the end of the Second World War, a team of SCP Foundation officers encountered something right out of a dark, twisted fairy tale. In the late 1940s, the 5th Squad of the Eastern Division of the SCP Foundation received a call to come to Busan, Korea, and investigate a potential anomaly involving several deaths. Three agents, referred to from now on as Agent 1, Agent 2, and Agent 3, were deployed to the region, where they first headed to the morgue to examine the bodies under the cover of reporters investigating the deaths. The nature of the wounds indicated an animal attack, an eyewitness account from an old woman who saw a fox-like creature eating one of her cows supported this hypothesis. Of course, the agents knew differently. Sure, it was something like an animal. But this culprit was no animal they had ever encountered. The three recounted stories of fox spirits, villainous tricksters, capable of changing their shape and oppressing all kinds of havoc on those unfortunate souls they targeted. While sweeping the area, the agents encountered a beautiful young woman sitting under a waterfall, combing her hair. She was dressed in a light robe, and her feet were bare. This, they noticed, gave her away. Instead of having human feet, she had paws covered in reddish fur. The agents assumed that this creature was inexperienced, unable to properly conceal herself. 
They believed they had the upper hand on her. They would soon see the error of their ways. The woman greeted the three men and invited them to have dinner at her nearby cottage. Believing themselves to be relatively safe, armed as they were, and with three people against one delicate, if inhuman, woman, they agreed. The fox woman ushered them to a lovely rustic cottage and sat them down at the dining table. She served them plum wine, rice pickled turnips, and meat. Everything was delicious, and feeling at ease, the agents decided to turn in for the night. This creature, though unusual, did not seem threatening. She had no reason to attack them, or so they thought. Agent 1 woke in the night to go to the bathroom and tiptoed out of the cottage to relieve himself behind a bush. There, he saw Agent 2 with the fox woman. Let's just say, they were getting to know each other intimately. Suddenly, an abrupt change of mood, she bit him. She tore the man's throat out with her teeth before he could scream, turning his cries to a wet, useless gurgle. Then she took her hand and plunged it into his belly, shredding the flesh with razor-sharp claws. He thrashed and tried to fight her off, but she shoved him to the ground and tore his stomach open, rooting around inside for something. When she found it, she stopped and gleefully tore out his liver. As the first agent looked on in horror, she lifted his colleague's liver and swallowed it whole in one single gulp. Not noticing her onlooker, she continued her vile work, peeling her victim's skin like an orange. The agent who witnessed the whole thing regained his ability to move, adrenaline flooding his veins, and ran back to the cottage in search of his remaining teammate. Agent 1 shook Agent 3 awake, babbling incoherently as he tried to explain what was going on, and the fact that they needed to leave, and they needed to leave now. To his shock, Agent 2 walked into the room, asking what all the noise was about. Agent 1 immediately noticed the man's glowing yellow eyes and made his next move without thinking. He pulled out his gun and fired. Agent 3 drew his weapon next, pointing it at 1 and yelling for him to put the weapon away. 1 tried to explain that this man was not their friend, but rather the fox in disguise, but he wouldn't listen. The fox grabbed 1 and 3 shot him in the upper arm. Agent 1 dropped to the ground, wailing in pain as the fox laughed in a high-pitched devilish whine. Agent 1 scrambled away, crawling into the living room and slamming the rice paper screen door shut. There, laid out on the dining table, was another agent. They had seen this man at the base of the mountain only a few days ago, but now here he was, eyes wide and glassy, and skin flayed open. Then Agent 1 saw the remains of their dinner. In the bowls, there was the flesh of their fallen colleague. With it was not rice but maggots crawling over the meat. Agent 1 was able to improvise a weapon, breaking off a portion of the wooden beam and stabbing the fox through the stomach as she lunged through the rice paper door. He made his way through the forest, running as fast as he could with his gunshot wound. He found his way to the bank of the river and attempted to cross. However, he was disoriented and afraid. It was pitch black outside, and he was nauseous from the pain. He slipped on the wet rocks and hit his head, falling into the water. The rapids carried him away, pulling him downstream for half a mile before he was able to grab hold of an exposed branch. Agent 1 made his way back to his team's van, broke a window, and pulled a flamethrower from the back. He recalled legends about similar fox-like creatures mentioning an aversion to fire, and so he prepared to fight her off with as much as he could get. Just as he readied the flamethrower for use, the fox woman emerged from the tree line. What happened next is unknown, lost from the official record. However, after several days, a retrieval team tracked down Agent 1 and rescued him, capturing the fox woman in the process. He was taken to the hospital, where he remained with a serious infection for several days before he was discharged. Initially, the Foundation planned to terminate the creature. However, Agent 1 vehemently opposed that decision. He insisted that they should keep her alive. He also recommended the containment methods used to imprison her be adjusted. The agent promised that she would not be held by the chosen methods, and that the result of her inevitable escape would be devastating. In his official interview, he had this to say on the subject. Like I said, she's spiteful. Every little slight in her eyes she saves up. The only way she knows how to repay an insult is death. Chaining her to the wall like an animal. When she gets out, and she will get out, she's going to kill everyone who had the slightest thing to do with it. She won't settle for anything else. Much to the Foundation's surprise, Agent 1 visited the Fox Woman in her holding cell several times. The Foundation attempted to understand this concerning behavior, but Agent 1 refused to admit that there was something strange about it. 
His attachment to the Fox Woman had been attributed to Stockholm Syndrome, brought on as a result of several days in the woods spent as her captive. To this day, Agent One is the only person to survive that long alone with the creature that is now known as SCP-953. SCP-953 is a female red fox, weighing approximately 8 kilograms. Unlike an ordinary fox, her spine splits at the base into nine different tails, previously referred to as a kitsune, the shape-shifting fox spirit of Japanese legend. It has since been discovered that she is actually a kumiho, a Korean fox spirit with similar qualities. SCP-953 is a polymorph, also known as a shapeshifter, though she retains some aspects of her fox-like appearance no matter what form she is in, including ears, paws, tails, eyes, and fur. Though she attempts to cover these revealing physical traits with clothes and hairstyling, she is unable to get rid of them entirely. In addition to her shapeshifting, 953 has potent psychic abilities, including the powers of suggestion and telepathy. She has used these abilities to wreak havoc on her victims, causing them to experience terrifying hallucinations, hurt themselves, and in one particularly horrific case, convincing a mother to kill, cook, and eat her own child. She has also successfully used these abilities to escape containment six times. SCP-953's most recent escape caused the deaths of 10 Foundation staff. After destroying nearby security cameras, she shifted into the appearance of an adult man, walking out the front door in a stolen lab coat. Anyone who stopped her to ask for identification was swiftly slaughtered. After her escape, the fox disappeared for five years until she resurfaced at Yifcon, a convention for furries and anthropomorphic animal enthusiasts. There, the fox-like ears and tail that might draw attention in other places allowed her to hide in plain sight. The Foundation was alerted to her presence when a terrified hotel housekeeper called 911 after walking in on SCP-953 slicing open the torso of a dead convention goer. By the time the Foundation reached the convention center and captured the fox, she had left two dozen corpses in her wake. The bodies, all mutilated almost beyond recognition, were found scattered throughout the hotel in various places, including stuffed into a mattress, hanging over a shower curtain rod, rolled up in a carpet, and strewn across a banquet table. The survivors were given Class A amnestics to wipe their memories and released from custody. The convention was cut short, with a dangerous gas leak as the cover story. So far, the Fox has not escaped Foundation custody again. SCP-953 is kept in a Type 4 containment cell in Hallway 99 of Site 17. She is provided 1.5 kilograms of fresh liver every day to eat, as well as clean drinking water and a futon with blankets and sheets that are changed out weekly. In exchange for good behavior, she is provided the occasional luxury item such as plum wine, novels, or a variety of Korean sweets. After so many successful escapes, the Foundation realized that simple physical containment was not adequate to keep SCP-953 away from the general population. Making use of her fear of dogs, the Foundation keeps 953's containment chamber surrounded by dog kennels filled with Korean Jindo and American Foxhounds. All staff assigned to SCP-953's containment chamber are to be given background checks, looking for any prior ties to the furry community. Such affiliations may make them vulnerable to SCP-953's influence, and have been attributed to the death of one Agent Gallagher. Because of her psychic abilities, no direct contact with 953 is allowed. All communication with the Fox must take place from a distance of 100 meters, and food, water, and other items are delivered to her via a robotic assistant. She must be considered armed and dangerous at all times, and can only be transported while accompanied by six members of armed personnel. There are folklore-based procedures in place for employees as well, providing specific instructions to staff assigned to SCP-953. No matter how odd or ridiculous these instructions may seem, the staff is to adhere to them and remember that what we may think of as classic fairy tales are often more like ancient special containment procedures. If versions of the Kumiho and the Kitsune exist, then who knows what other seemingly mythical creatures the SCP Foundation might encounter in the future? What other beasts are lurking on the edges of civilization? hiding in the shadows, or worse, hiding in plain sight, just under our noses. Best to brush up on your local folklore, just in case. And as always, be careful out there. Everyone in this sleepy mountain town had heard stories about the abandoned mall, 
and the malevolent creature that lurked in the wreckage there. There had been enough missing persons cases, lost children, teenagers sneaking out to explore and never returning home, urban explorers who stumbled out of the darkness disheveled and traumatized with an eyewitness account no one wanted to believe. There wasn't anyone left in the surrounding area willing to set foot in that cursed place. But that didn't stop opportunistic out-of-towners from paying the occasional visit, especially if they felt like there was money to be made in those crumbling corporate walls. Grant and Jason, the hosts of up-and-coming investigative reality show Ghostly Happenings, were two such visitors. When they heard the rumors about an abandoned mall haunted by some sort of dark presence blamed for the disappearance of local children, they packed up their van, picked up their underpaid cameraman Derek, and headed straight for the infamous building. Uh, are you sure we're allowed to be here? Derek asked shakily as he began filming. Nope! Grant answered cheerfully. That's part of the fun! Jason laughed. Look, man, this place has been left to rot by the city. No one cares if we're shooting some footage. Besides, we're less about the cops and more about the ghost of the mole! Grant grinned. Ooh! Not funny! Derek grumbled. Come on, serious faces, we're rolling! Jason nudged his co-host, and the two snapped into their on-camera personalities. Once a bustling center of suburban American life, this shopping mall has transformed into a den of terror. Grant's voice dropped into a lower register, his expression intense. Locals swap stories of something inhuman that calls this place home, something that doesn't take kindly to trespassers, Jason added. A ghost? A demon? Just an urban legend? That's what we're here to find out. Grant pulled out an EMF reader, which began beeping as he turned it on. Ah, uh, there seems to be a lot of activity in here already. I'm picking up something. Don't know if you folks at home can see this, but the meter's going crazy, Jason exclaimed. It was a fake meter, of course. One that they rigged up to beep and react when Grant pressed certain hidden buttons. But the audience didn't need to know that. They were tuning in for story, for spectacle, not for the truth. If they wanted that, they could flip over to the Nature Channel and watch some lions chasing a gazelle. On this show, they were chasing pure entertainment. They continued deeper into the building, taking in the massive echoey space, the dusty storefronts, the beams of rotten wood strewn across the ground, the rats that skittered across the floor. It was the perfect creepy atmosphere. Maybe a little too perfect. A little too creepy. What was that? Derek practically jumped out of his skin, spinning around to look at something behind him. Hey, stay on us! Grant snapped. I saw something moving back there, Derek insisted. It was a rat! Jason rolled his eyes. There are tons of them in here! Derek shook his head. No, it wasn't a rat, it was way too big. Okay, a raccoon then, come on, get it together! We've been in way worse locations than this, remember that old tuberculosis hospital? Grant shuddered. <sighs> God, no, that was scary! This is nothing! Well, not nothing. Jason elbowed his partner. I did a good job scouting this place, right? Grant was about to answer when his foot bumped something on the ground. He looked down and saw a Polaroid camera next to a long, empty water bottle and a small backpack. Oh man, get a shot of this! Derek obliged while Jason took a closer look. This must have belonged to one of the urban explorer types who came in here. He unzipped the backpack, rummaging around. Hey, look, photos! Tons of them! He dumped the pictures out onto the ground. Think he got some spirit photography done before he bit the dust? Well, might as well see. Grant joined Jason on the ground, sifting through the photos as Derek watched anxiously. Boring, boring, deer, dog, sunset. Now oh, wait a minute. He stopped, holding up one specific Polaroid. This is the money shot right here. Derek, zoom in on this. All three men looked at the picture, illuminated by the camera's light. It showed a tall, long-limbed, pale creature, vaguely humanoid in shape, but at the same time distinctly not quite human. Its mouth was stretched wide in a wordless screech. Its eyes bloodshot and wild. Its long, tapered fingers were reaching towards the camera. Damn, that's spooky. Jason laughed, a bit of nervousness creeping into his voice. How do you think he set this up? Grant asked. What if it's real? Derek swallowed the lump in his throat. Don't be an idiot, Grant scoffed. But then, from the outside, not 100 feet away, they heard a scream. Ears splittingly loud, filled with rage, pain, and animalistic instinct. It was like nothing any of them had ever heard before. The scream was followed by the sound of splitting wood, branches crashing to the ground, and horrifyingly, the sound of something breaking down a nearby wall. 
What did you do? Jason backed away from the sound. Me? You opened the backpack? Grant shot back. Guys, I think we need to get out of here. Derek watched in wide-eyed terror as two pale hands ripped a hole in the wall in front of them, making an opening for that pale, hairless head from the photograph to poke through. All three men prepared to make a break for it and run for their lives, but as soon as the creature saw them, it was already too late. With another scream, SCP-096 sprinted toward them, grabbing each man and throwing them to the ground. The camera shattered into pieces from the impact, and Derek skidded painfully across the ground. As he rolled onto his side to try and push back up to his feet, he caught a glimpse of the monster opening its mouth impossibly wide and descending on his bosses. He really didn't want to focus on what happened next, but suffice to say, there was nothing of them left afterwards. Derek tried his best to escape, but he was no match for the brute strength and speed of SCP-096. From the moment he saw its face, his fate was sealed. There was no escape. Soon, the beeping EMF meter, the scattered photographs, and the broken pieces of the camera were the only thing left of the crew from ghostly happenings. Their devoted fans would never get another episode, but at least one being in the abandoned mall could rest easy now. SCP-096 was safe again. No one was living who had seen its face. It slowly crawled back to the hole it had made in the wall, ready to return to the forest and climb back up the mountain. There, it could curl up beneath a tree and stay there for as long as it wanted. But as SCP-096 reached the hole in the wall, where it had once been able to see night sky, stars, and the trees in the distance, there was only blackness. It was as if something dark was stretching over the opening, blocking the outside world from view. 096 reached out a hand to push the blockage out of the way, but whatever it was, slithered away from the touch faster than the pale hand could move. The wriggling darkness crept back into the building, weaving in and out of the shadows as SCP-096 watched it curiously. Whatever it was, it hadn't looked at the creature's face yet. It wasn't sure if this thing even had eyes. But then, stretching out of the darkness and into view, was a garish face with wide, white eyes with massive pupils, a round nose, and a wide, wide mouth stretched into a toothy grimace that might have once looked like a smile. This was the creature that had made the Maul its home, the apex predator of this biosphere, and it was staring directly at SCP-096's face. Its face. With a shriek, 096 flew into a primal rage, clawing at the cat-like creature, but before 096 could reach it, the thing was gone. Where was it? Where did it go? 096 roared, tearing at the floor, ripping up the tile and gouging long, deep scratches in the concrete beneath. A sound in the distance drew 096's attention, and it bolted in the direction of the noise, swinging at any obstacle in its path as it went. It ripped down a banner advertising free frozen yogurt samples, crushed an empty cell phone kiosk, and threw a gumball machine to the floor with a crash. It would rip the entire mall apart if it had to, if that was what it took to destroy the being that had caught a glimpse of its face and disappeared. Then, 096 could see it. That face. That wide-eyed, grinning face. It sprinted toward the face as fast as it could. The cartoon cat was looking at 096, not from a place in the room, but from behind the screen of a television in the electronics store window. Somehow defying the laws of physics and reality, it had made its way into the TV. 096 didn't pause to ponder the logic of this. There was no room for critical thought. There was only the need to shred, to consume, to destroy. It burst through the window, sending shards of glass in every direction, and reared back to attack the screen. It was so focused on its singular task that it didn't notice the long black arms snaking across the floor, winding around its feet. All of a sudden, 096 lost its balance as its legs were pulled right out from under it, those stretchy arms dragging it into the TV screen itself. When 096 regained consciousness, it was in a place it did not recognize. Gone was the inside of the mall or the familiar forest and mountains outside. Instead, SCP-096 was in some sort of hand-drawn world, a massive house with a hallway that seemed to go on forever, lined with infinite doors leading to who knew where. The floor tipped and tilted at odd angles, and the geometry made no three-dimensional sense. 
It was dizzying and deeply off-putting. SCP-096 had no frame of reference to compare it to, but a human witness might have noticed that this place looked like something out of an old cartoon, from the days of Steamboat Willie and the like. SCP-096 did not think such a thing. It only knew that it was in an unfamiliar place, one that felt threatening, though there were no visible threats, and it knew that it still hadn't gotten its hands on the creature that had seen its face. All along the walls between each door, there were clocks in the shape of that horrible cat, eyes ticking back and forth with each second, wide smile mocking SCP-096 as if to say, Try and find me. SCP-096 would not be discouraged. There was no room in its mind for that sort of thing. There was only the singular goal of finding the cartoon cat and tearing it limb from rubber hose limb. Psychological warfare would have no effect. Still, Cartoon Cat would give it his best shot. This was his world, and he could do whatever he wanted here. Cartoon Cat poked his head out through a random doorway, waving to 096 with one of his puffy white-gloved hands. As 096 wailed and began to give chase, Cartoon Cat slammed the door shut, only to open another door down the hall and poke his head out of that one. He did the same trick over and over, jerking SCP-096 around from end to end of the ever-expanding animated hallway. After some time passed, however, it appeared SCP-096 was not going to get tired and was not going to give up hope of catching its prey. It was time to end this. Cartoon Cat wrapped one long arm around SCP-096's neck, restraining it against the wall, and began to squeeze tighter and tighter. But nothing happened. SCP-096 did not collapse, did not react at all except to tear at the arm around its neck until it broke free. Then it returned to the relentless pursuit, tearing door frames apart, pulling up floorboards, punching through walls. Every time it dealt damage to the environment, the space filled itself back in, an unseen pen scribbling in the gaps in the floorboards, sealing up the holes in the walls. Two powerful beings going back and forth, locked in a seemingly equal-matched battle. Cartoon Cat tried to destroy SCP-096 in a myriad of ways. He tried to rip the beast apart, to snap its neck, to do any manner of unspeakable violent acts it had done before with great sadistic glee, but this pale abomination would not fold, would not break. This wasn't going to be any fun if there was no ending, and if 096 kept destroying one of Cartoon Cat's favorite pocket worlds, that was quite enough. Cartoon Cat grabbed hold of 096's arms and legs, the creature thrashing viciously as he did so, and threw it into the blank space just beyond the illustrated world. Back in the mall, SCP-096 crashed back to Earth. It was about to resume its search for Cartoon Cat when suddenly a bright light illuminated its face. A police officer stood a few feet away holding a flashlight. Excuse me, you can't be in here, you're trespassing. The officer started to warn, but his words were interrupted when 096 began to scream. Soon, he would be screaming too. If you ever take a trip across the pond to some of the more rural parts of the British Isles, you might just hear some tales of a dark, shadowy shame, a creature stalking through the night, an omen of death. It's an entity that has been known by many names, including the Grim or Black Shuck. Most folks will tell you the same, that this nightmare takes on the form of a huge black dog, but is also known to be able to change its shape. Often appearing at nighttime, the apparition is said to be demonic in nature, commonly associated with the devil himself. Believed by some to be a hellhound like Garmer and Cerberus, guardians of the underworld in Norse and Greek mythology. The dog is far larger than your average pet, with big, glowing eyes. It is also known to stalk crossroads, ancient pathways, and places where executions took place. Those who catch sight of Black Shuck are often befallen with bad luck, and for some it can even mean that death will soon be upon them. Of course, this is nothing more than a bit of local folklore, spooky tales designed to drum up tourism. But is the Black Shuck really just a legend, or is there something more to the tale? After all, it's not as if a dog like that could really exist, could it? Enter SCP-023, otherwise known as, yes, you guessed it, the Black Shuck. 
Much like the creatures from the stories, SCP-023 is an entity possessing a canine form, far larger than most domesticated dogs. SCP-023 is described as being shaggy in appearance, with black fur and glowing orange-red eyes, as well as prominent fangs. Through testing, the SCP Foundation has determined a number of the dog's anomalous abilities. First and foremost, legends have described the Black Shuck as an apparition or spirit, and much in the same vein, SCP-023 is able to pass right through solid matter. The creature can pass through walls seemingly at will, but does also seem to have a physical form, at least when it is kept in containment. To prevent a breach, the Foundation keeps SCP-023 in a walled-off intersection of two corridors, sporting fake doors at three of its four ends, with only one real entrance. Why does the dog's containment unit require such a specific layout? Simple, it has to resemble a crossroad, even if this is merely a superficial resemblance. Remember that the Black Shuck of Legend often appeared at crossroads, a sign that would warn those traveling of their impending doom. As long as SCP-023 remains contained in the cell resembling crossroads, it cannot pass through walls. Should the Black Shuck ever escape this enclosure, however, then it will use its anomalous abilities to incinerate anything in its path. The dog can burn through walls no matter how dense, and will travel from location to location by this method. Also in keeping with the shock of folklore, looking into the eyes of SCP-023 can hold potentially devastating outcomes. Should any person make direct eye contact with the dog, then death will be upon them. Within the span of the next full year, either the person who looked at the black shuck in the eye or a close member of their family will die, just like a number of the legends state. The Foundation has no concrete idea how the Shuck chooses its victims, with no patterns or obvious preferences, only that they will die a year after eye contact. Researchers aren't even sure if SCP-023 selects its victims from the moment eye contact is made, or if this choice is made during the year that follows, or even if it is a conscious choice at all. All that is known for certain is that if you were to look into the beast's glowing eyes, there would be no way for you to tell if you or a relative would suffer the consequences, only when. In the past, the SCP Foundation attempted to eliminate an individual that looked into SCP-023's eyes, along with their whole family before the year was up trying to take any potential victims away from the Black Shuck before they could be hunted down by the anomalous canine. Much like the way the creature passes through walls by incinerating solid matter, the way SCP-023 dispatches its chosen victims seem to almost be linked to the use of heat. The Foundation has conducted a number of autopsies on those killed by SCP-023, and their findings have always yielded the same result. Anyone killed by the Black Shuck will not exhibit any signs of external damage, no burn marks on their skin or any kind of contusions. However, on closer inspection, these bodies appear to have been filled in, their insides replaced with highly compacted ash. All their organs and internal bodily systems appear to be incinerated by the Black Shuck, but somehow this occurs so rapidly that there is no notable damage caused to the outside of their bodies. To prevent SCP-023 claiming any further victims, the Foundation has another measure in place. The Black Shuck has been fitted with two spheres made of hard rubber. These are inserted into the creature's sunken-in eye sockets, blocking anyone from accidentally making eye contact with it. However, over time, thanks to the heating effect of the Shuck's state, these inserts will begin to degrade. When security cameras detect that the glow of SCP-023's eyes have returned to a dangerous level, Foundation personnel will have to replace the rubber spheres to once again block the creature's vision. However, this can only be done after sunset, and any personnel tasked with replacing the inserts are cautioned not to look the dog in the eyes during the process, unless they want to become the Black Shuck's next victim. The SCP Foundation first came into contact with SCP-023 when they received information about an attack that had taken place at a church. While the location of this incident is unknown, if the legends are to be believed, the church may have been located in the moors of a rural region of the British Isles. While the church was in the middle of a service, the Black Shuck entered and killed a number of civilians in attendance. Presumably the members of this congregation had all at some point seen the large black dog out in the moors, or one of their relatives had. 
The Foundation stepped in and managed to capture the Black Shuck, giving amnestics to the survivors that had witnessed the attack. The damage done by SCP-023 and the deaths it caused were covered up as attempted arson. Mm. However, the Foundation's trouble with SCP-023 was far from over. After the Black Shuck's capture at the church, the dog was able to breach containment on multiple occasions. At first, it had been placed in a standard containment chamber, but it was quickly able to incinerate through the concrete walls of the cell. Foundation personnel later discovered that the dog had settled in in an intersection between two corridors and realized that it had resembled a crossroad. These exact corridors became the basis for SCP-023's new containment chamber, and the assistant researcher originally assigned to the dog was reprimanded for negligence. During this and other escape attempts, SCP-023 caused the deaths of a high number of Foundation personnel. As a direct result, researchers assigned to it requested that the Black Shuck be reclassified as a Keter-class anomaly. They also noted that SCP-023 shared certain traits with SCP-1111-1, one of the two entities that form SCP-1111. SCP-1111-1, also referred to as the White Dog, possesses an almost ghostly, translucent canine form and abilities that focus on geographic space. In the White Dog's case, it will attack anyone it detects approaching SCP-1111-2, the body of an unidentified man hanging from a noose. Researchers working for the Foundation believe that SCP-023 and SCP-1111-1 might be instances of the same phenomenon but have been unable to capture the White Dog in order to verify this. Given the number of deaths the Black Shuck had caused, research personnel attempted to reduce the danger that they faced when interacting with the dog. They helped to remove the beast's eyes and teeth, thus making it safer. However, it was during an attempt to do so that SCP-023 once again managed to breach containment. At first, everything seemed to be going according to plan. But when researchers removed SCP-023's eyes, the Black Shuck vanished completely from its containment area. SCP security staff scoured the area for it, eventually tracking the dog down to a long stretch of interstate. It is still unknown exactly how many civilians may have seen the Black Shuck as they drove past it, but so far nine deaths are thought to have stemmed from this incident. The ghostly dog was recaptured, and D-Class personnel removed its fangs. After analyzing the times of incidents, researchers realized that SCP-023 had only been able to escape while the sun was up, leading to new containment procedures mandating that no staff member was to interact with the Shuck until after sunset. The interstate fiasco led to the doctor assigned to watch over SCP-023 being suspended and facing a disciplinary review from his Foundation superiors. The blame for the breach and security that caused the incident was placed at his feet, and a new doctor was placed in charge of observing the Black Shuck. Unfortunately for this new researcher, the incidents involving SCP-023 did not stop there. The newly appointed doctor attempted to give the dog a pair of glass eyes to replace the ones that had been removed before the previous containment breach. Perhaps they thought it was a gesture of kindness, a compassionate act, or maybe they just thought it would look cool for a dog to have glass eyes. No matter the reason, it seemed they had forgotten for a moment that this huge shadow creature was an ancient evil entity and not a dog at all. When the doctor gave the new glass eyes to SCP-023, they immediately took on the exact same properties as its old ones. They began glowing, molten glass leaking from the dog's sockets, and appeared on all reflective surfaces throughout the site the Shuck was being held at. Everything from mirrors and windows, to lenses and glasses, computer monitors, anything and everything glass. The Foundation suffered an enormous number of deaths that day. Even staff sitting in the cafeteria would have seen a version of those orange glowing eyes staring at them from the bottom of their bowls, marking them for a fiery death. The facility was quickly evacuated, but the damage had already been done. Anyone that had seen a reflection of the Black Shuck's eyes would be dead within a year. Devastated, the new doctor in charge of overseeing SCP-023 blamed themselves for dooming their research team as well as the rest of the Foundation staff in the facility. When the sun came up over the horizon, a number of D-Class personnel were sent into SCP-023's enclosure, only to find that the dog had once again vanished. The only trace it had left behind was a puddle of molten glass burning part of the floor. 
A year later, any and all personnel that had gazed into the black shuck's eyes were dead, and their remains were buried in a mass, unmarked grave near the containment facility. Despite the doctor vowing to recapture and contain SCP-023, it remains unclear if they were ever actually successful. There is a chance that the Black Shuck has been gradually making its way back home to the moors of the British Isles. If so, we advise you not to travel after sundown unless you absolutely have to. And if you find yourself at a crossroad, then pray you don't catch sight of a hulking, demonic hound staring out at you with eyes that burn through the dark. If you do, well, we hope you enjoy your year. Who doesn't love their pets, right? Whether it's a dog, a cat, a goldfish, or a hamster, any pet owner will tell you that their furry friend is so much more than just an animal that they adopted. To many, pets become permanent additions to the family. While they might not look like a human being or even have the ability to speak the way we do, a lot of owners view their pets as people in their own right. Of course, a person can't be a pet. At least a human person can't, right? Well, not unless you happen to be a part of SCP-1897, otherwise known as the Human Domestication Society. If you've ever been brave enough to travel alone to the rural parts of southwestern states like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Utah, or Nevada, then it's likely you would have been an ideal victim for SCP-1897. This designation doesn't refer to one single creature or entity, but rather a group of similar beings. Witness testimonies and photographs of SCP-1897 depict them as humanoid creatures, standing approximately 5 meters in height. These beings have displayed a speed and strength far beyond that of any human. They are capable of traveling roughly 200 meters in only 9 seconds, and lifting weights of up to 500 kilos with a single hand. These entities are not immortal, and can be harmed by conventional means. But that doesn't mean it's an easy task. Any SCP-1897 instance that is killed or incapacitated immediately vanishes, resulting in them dropping anything that they may have been carrying at the time. And surprisingly, these are not mindless monsters, and actually appear to be capable of communication. Furthermore, they do not seem to speak a unique or distinct language, but instead communicate in standard American English with accents and vernacular appropriate to the regions they appear in. However, they will actively refuse to reply to any human that attempts to engage them in conversation. Now, these creatures don't spend every waking hour of the day roaming around the states of Texas, Oklahoma, and all the others we listed. If they did, it's likely a lot more civilians would have spotted them by now, and would probably live their lives in fear of these gigantic 5-meter-tall humanoids. But instances of SCP-1897 will only manifest if certain specific criteria are met, and these are as follows. To encounter SCP-1897, a person must be alone or part of a group of no more than two. If more than one person is with them, then no manifestation will occur. There is one exception to the rule, if a child under the age of 12 is present. Secondly, neither the person nor anyone with them can be carrying any kind of weapon. That means no knives, no guns, not even pepper spray. Third and finally, they must be at least 25 meters from a major population center. And what happens when all of these conditions are met and one of these creatures appears? Anyone witnessing their arrival will notice the creatures materializing, appearing to emerge from some form of unseen vehicle. When they manifest, the SCP-1897 entities are almost always carrying long poles with large nets at the end, as well as steel cages, and are often seen wearing dark green uniforms. In most cases, they will attempt to capture any nearby person in a way that causes them the least possible harm. Should an SCP-1897 creature successfully apprehend a person and place them in a cage, both them and their captive will vanish in a similar manner to the way the creature appeared. All attempts to track SCP-1897 or one of its abducted victims have failed. There is no way to know where they are taken. But as far as what happens to them, that we do have a little more insight to. Sometimes, although it is a highly rare occurrence, the captured human victims may reappear around a month after their capture. While never in the same location as where they disappeared from, 
They will always be accompanied by an SCP-1897 instance and will stay close by the creature's side. At this point, the abductee is barely human anymore. They are considered an instance of what is known as SCP-1897-1. What signifies this sudden and drastic transformation? For one, these victims are always found to have been forcibly castrated or sterilized, essentially no longer able to reproduce the way humans naturally do. For another, these instances of SCP-1897-1 universally display a decreased level of cognitive and mental function. What we mean is that their brains do not function the way they should anymore. Instead, these abductees exhibit the same level of intelligence and capability as the average Canis lupus familiaris, otherwise known as the common domestic dog. Should someone attempt to rescue a person that has become an instance of SCP-1897-1, or display hostility towards the SCP-1897 creature that accompanies them, they will be met with outward animalistic aggression from the victim. It has been discovered by the SCP Foundation that these behaviors can be treated with amnestics. Unfortunately, though, the process of an abducted person becoming an SCP-1897-1 instance seems to be the result of an invasive medical procedure known as a lobotomy. This typically involves removing or disabling certain parts of the human brain, meaning that what has been done to these victims is permanent and cannot be reversed. So who is doing all of this? Why are these creatures collecting innocent human beings only to reduce them to little more than animals? The answers lie in something currently referred to as SCP-1897-2, not another creature or entity, not an anomalous artifact or location with strange properties but a website found at the address www.hdsociety.gov. According to the information on this site, it belongs to a group calling themselves the Human Domestication Society. The website features pages such as adoption, training, breeding programs, volunteering, and more. The fact that this is the kind of website you might expect to be about dogs or cats but instead focuses on the domestication of humans is certainly enough to turn the stomach. As we said at the start of the video, surely a human being can't be somebody's pet, right? Wrong. At least as far as the Human Domestication Society goes. Their website contains everything and anything one of these SCP-1897 creatures could ever hope to learn about owning a human as a pet. Has your human been misbehaving? Need to train them to use the toilet? These pages have all the information you need to help your human become the most well-trained human on your block boast the training page of www.hdsociety.gov. The remainder of the page contains links to various articles such as obedience training, which claims an owner of a human can show them who's boss without the need for physical violence. Also featured are mentions of how to toilet train or play fetch with a human, how to introduce a human to others due to them naturally not getting along. Perhaps most chilling of all is one article titled understanding what your human wants, that warns human beings shouldn't talk, and another, dealing with strays, offers tips for anyone wanting to learn to capture their own pets themselves. It doesn't seem like too much of a leap to think that the SCP-1897 creatures have followed a lot of the advice from this particular article. Arguably worst of all is an image featured on the website of a tall, menacing SCP-1897 entity brandishing a Picana Electrica. This device, for any unfamiliar with the term, is a form of high-voltage electrical cattle prod, normally used for the purposes of torture. In the photograph in question, the creature is wielding one of these while standing sternly over a helpless captive human male, now an instance of SCP-1897-1 with tears in his eyes. Further pages found on www.hdsociety.gov recommend solutions to certain human behaviors. For example, like one might expect to find on other pet care websites, some of the Human Domestication Society's articles pertain to dealing with aggression, grooming, house training, and even toilet training. Then there's the adoption page, which states, We offer a large variety of humans for adoption every single day. While we cannot guarantee a human you see listed on our website will be available when you reach the shelter, 
Our inventory is updated every half hour. We cannot answer any questions about specific humans pictured on our website over the phone or email. It is still unclear whether or not the SCP-1897 creatures that have been known to appear in the southwestern United States are sent out to gather humans en masse to offer for adoption, or whether these creatures are individuals trying to obtain human pets on their own. Of course, the worst conceivable answer is both. The site is horrifyingly comprehensive, with links to an actual human ownership convention, with panels on breeding and preventing illegal human poaching and skinning. It's safe to say if that you were ever unlucky enough to read this website, it would haunt you for life. Naturally, the SCP Foundation has made several attempts to contact the owners of this website. They tried in vain to communicate through the official channels about SCP-1897-1 adoption, as a way of peacefully negotiating that the Human Domestication Society website be shut down, as well as its practices of capturing, lumbotomizing, breeding, and adopting humans. However, these communication attempts were met with silence. That is, until a message was received by the Foundation at Site-06, addressed to a member of personnel that does not exist. No data pertaining to the physical location of the sender could be derived from the email, but it was traced to the same IP address as the Human Domestication Society's website. The email read as follows. We will not listen to your lies any longer. It was you who came after us first. You who tore holes in our world and tried to annihilate us. You who took our olive branch of peace and fashioned it into a spear. You who nearly drove us to extinction. And now that we have the advantage, you attempt to patronize us with your crocodile tears. We will not be deceived again. But unlike you, we are not monsters. We have much anger towards your kind, but we are willing to forgive. But first, you must be willing to change. Slavery and genocide are immoral, and not even you deserve such a fate. It is our belief, then, that this alternative is a fair compromise between guaranteeing our safety and allowing your kind to live. This is our mercy to you. Look at the humans who have gone through our program. See how much happier they are? Your correspondence tells us that you have seen them. See how much they love us. Why, then, do you continue to be defiant? Someday you will thank us. Please try to understand that this is for your own good. For now, there is little that the SCP Foundation can do to prevent the Human Domestication Society from abducting human beings to sell as pets to other SCP-1897 creatures. Civilian access to the hdsociety.gov website has been restricted, so we recommend you stop typing into the search bar of your browser to go take a peek. Yes, we mean you. Seriously, stop that. As for the entities that have appeared in the rural areas of the southwestern states, all the Foundation can do is position its agents nearby, in the hopes that they can detain and neutralize the SCP-1897s as they appear, with lethal force if necessary. At present, the only procedure for any human pets that are successfully recaptured is to have them moved safely to containment until a way of rehabilitating them is found. So far, there hasn't been any luck on that front. So, here's a statement that won't blow anyone's mind. The SCP Foundation is really, really, really weird. And we're not even talking about the actual anomalies they contain. Sure, this top-secret organization puts in the time and the effort to make sure menaces to society, like the hard-to-destroy reptile, the Scarlet King, and even the horrifying bad joke tomatoes stay behind lock and key. But sometimes you need to hold the mirror up to yourself and see just what the heck is going on. I mean, seriously, think about it. This is an organization that uses live human beings farmed from death row as test subjects. Considering how rarely the death penalty is actually employed in the Western world these days, you know some shady strings are being pulled there. And what about the O5 Council, the leaders of humanity's last line of defense against anomalous chaos? And according to some accounts, they're a group of vain, petty, and morally bankrupt individuals who regularly use anomalies like SCP-006, the Fountain of Youth, for their own personal benefit. And don't even get me started on the actual scientists working under the Foundation's payroll. That's when things start getting even stranger. Of course, there's Dr. Jack Bright, a man forever changed by the chance interaction with SCP-963, an anomalous medallion, and one of Abel's deadly blades. Now, he's an immortal weirdo who's mm -hmm. equal parts brilliant and a total nuisance, so much so that there's an entire dedicated list forbidding all of his zanier antics. 
Then there's Dr. Alto Clef. Don't even try to shake his hand given how much this ex-GOC wildcard loves using violence to solve his problems. You may draw back a stump. He specializes in reality warping anomalies, often wields a ukulele cause he's just so darn quirky. Oh, and he's very likely the baby daddy to a teenage nature sprite after a dalliance with a goddess. Or, oh, and um, what about Dr. Charles Ogden Gears? Sure, he may not look that strange to the naked eye. He's a man so dull and humorous that gray is his favorite color, and he thinks sugar on cornflakes is an act of unacceptable decadence. But he's got a whole lot of strangeness under the hood. Like the fact he's such an emotionally unavailable father that his daughters across dimensions have formed a splinter cell of the serpent's hand, where they work under the collective pseudonym The Black Queen, just to spite him. Dr. Dan, through acts of sabotage, was personally responsible for the worst SCP-096 outbreak in Foundation history, leading to the end of thousands of lives, just so he could receive clearance to terminate the creature. And he got that clearance, on the condition that the SCP Foundation would be terminating him for his crimes as soon as the goal is achieved. And then there's... Oh my gosh! Did someone dress a dog up in scientist clothes? Oh my god, that's the cutest thing I've ever seen. Oh, this is just bright my day. Okay, maybe I was being too harsh on the Foundation before. Who, whose dog is this? Excuse me, sir, that is extremely inappropriate. Wait, you can talk? Of course I can talk, you dolt! I'm Professor Kane Pathos Crow, one of the SCP Foundation's finest minds in the field of advanced robotics and biochemistry. I have a level 4 clearance for 343's sake. I'm not some common bloody mutt. Oh, my apologies, Professor Crow. I wasn't aware you were a, <clears throat> well, a talking dog. Well, yes, I imagine there's a lot you don't know about me, isn't there? Um, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but, uh... That's true, Professor Crow. Our data on you and your work with the SCP Foundation is a little sparse. Here, take these files. These should give you a good primer. Okay, I suppose we better take this from the top then. Professor Kane Pathos Crow, among a lineup of extremely eccentric researchers, somehow manages to rise to the very top in terms of sheer strangeness. To get the most obvious fact out of the way, yes, while he was once a human, an anomalous experiment did result in him being turned into a Labrador Retriever. How did this happen, you may ask? We have the same question. Sadly, Professor Crow is incredibly reluctant to share any details about this strange and embarrassing incident, so we're just gonna have to accept it for what it is and move on. Everyone ready? Okay, good. Despite his strange appearance, Professor Crow is actually one of the more scientifically qualified of the Foundation researchers. It's no surprise that, because of this, he has a relatively close working relationship with Dr. Gears. So much so that he still refers to Gears by his early Foundation codename, Cog, a reference to both the legendary Stern Doctor's initials and a pun on his iconic surname. During one incident, Dr. Gears did tell Professor Crow to terminate an anomaly that was, for all intents and purposes, a human child, if it presented any difficulties. This sours the wholesomeness of that previous fact, so we'll swiftly move on. Once again, Dr. Gears is just terrible with kids. Like a lot of Foundation researchers, Professor Crow was personally headhunted by the SCP Foundation after his academic work in the fields of advanced robotics and biochemistry started turning heads. This was, just for clarity's sake, back before Professor Crow was turned into a Labrador. Professor Crow spends most of his time working in Bio Research Area 12, where he studies a variety of anomalies. But his bookish nature also earned him another interesting position. He's the SCP Foundation's chief librarian, where his encyclopedic knowledge of anomalous technical literature has made him a valuable asset in archiving and organization. Mm -hmm. This balances out some of Professor Crow's indiscretions. It is important to specify that Professor Crow is genuinely a well-liked figure among his SCP Foundation co-workers. After all, who wouldn't love to work with an adorable dog in a lab coat and glasses all day? But it's also important to note that he is also somewhat mistaken-prone, with a number of these mistakes putting him in the crosshairs of his superiors. Professor Crow has come close to outright termination several times, perhaps the most out of any prominent researcher currently working at the Foundation. However, to keep himself out of the same dead man walking category that the thoroughly unpleasant Dr. Dan currently finds himself in, Professor Crow has a few aces up his sleeve. Firstly, he's got friends in the administrative department willing to pull a few strings to keep him out of harm's way. Hey, maybe they're just very ardent dog lovers up there. The other thing that's kept him from being turned into an extremely overqualified chew toy for SCP-682 
is the contents of his brilliant brain. On many of the occasions where the O5 Council have considered terminating him, he's demonstrated the fact he possesses vital and often irreplaceable knowledge, saving his furry skin. A perfect example of the kinds of strange scrapes that Professor Crow gets himself into is the incident in 2009, where, without even realizing it, he somehow traveled through time and scared the living daylights out of everyone. The details are best expressed here, in Professor Crow's own dictated notes. 1802-2009 In all my years working here, there have been few things which have irritated me. Cause me physical harm, yes. Cause me undue stress, yes. Cause me innumerable amount of mental distress, yes. But few things have just irritated me. Time travel is one of them. I went to bed on the 15th of January, year 2009, at 1.30 a.m. I woke up on February 18th at 9.26 a.m. of the same year. I hadn't moved, I had only nine hours of sleep, and to me, nothing had happened. Then, after a slightly confused day amidst the many cries of, I thought you were dead, among other things I might add, I discovered that I have been missing for the past month and three days. In that time, Sophia had completely taken over my duties, though she had halted all of my personal experiments and was trying her utmost to relocate me, while keeping my disappearance from the higher-ups. Apparently, data expunged, leaving me to sleep in a small self-contained bubble of data expunged, and making at least data expunged, which was eventually ruptured by data expunged, and sending me back to this phase of space and time. Needless to say, I was slightly irritated, to say the least. 2402-2009. Bah. They've had me in quarantine for nearly the past week, observing me and running tests to see if they can find any sort of strange abnormalities with my physiology, my behavior, my anything. If I had one more hand shoved up my nether regions or I'm forced to look at one more bloody ink blot, I'm going to flip out and go rabid. They'll say they'll stop the quarantine soon, and Sophia says the higher-ups still haven't caught on to anything. I suppose I'm lucky in that count. Normally, the only time they quarantine something is when it's too dead to be any sort of immediate security hazard. Still, I guess I can see where they're coming from. If it were my decision, I'd probably force a quarantine too, and probably for longer. At least they had the decency to give me my clothes, my PDA, and someone to dictate to. 1203 2009 I'm still here, and I hate it. Day in, day out, it's the same thing. Get up, eat, exercise, then simple observation until lunch, then more observation until dinner, then lights out. I'm not allowed anything other than the things I already have, and even then, I only got those because Sophia felt bad for me. I'm only allowed to use them every day for an hour at most. Otherwise, they're also in observational storage. All of this wasted time that I could have been doing something constructive, something useful, something interesting, but no. I'm stuck here because of a wry twist of fate forcing me into this monotonous hell. They keep telling me I'll be let out soon. Liars. 0505-2009. They've seen fit to release me. I almost thought I was going to die in there. Still, it almost seems strange to be out and about again, but I do appreciate being back in my own quarters, my own clothes and my beloved walker back by my side. Sophia has taken good care of the facility while I was gone. I think I might actually leave that to her while I keep to my experiments. She seems to enjoy it a great deal. Suits her analytical mind. <sighs> All of my personal experiments are still waiting for me, with the exception of the 040 test logs. They simply haven't posted their findings yet, stating that they needed my approval first. So I'll have to pour through those the first chance I get. I'm interested in the progress she may have made. Still, there is a good deal of work to be done, and I am more than ready enough to take it on. After all, I have to make up for lost time, don't I? It's clear that life isn't easy for poor Professor Crow. Much like Dr. Bright, after experiencing the mysterious event that turned him into a dog, Professor Crow is both a researcher and an anomaly. And unlike the superficially subtle presentation of Dr. Bright's anomalous nature, it's hard to hide the strangeness of a talking dog in human clothes. This bizarre interstitial zone he occupies forces the Foundation to keep him on an extremely short leash. No pun intended. Seriously, Professor, it wasn't intended, I swear. Anyway, the point is Professor Crow isn't allowed to clock off at the end of the workday like his fellow researchers do. He's forced to remain on site, almost never appearing in public. If the professor wasn't the kind of person who could easily get lost in his work, a situation like this would probably drive him insane. Speaking of, you're probably wondering by this point, other than being the cutest researcher at the Foundation, sorry Dr. Clef, you're special in your own way, we promise. 
What kind of work is Professor Kane Pathos Crow actually known for around here? Professor Crow's most notable body of work is largely based on an opinion that's pretty controversial to hold around the SCP Foundation. He believes that they should be actively utilizing anomalies that aren't dangerous in order to further their collective goals. An excellent example of this is the cordial relationship he has with SCP-040, also known as Evolution's Child. She's a powerful reality warper who is able to synthesize new anomalous life from pre-existing living creatures. Professor Crow, who refers to her as Emma in his personal writings, was initially training her to do this with SCP-148 the infamous telekill alloy. However, he also filed a formal request to go further, saying, I think it's about time we started trying to utilize 040's abilities, or at the very least, allowing her to use them enough to actually learn how to control them. She will not be able to rely on the SCP-148 hairpieces forever. We theorize that as she gets older, her powers will increase exponentially, possibly to the point where her unconscious telepathy cannot be contained. He also somewhat infamously went ham with a series of experiments using SCP-158, a frightening anomalous device known as the Soul Extractor, which, contrary to its name, Professor Crow also realized could place removed souls into other objects or creatures. This led to the creation of a being that Crow dubbed Zero because it was Subject Zero in his experiments to create a composite soul using SCP-158. He spoke of this subject, somewhat creepily, in his notes. Zero would make an excellent candidate for my assistant. It respects and admires me for its creation much as a child would an endearing father figure. I have assured it that it would be treated well, and that I would give it a host to the best of my ability to create. All that it asks of me is that it be given a name other than Zero. A name not a number. I told it to give itself a name, to christen itself whatever it so wishes. It told me it would have to think about it. Like a lot of strange and fascinating figures, everything you learn about Professor Kane Pathos Crow seems to raise new questions. Is Crow just a mad scientist without a cause, eager to perform bizarre experiments for their own sake? Well, not quite. The sum total of all of Professor Crow's work is Project Olympia, a topic that probably deserves a whole video in its own right. And do sound off in the comments if you'd like to hear more about the deranged Frankenstein project that Professor Crow has devoted his life to. You see, Project Olympia is Crow's baby, and also his attempt to play God. Through combining a variety of different anomalies, including all the ones we've mentioned here, and several others, he would hope to create an entirely artificial living thing that would serve the interests of the SCP Foundation. How exactly this would be beneficial to the SCP Foundation is, admittedly, a little confusing, but seeing this goal through to its conclusion has become an all-consuming obsession for Professor Crow. He's performed countless experiments with a huge catalog of anomalies under the Project Olympia umbrella. He's written reams upon reams of notes and logs on the subject and produced a huge number of prototypes. He's also used Project Olympia as a pretense to remove even more souls using SCP-158, because that just appears to be a strange obsession of his, doesn't it? Incidentally, we aren't the only ones confused about the exact purpose and value of Project Olympia. When members of the O5 Council finally got a proper look at Professor Crow's work with the project, they released the following statement. All activity related to Project Olympia has been discontinued. Overwatch Command has deemed it to be a gross waste of resources and permanently removed support for the project, with personnel assigned to work with it being moved to alternative sites. A hearing is to be held, with the project administrators to determine how the project was able to continue as long as it did, despite the lack of any concrete results. Prototypes and other equipment have been slated to be decommissioned. Professor Crow took this news about as well as you could expect, but in the end, he always finds a way to wriggle out and continue doing whatever he wants to do. Because that's what Professor Kane Pathos Crow is all about. He's living proof that sometimes, he just can't keep a good dog down. In the aftermath of the disastrous Exxon Valdez oil spill of 1989, the SCP Foundation received a tip about some anomalous plant life surrounding the affected area. Plants there were beginning to mutate and change for seemingly no reason. With concerns about pollution on everyone's mind, it seemed possible that the plant life had been directly affected by the oil spill itself. After all, humanity's destructive impact on the Earth had already become noticeable even decades ago. However, when the Foundation showed up to investigate, they found something much stranger. All of the mutated plants had a common substance on them, in their pollen, seeds, roots, or the surrounding soil, 
and we're not talking about the millions of gallons of spilled crude oil. No one had ever seen this substance before, and all tests on it proved inconclusive. They collected samples of it and began extensive studies on what would become known as SCP-1100. Though SCP-1100 was initially classified as safe in the Foundation records, it would quickly reveal itself to be anything but. The first entry in SCP-1100's official file described it as a complex organic substance that causes anomalous transformations in natural plant life. It can be transmitted between plants by way of pollen and seeds. Within 72 hours, an infected plant becomes dangerous or hostile to human life. During testing, Foundation researchers exposed a variety of edible plants to SCP-1100, artificially pollinating the plants with samples of the compound. Tomatoes, apples, strawberries, carrots, and cabbage were among the plants tested. As the fruits and vegetables ripened, many visual differences became apparent right away. The skin of the tomatoes thickened and darkened into an off-putting leathery brown until it was incredibly difficult to bite through or even slice into with a knife. When the tomatoes were finally cut into pieces, the flesh was coarse and dry. The cabbage took on the appearance of rotten food, growing a fine layer of mold as the leaves became slick and oily. The strawberries sprouted incredibly sharp thorns where ordinary strawberries simply had seeds, becoming unsafe to eat. The carrots and apples were visibly unchanged, but had some unfortunate side effects when fed to D-Class personnel at the site. The carrots induced nearly instantaneous vomiting and dizziness, triggering a seizure in one particularly unfortunate subject. The apples, on the other hand, had developed hard, sharp structures near the core. Much like the classic urban legend of the razor blade hidden in the Halloween apple, personnel who sampled the fruit suffered lacerations to their gums, tongue, and roof of the mouth. Whether through disgusting appearance, tougher skin and thorns, or harmful side effects, all of the plants were rendered completely inedible. Initial containment procedures were not terribly strict. SCP-1100 was kept within the secure biohazardous material storage unit at Biocontainment Site 33. This seemed to adequately contain the substance, until one day, during a bit of routine scientific testing. A large amount of SCP-1100 was gathered for experimentation, when out of nowhere it vaporized, disappearing into the air. Not only did it contaminate the plant life specifically set aside for the experiment, but it traveled through the vents and infected all the plant life being grown at the site. Specifics of the incident have been redacted from the record, but 70% of the on-site personnel were killed in this containment breach. In the aftermath, the remainder of SCP-1100 was moved to Biocontainment Site-26. The object's class, formerly listed as SAFE, was upgraded to Euclid. After it was transferred to Site-26, experimentation with SCP-1100 resumed. After being exposed to the substance, this new round of plants transformed in a variety of ways within 48 hours, with increasingly disturbing results. A mango tree underwent a chemical transformation. The fruit, previously ripe and fragrant, became filled with highly corrosive acid. When touched, the transformed mangoes would burst, spraying this caustic liquid all over the person who touched them. Long vines of common ivy developed muscle-like internal structures. One poor D-Class made the mistake of putting his hand a bit too close to an infected ivy plant, only to have it wrap around his hand and crush the bone into powder before he could get away. A rose bush's thorns elongated, hardening and sharpening to the point comparable to a knife. Another rose bush excreted a toxic substance from its thorns that, when tested, was found to be similar to the type of neurotoxin found in the deadly cone snail. As these experiments continued at Site-26, Several of the researchers assigned to SCP-1100 noticed that it would become increasingly dangerous to contain, and that its effects were becoming stronger, more pronounced, and taking effect much more quickly. At this point, no source could be found for the substance, though a theory was posited by Dr. Smith that it was the creation of a radical environmentalist group, with access to resources and technology on the same level as the Foundation. A task force was put together to monitor environmentalist groups around the globe for possible hints about the creator of SCP-1100. During the course of the experiments at Site-26, SCP-1100 vaporized spontaneously again. It spread throughout the office in record time, wiping out 96% of the on-site personnel. At that point, in a desperate attempt to stop the infection from spreading to the other sites or even into the civilian world, a research assistant made the choice to detonate the on-site nuclear warhead. The infection was stopped, 
but all remaining surviving personnel were killed in the blast, and the surrounding area afflicted with irreparable damage. SCP-1100 was moved to a triple-redundant, hermetically sealed container, stored in a containment chamber at an unlisted Foundation site. The container is checked daily to ensure that it is still completely intact and able to hold the substance. If anything should happen to the container, SCP-1100 is to be immediately transferred to a new one. After the devastating loss of Site-26 and additional experimentation, SCP-1100's class was changed from Euclid to Keter. This allowed the Foundation to allocate additional resources to its containment, seeing as safe and Euclid containment procedures had both resulted in catastrophic loss of human life. And in both instances, they had been profoundly lucky that it hadn't been worse. After determining that exposure to SCP-1100 would make edible plants unfit for consumption and heighten the danger of otherwise normally innocuous plants, the Foundation became curious about the effects the substance might have on animal test subjects. A variety of species were selected for the animal trials, including deer, mice, cows, chickens, cats, and dogs. The deer and the mice, both ordinarily considered to be docile prey animals in the wild, were the first to be exposed to SCP-1100. Within 24 hours, they had become much stronger and more aggressive. One of the deer was able to break down the door of an observation room by ramming against it with its head. Once it had broken out of the room, it proceeded to charge and attack any person that it saw. The mice became prone to swarming researchers and biting them wherever they could. With jaw strength capable of biting through hazmat suits and even biting one person's finger clean off. Any attempts to subdue the animals were futile, the creatures somehow fighting off even the strongest sedative. The only way to prevent the infected deer and mice from continuing to attack was to terminate them. Next, the cows and chickens were exposed to SCP-1100. They did not display any behavioral changes once exposed, nor did they show any increased strength. The cows and chickens continued to behave normally, going about their days as if nothing had changed. They did not respond to the presence of humans with the exception of feeding times, during which they would approach only to eat their food. A selection of the livestock were slaughtered in order to perform an autopsy and look for anomalies in their bodies. Everything looked unchanged, until some of the meat was prepared for consumption and given to a selection of D-Class personnel. The beef taken from the infected cows was impossible to digest, causing a dramatic amount of gastric upset, cramping, and vomiting. Testing showed that, inexplicably, it had no identifiable nutritional value. The chicken, on the other hand, became highly toxic, showing lethal levels of cyanide and arsenic naturally present in its flesh when tested. Like with the fruits and vegetables, exposure to SCP-1100 made the cows and chickens impossible for human beings to eat. The cats and dogs were the last to be experimented on. No matter how docile and friendly the animals were at first, within 24 hours they had become vicious. At the sight of any human, they would attempt to attack. Like the deer and mice, they could not be subdued by any level of sedative, displaying shocking levels of strength and resilience for their size. One D-Class lost his arm, and another had his eyes clawed out before the subjects could be terminated. Whatever SCP-1100 was, it made everything it touched dangerous to humans. Even man's best friend could be convinced to turn on him in only a single day. As might have been expected, given the significant loss of life and the destruction of two different Foundation sites, Experimentation with SCP-1100 has been suspended until further notice. The substance went from affecting plants and animals within 72 hours to accomplishing it in 48, and then 24. It is becoming more efficient and more dangerous. If allowed to continue adapting, it could someday transform infected organisms in only a minute. If the substance ever escapes containment again, defoliants and desiccants are to be deployed within a 1 km radius of the infected area, and the area must be quarantined for 12 months. If the situation becomes dire enough, nuclear or chemical weapons may be deployed in order to distract the public and provide an acceptable explanation for the quarantine. How had things gone so horribly wrong so fast? Bits of surveillance video were recovered from the ruins of Site-26, providing a glimpse into what exactly happened before the entire site was destroyed. The footage pieced together is not entirely conclusive, but here's what we know for sure. A Foundation researcher referred to as Dr. V disarmed and shot the armed guard at the entrance to SCP-1100's containment facility. 
While he did this, another Foundation researcher known as Dr. M entered the containment and took the sample of SCP-1100 out. The footage cuts off for a while here, but it becomes clear when the video resumes that Dr. V and Dr. M dumped part of the sample into the site's water supply and vaporized the rest of it into the air. This is believed to be the cause of the mass contamination that occurred at the site, which was previously thought to have been accidental. Dr. V and Dr. M were later linked to an environmentalist organization on the Foundation's watch list. During the investigation of Dr. V and Dr. M, a diary was discovered from Dr. V's home. In it, he wrote about his personal theories regarding SCP-1100 and where it might have come from. While his colleagues proposed SCP-1100 was some sort of deliberately engineered bioweapon, Dr. V believed it to have a far more organic point of origin. He stated plainly, It's a planetary immune response. It's Gaia, Mother Earth, fighting back against us. The more we try to fight it, the worse it gets. She wants us all dead wants us gone because of what we've done to her, and there's nothing we can do to stop it." He concluded the entry with the assertion that the only thing humanity can do now is accept the punishment the Earth wishes to give us. This was his final entry before he and Dr. M triggered the destruction of Site-26. Were the doctors right? Should we just accept that the Earth is done with humanity and ready to drive us to extinction before we can do any further damage? The jury's still out on that. Perhaps we can turn back the clock mitigate the harm done to the natural world, and attempt to earn back its favor before it's too late. But if SCP-1100 ever makes its way out of containment and reaches the plants and animals of our world, turning them all against us one by one, we won't have much of a choice. The year was 2015. Lewis, Joseph, and Sydney were like a lot of kids their age, which is to say 11 years old. They secretly stay up past their bedtime watching scary videos on the internet when their moms and dads think they're sleeping. They go to school every day and daydream about all the fun things they're going to do when that school bell finally rings at the end of the day. And of course, they play a lot, and we mean a lot, of Minecraft. Whenever they're not at school, hanging out at the local park and filming goofy TikTok videos, or watching those aforementioned scary videos on the internet, there's a good chance that they'll be online together, logging a few extra hours building bases, digging big holes, or playing survival mode, and seeing how long they can last against the onslaught of mobs. But there's one particular pursuit they have while playing Minecraft together that takes up the majority of their playtime. One Quixotic quest that drives them forward, despite all the naysayers and doubters, tracking down and finding the legendary Minecraft creepypasta entity, Herobrine. For those who weren't around on the internet back then, creepypastas like Herobrine were all the rage. Like any video game, the new frontier of Minecraft with all of its procedurally generated landscapes felt like it held new mysteries, and mysteries are equal parts exciting and frightening. After all, who really knows what's going on behind a closed door? Herobrine was a Minecraft-specific little urban legend. Stories told of a default Minecraft skin with eerily white eyes manifesting in the game, even in solo matches, and terrorizing players. One internet sleuth who looked into the mystery of Herobrine claimed it to be the haunted soul of the dead brother of Minecraft's creator, Marcus Person, also known as Notch. In the years since the legend first started, Notch himself has come forward and disavowed the claim, saying that, in fact, he didn't even have a brother, and never had, so the rumors were completely baseless. But as we here at the SCP Foundation know, the truth has never gotten in the way of a good story. So Lewis, Joseph, and Sidney were happy to remain believers as long as they could keep having fun chasing alleged digital ghosts. How could any of these boys know that in the midst of their fun, they'd run into a real monster amidst Minecraft's blocky vistas? It was a school night like any other when they made that first fateful expedition. It was 7.15 p.m., and the boys were all in their shared server. Lewis had chicken tenders, Joseph had chicken nuggets, and Sidney, who'd eaten his dinner earlier than the others, was snacking on a pack of Skittles. They'd all outfitted their characters with full diamond armor, with diamond swords to match, because Joseph had somehow convinced the others that diamonds were ghost-proof. He read it on the internet, he claimed. 
Together, the three boys had made themselves an impressive Minecraft castle to be the base of their Herobrine hunting operations. A safe haven surrounded by high stone walls and mob-repelling torches to keep them safe if ever they got a little too spooked while playing. Though, playing was perhaps too mild a word for it. In the minds of these three boys, they were doing extremely important investigative work. After all, if they managed to actually find Herobrine themselves, they would be creepypasta legends. And wouldn't that be worth all the hours upon hours of rigorous mining and crafting? They'd been methodical in their search, scoping out different corners of the map and canvassing them together, searching high and low, and then marking said area off their checklist. It was a level of consideration and thought that their parents and teachers had long wished the boys would put into their home or schoolwork. But alas, seeing as none of the homework was find Herobrine, they really weren't that interested. Today, they were searching an area deep in the misty forests in the dead of night. They fought off a few spiders and sword-wielding skeletons, thankfully no creepers, aw oh, man, and kept foraging on into the darkness. It's so creepy out here, Lewis said over his headset. Why do we have to come out here at night? It's way more dangerous with all the mobs. The night is like the perfect time for ghosts, Sydney retorted. You think a ghost is gonna start hanging around in the middle of the day? No way, it's gotta be at night, man. And Lewis simply could not argue with such incredibly sound logic. They forged on, doing their typical methodical search for any phenomenon that one might generously be able to describe as supernatural. So you can only imagine the excitement coursing through them when Joseph discovered a strange, dark cave that looked as though it had no business being there. While each held their own private reservations, they all knew what they needed to do. Go inside and investigate. As they entered the cave, a few strange realizations occurred to them, such as the fact that there were seemingly no mobs down here. A cave in the dead of night? Surely there should be some enemies, right? Plus, the typical lighting implements, like torches and lanterns, didn't seem to offer the same kind of illumination that they normally would. It was almost like the darkness was more oppressive here, more tangible. There was undeniably something eerie about the whole setup. That much couldn't be denied. You guys see anything? Lewis asked. No, Joseph said, sounding oddly cautious, as though he sensed something strange was on the horizon, something that perhaps these boys shouldn't see. Yeah, I haven't seen anything either, Sydney chimed in. Maybe we should. Joseph screamed, and the two others turned their Minecraft avatars to look at him. Joseph's character had bumped into something, some stranger in the cave. An NPC design that looked oddly realistic for something inhabiting the purposefully lo-fi blocky world of Minecraft. It seemed to have a dark, furry body, with a canid skull-like face bearing a pair of milky white eyes that seemed to stare off into nothingness. Was this another mob? Maybe something added in the latest patch? If so, why wasn't it attacking? What is that thing? Lewis asked over his headset. I don't know, Joseph replied. It's so creepy, though. Suddenly, a message appeared on the screen, as though it had been typed and sent by another player, a player with the username Mal O. The message read, Hey, that isn't very nice. You shouldn't judge on appearances, kid. That certainly gave them pause. So many things about this didn't make sense. It had all the hallmarks of an NPC, but apparently it understood their voices and could send messages. It clearly wasn't actually another player in a conventional sense, but it didn't attack like your typical mob. None of the boys could really make sense of what they were dealing with here. Are you a hacker? Sydney asked. No, Mal O typed back. I'm just lonely and a long way from home. It's nice to have your company down here though. I don't get visitors often. Have you heard of Herobrine? Lewis asked. Mallow typed back. Is he a friend of yours? You should introduce him to me. I love making new friends. The three boys were, in some regards, rather mature and polite for their ages, and so remained civil with this bizarre, mysterious figure, who was curious and inquisitive, asking them questions about their school lives and their friends. It did seem earnestly happy for their company, so it didn't give any of them the sense that it was a threat. As night drew on and the boys' respective parents told them it was time to log off and get some shut-eye, Mallow finally typed, I've really enjoyed hanging out with you kids. Come back and visit me again tomorrow. If you don't, I'll come visit you instead. None of the kids picked up on the probably rather obvious Stranger Danger vibes of this message, and instead they went to bed, excited and curious. 
The next day, they met up on the playground for a kind of state of the union on the strange phenomenon they had encountered the night before. Do you think it has anything to do with Herobrine? Lewis asked. Forget Herobrine, Sydney replied, eliciting gasps from the two others. All the other people have Herobrine, we have something better, something only we've discovered. We've got Malo. Later that night, Joseph, who was probably the most studious of the group, tried to do a little background research on Malo. Everything seemed to turn up dead ends, aside from one slightly shady looking app called Malo version 1.0.0. Its description read, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Malo is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve wracking. But just after a few hours of Malo, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Malo will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy! Weird. So unless the thing they encountered on Minecraft was some kind of weird viral marketing campaign for the app, it was probably just a coincidence. Maybe it was a popular character from Japan or something. Either way, for the next several days, the boys honored their promise. They'd visit Mal-O in the cave every night and chat, trying to tactfully get more information out of it. Though the best they could get on the entity's origin was the cryptic statement, I'm not usually here, but everyone wants a vacation once in a while, don't they? We can't just spend our whole life on a phone. They'd become so acclimated to Mal-O over the days that they forgot what the entity had said to them the very first day they met. Come back and visit me again tomorrow. If you don't, I'll come visit you instead. But on the day that they didn't come and visit Mal-O, because Miss Grayson had sent a particularly challenging piece of English homework, they received a frightening reminder. That very night, they all started receiving strange texts on their phones. As you can probably expect, they were all photographs, each and every one depicting some regular haunt that the boys all liked to frequent, with one addition. Mal-O's grinning skull face hiding somewhere in the image, like some kind of demented parody of Where's Waldo. The strangeness of this new development left all the boys shaken, and they hopped back onto Minecraft as quickly as possible to go find and talk to Mal-O in its cave. However, this time the cave was empty, and Mal-O was nowhere to be seen. But the text still didn't stop. They'd come in so frequently, with Mallow getting closer to home, literally, in each one. The boys thought about telling their parents, but would their parents believe them? They'd probably lump Mallow in with the same tall tales of childhood imagination as Herobrine, and write it off as bored kids playing a prank, even though, in this case, it was anything but. More photos arrived. In these ones, Mallow was right outside each of the children's homes, lurking watching. In some of the photos, they could see themselves in the windows, going about their evening business, having no idea of the creature lurking just outside. None of the boys felt like playing Minecraft that night. It wasn't fun anymore. Instead, they shut themselves up in their rooms, closed and locked their windows, and pulled down the blinds, after checking under the beds with flashlights, of course. But still, more photos came in, all depicting Mal-O getting closer and closer and closer. Right about the time they were wondering whether the scratching on the outside of their bedroom door was real or just a figment of their imagination, another dark irony had occurred to them, all this time trying to find something supernatural, and in the very end, something supernatural had instead found them. Ah, technology. A double-edged sword of our own making that can provide both ultimate convenience and the threat of a grim future ruled by unfeeling machines. Well, maybe the stakes aren't that high. Yet. But our over-reliance on technology can have some terrible consequences. The number of traffic accidents continues to increase year by year, as our main mode of overland transportation also puts us in harm's way for longer and longer portions of our day. The internet can allow us to access any information we may desire, but it can spread misinformation twice as fast. And what about video games? An interactive artistic medium that can provide simulated experiences so vivid that many of us can eventually lose interest in our real lives. What starts off as a fun indulgence in our favorite hobby can quickly spiral into an obsession. The risks and rewards of virtual space are satisfyingly predictable compared to the chaos of modern living. 
and sometimes we just can't stop ourselves from striving for a few more easy wins. Minutes, hours, and even days can go by without any apparent activity on our side of the screen, and yet the world of the video game has changed drastically <laughs> due to our actions. But at a certain point, that initial rush of dopamine wears off, and you find that you need a much greater challenge in order to feel any sense of accomplishment. So you choose to pick up some harder video games, and you grind away until you can complete them just as easily. But that's not enough either. Surely there must be even tougher games out there. Games that will never go easy on you. Games that won't allow you to make even a single mistake. Games that make you proud of the frankly inexcusable amount of hours of your life that you've spent sitting in the dark, clutching a controller, squinting at your screen. You need a game that can do all of that and more. And because you've effectively given up your chances at ever being a social butterfly, you could also use something to help you mitigate the overwhelming loneliness that now constantly defines your everyday life. Well, worry no longer, you weary, downtrodden gamer you, because here at the SCP Foundation, we've cooked up a one-of-a-kind mod that is sure to redefine your gaming experience. If this doesn't turn out to be the game of the year, I don't know what could be. Among Us 2, maybe? The latest in a long line of Last of Us remakes? What about Half-Life 3? I digress. Introducing the Foundation's brand new killer app. The cutting-edge tactical heuristic algorithms of SCP-1633 combined with the 24-7 companionship of SCP-1471 Mal-O. I can tell by your expression that you're already eager for a playtest, but slow down, we need to catch all the normies out there up to speed. Let's start with the digital canine companion that is all the rage, SCP-1471. Or should I say Mal-O version 1.0.0, a Euclid-class SCP object which comes in the form of a free downloadable app for your smartphone. There has never been any reviews of this app for as long as it has existed, but honestly, are you really going to trust the words of a bunch of crooked reviewers when you could find out for yourself? Words to live by, don't trust anyone who isn't part of your precious gaming hobby. The description of Mal-O version 1.0.0 reads, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mal-O is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but just after a few hours of Mal-O, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mal-O will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. The app has never received an update, but that's because SCP-1471 has been a completely functional experience since its release. All one needs to do is download the app and within a matter of hours, Mal-O version 1.0.0 will begin to send the user photographs of familiar locations. These can include photographs of the user's work, home, or public places they often frequent, such as cafes and nightclubs. In the case of you, a complete shut-in gamer, these photographs would probably be limited to the interior of your favorite gaming room. When was the last time you cleaned up those pizza boxes? Regardless of where the images were apparently taken, each one will contain a canine humanoid with a skull for a face. Say hello to your new best friend, Mal-O, or SCP-1471-A, if we're using the approved designation. Mal-O's app will continue to send you photographs for as long as you have it installed. And because there is no way to uninstall it, no matter how hard you try, you'll be getting intimately close to home selfies for the rest of your days. Doesn't it feel so good to have such a loyal friend as Mello? Of course, there's only so much you can gain from photographs alone. You're a gamer, dammit, and what you want is interactivity. But don't worry about that part. We've got you more than covered with SCP-1633 which may, in fact, be the most challenging video game ever programmed by mortal hands. How it even gives many games programmed by anomalous hands a run for their money. 
While it was never released to the market and doesn't even have a working title, the steampunk adventure that awaits you within SCP-1633 is bolstered by highly sophisticated tactical heuristic algorithms. In this third-person squad-based action RPG, you can switch between four playable characters. The Marksman, who specializes in long-range weaponry. The Alchemist, with potions and chemicals to control the battlefield. The Rogue, a stealth-oriented character who catches enemies unaware and assassinates them. And, of course, the Thug, a tough-as-nails melee combatant with increased health and durability. It doesn't really matter who you choose, because most playthroughs of SCP-1633 always end the same way. That being said, your hand-eye coordination and reflexes are second to none, and they also are quite possibly your best qualities. Let's set you up with the Marksman as your main character, since all those shooters you've played will definitely help your aim. And trust me, you're going to need it. The story mode of SCP-1633 will put you up against a slew of Victorian-era rascals and miscreants, all of which are pulled straight from the Penny Dreadfuls. There's even some classic fantasy races mixed in from the works from good old Professor Tolkien himself. Dwarves, elves, goblins, the works. It's a little generic, but why worry about the story when the gameplay is what will really get you hooked? There's a final boss at the end of the game known as the Krathnar, trying to destroy the entire world. You need to stop it. You know, the usual RPG storyline. You've stopped dozens of ancient entities, demon lords, corrupt godlings, and unspeakable calamities in your time. This Krathnar will be one more for the record books. Par for the course. Are you ready, Player One? You'll be dropped straight into the Marksman's shoes, fighting for her and your life against Krathnar's hordes of henchmen. But you won't be doing it alone. After all, you've got the rest of your squad and a mysterious companion whose true intentions will reveal themselves in due time. We did say we modded the game after all. So let's play. Your first two hours won't be anything to write home about, not that you ever leave home these days. The AI of SCP-1633 will seem to be barely functioning, a buggy mess where enemies only charge in a straight line towards your character. Your marksmen will be easily able to take them down in a hailstorm of projectiles. At three hours in, things start getting a bit more interesting. As the tactical heuristic algorithms kick in, the enemies that hold long-range weapons will shoot at you from a distance, while the close-range ones will move toward you in a serpentine pattern before attacking in melee. This is more like it. Not the most challenging, but the game is clearly increasing in difficulty. You also think you see a dark figure with a skull for a face lurking around corners and following your squad. But with all the glitches, it's hard to tell if this is an intentional part of the game or not. At five hours, enemies that showed limited signs of strategy are now using cover effectively and will attack with alchemical splash weapons such as grenades to deal damage to your ranged characters and lure your squad into melee range. They still aren't that much of a challenge, but the fact that they now exhibit a clear self-preservation instinct means that they are fighting to win. This is also when your help officially arrives. You're in the middle of a shootout when you see an enemy about to throw another one of those frustrating splash weapons. You duck behind your cover and prepare to take a hit when suddenly the grenade is snatched out of the enemy's hand and tossed in the opposite direction to explode harmlessly. This is the work of SCP-1471-A, who has now arrived in the game world as an NPC ally. For the next several hours of gameplay, Mal-O continues to provide interference by preventing any splash weapons from being thrown. It'll sneak up on enemies and take their weapons, disrupt their cover by pushing movable boxes and trash cans out of the way, and even catch the splash weapons in her mouth like a dog would catch frisbees before chucking them away. While it never directly deals damage to the enemies, its mischievous antics are very efficient at protecting you from harm. As luck would have it, the enemies can't seem to interact with Mal-O, and are baffled as this invisible force continues to throw off their strategies. Mal-O will use this to its advantage, as well as yours, by appearing at enemy ambush points and using sign language to communicate warnings to you as the player. Having Mal-O around starts to feel a little bit like cheating, 
but keep in mind the game is starting to adapt to your skill level and will soon begin to employ advanced strategies to mess with you. All the Mal-O mod does is even the playing field. Krathnar is still running rampant in the world of SCP-1633, and it's going to take your entire squad of steampunk heroes and a lonely man's best friend, Mal-O, to stop this big bad evil guy. The final boss will possess the highest level of intelligence that the algorithms are capable of, and it'll make that known to you the second you step into the arena. For the majority of your gameplay, the enemies have focused on countering the marksmen, since you've relied on that character's ranged weapon style. But they've come to realize that, that you're too much of a pro MLG gigachad to ever lose a fair encounter. So Klathnar does the unthinkable, and targets the alchemist, rogue, and thug first. It throws all of its most powerful attacks at the members of your squad you aren't controlling forcing you to waste resources in order to keep them alive or switch to them in order to dodge fatal blows. Whenever you aren't in command of the marksman, Karathnar will strike the character with a strong melee attack that forces you to take control back. Mal-O is still unable or unwilling to deal damage to the boss, so it very much seems like you are on your own. Your squad is in shambles, your focus is starting to wane. After all that you've been thrown in this gaming challenge, it might be the final boss that makes you throw in the towel. Then, a dialogue box appears. It's from Mal-O. Don't give up hope, user. I've had so much fun playing with you, and I know that you have what it takes. You never needed a friend before me, and you can win against Krathnar just like you've won against every other final boss you've ever faced. You've got this, buddy. Your best friend, Mal-O. It felt overly sentimental, but something about this message fills you with the determination to keep going. You call upon all your gaming knowledge, all of your skill, all of your passion, and with pinpoint precision, you guide your squad to defeat Krathnar in record-breaking time. You sit back in your gaming chair, exhilarated and finally satisfied. This truly was the ultimate gaming experience, and all you needed was a little help from your friend. Bev had always loved going to the mall. When she was a child, it meant spending quality time with her mother, taking in the bustling sights of the stores, the enticing smells of the food court. When she was on her best behavior, she might be rewarded with a new toy, a soft pretzel, or a fistful of quarters to spend at the arcade. When she was a little bit older, first coming into her independent teenage spirit, the mall was a place of refuge of freedom, somewhere she could spend time with her friends away from her family's prying eyes, trying on outfits she'd never be allowed to wear to school, filling up on free samples, and imagining what it might feel like to be grown up. But as Bev had gotten older, left behind childish things, the mall had started to die. She knew it wasn't her fault, but it was sad to watch the source of so many simple joys wither away bit by bit. Stores closed one by one, driven out of business by the convenience of online shopping. Slowly but surely, the thriving center of her suburban youth hollowed out, turned into a graveyard of commerce left behind in the endless march towards the future. The colorful signs and advertisements for coming attractions remained, but there were no customers. The phantom smell of uneaten Cinnabon lingered in the air. The lights were on, but no one was home. And then, the lights went out too. The city didn't want to deal with the abandoned mall's upkeep, but they didn't want to go to the trouble of tearing it down either, so they just left it there. There was a running joke in town that the last security guard to lock up the place had left the doors wide open and just let nature get inside and start taking its course. The mall belonged to the wild plants and animals again, a strange artificial enclosure where raccoons could scavenge and deer could hide from hunters and their rifles. Then, of course, the small town had done what small towns do best. It fired up the rumor mill. Worried parents passed around email forwards warning about dangerous drifters hiding out in the empty mall, or gangs conducting violent initiations there. Teenagers dared each other to go inside before chickening out and going home, riling each other up with promises of ghosts or evil store mannequins ready to attack. Children at recess or on scout camping trips gave each other nightmares, with stories of giant monsters hiding in the old building, waiting for lost kids to wander inside so they could gobble them up. Bev knew none of that was true. It couldn't be. 
but she still couldn't shake the curiosity she felt about the mall that the town had left behind. What did it look like now? What had the elements, the time, the influence of intruders, both curious and destructive, done to the place? She had never planned to get into urban exploring, but then again, she hadn't planned to move back to her hometown after flunking out of law school either. It was strange, being back in such a familiar place that now looks so different. She could try to adjust, could let her life fade into a grey routine of diner breakfasts and drinks at the one bar in town and endless cups of coffee, or she could find a way to lean into the inherent strangeness of being back home. When she bumped into Daniel, her best friend from high school, and he told her all about his new, slightly illegal hobby, she knew she had found the answer. He had a crew of fellow urban explorers, a term they preferred to use instead of trespassers, a mix of friends from high school and other exploring enthusiasts he had met online. Bev was casually interested, but not entirely sure if the dangerous hobby was for her, until Daniel mentioned the mall. Like Bev, he had continued thinking about it long after its official closing. He wanted to go inside, to see what had happened to it over the years, and to see if there was a crumb of truth to any of the rumors about what lurked inside. Bev didn't take that part seriously, but her fascination with the old mall was enough to convince her to join the crew on their expedition inside. Daniel provided her with a list of rules. Turn off your cellular data once you get there so the police can't prove you were trespassing. Bring water, bring a flashlight, and wear all black. The group agreed to meet about a mile away from the old mall, where they would park their cars, discuss their plans, and head inside. Bev felt a bit silly, lying to her parents about where she was going at her age, but she didn't want them to worry about her. She told them she was going to meet up with some friends at a dance club just out of town. They didn't bother to ask what kind of club she would wear a black sweater, black pants, boots, and a black knit hat to. She was happy to leave without any more scrutiny. As she drove out towards the abandoned mall, she gripped the steering wheel with sweaty, nervous hands. What was she thinking? What if something went wrong while they were in there? The old building could be full of exposed wiring and loose beams just waiting to fall down and crush someone. There could be a nest of rabid animals ready to defend their territory. She tried to shake off the sense of foreboding. Daniel and his crew had done this sort of thing dozens of times before. Everything would be fine. By the time she pulled up to the meeting spot and parked her car, Bev had managed to calm herself down. This would be a fun, weird night of poking around the ruins of her childhood, the remains of a long-gone piece of suburban Americana, and that was all. Nothing bad would happen. She introduced herself to the rest of the group, a pair of brothers named Mark and Lewis that she recognized from high school, and a young woman named Rachel, who didn't look a day over 20. She must have been one of Daniel's internet buddies. Is this everybody? Bev asked. Daniel nodded. This is the crew for tonight. Ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Bev shrugged and laughed. Everyone else nodded in agreement, holding up their various flashlights, excited to get into the mall and explore. The place was every bit as fascinating as Bev had hoped it would be. A mixture of almost untouched storefronts, clothes rotting off their internal plastic mannequins beneath plastic signs advertising going out of business sales and the wild world encroaching on what had once been a piece of suburban retail paradise. Spiderwebs hung along the walls, possums and rats skittered along the floors, vines crept along the remains of the fountain at the center of the food court that had long ago run dry. Bev screamed in shock as something ran across her foot, but when she cast her flashlight beam at it, she found that it was just a small raccoon running from the sudden intrusion on its home. Sorry, I'll keep my cool next time, she laughed it off. Eh, it's fine, it happens to me too, Daniel reassured her. You never quite get used to roaming around these places in the dark, but look, there's a lot of cool stuff to check out. He used his flashlight to illuminate the food court, specifically the soft pretzel stand. On top of the stand, leaning precariously to one side, was the enormous model of a soft pretzel that had once attracted hungry shoppers looking for a snack. Hungry? He quipped. Bev couldn't help herself. She pulled out her phone and snapped a picture. It was creepy, it was a little sad, but it mostly was a reminder of the simple joys of childhood. When the flash went off, it illuminated the darkness behind the stand, and she caught the glow reflecting in the eyes of the animals hiding back there. It unsettled her at first, but she reminded herself this place was theirs now. She and Daniel and everyone else, they were just visiting for the night. She checked her phone to see how the picture came out and frowned. Hey Daniel, look at this. 
She held out her phone to show him, and his eyes widened. What is that? Can you zoom in? Bev zoomed in on the picture, and the two took a closer look. There in the background of the picture, just barely illuminated by the phone's flash, was a large silhouette. They couldn't make out any defining features other than a large round head and long, thin, noodle-like arms. Did this place used to have a mascot or something? Daniel asked. Bev shook her head. Not that I remember. Huh, Daniel sighed. Weird. Anyway, where'd the others go? He looked around for their flashlights or any other sign of life. Guys? Did you get lost? His voice echoed through the wide, empty space, but no one responded. Hello? Bev called out, a chill running down her spine. Only minutes ago, she had heard the others laughing and joking around as they explored the other end of the mall. But now, she couldn't hear a thing. Even the chittering of the rats had gone quiet. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream rang out and sent Bev's heart leaping into her throat. She and Daniel shared a look of deep concern as they both silently wondered if their worst fears had come to pass. Had someone fallen? Had there been an accident? She and Daniel followed the sound, looking for the source. Are you guys okay? Daniel shouted. The lack of response spoke volumes. Whatever had happened, the rest of the group was in big trouble. Bev quietly kicked herself for neglecting to bring a first aid kit. Finally, the two reached the other end of the mall, where the scream had sounded like it was coming from. But there was no one there, only a dark, wet smear along the ground. It looked incredibly fresh, and it smelled metallic, violent. Bev didn't have to look more closely to tell that it was blood. Whatever had happened to the other three, she wasn't sure they were going to find them alive. Daniel reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a small pocket knife. It's not much, but just in case. He held it out in front of them as they walked, following the trail of blood. Something crashed to the ground behind them, and Bev whirled around to see a large steel beam only feet away. Any closer and they would have been crushed. Her eyes started around, searching for any more potential danger. And then, she saw it. Up in the rafters, by the ceiling, was a strange figure. It was unlike anything she had ever seen. It was tall, impossibly tall, and pitch black. Its head was bulbous, with a pair of feline ears on top. She could make out a nose, a pair of wide white eyes with big dark pupils, and it was smiling. A broad, wicked smile filled with jagged blood-stained teeth. Its hand looked like enormous white gloves. It was almost like she felt ridiculous thinking this, even as terror prickled at the back of her neck. But it looked like an old cartoon, the sort of thing her grandmother used to watch. Except those always looked friendly, even if they were a little unsettling. This thing, it looked evil. At first she thought it was some sort of twisted graffiti, or a statue left by a macabre experimental artist. But then, it moved. The creature tilted its head to the side, its smile broadening and its pupils dilated. It was looking right at her, and it was excited. Daniel? Bev whispered weakly. I see it too, he replied, his voice shaking. We need to go. We need to go now. Bev couldn't be sure what this thing would do if it caught them, but she didn't want to wait around to find out. She grabbed Daniel's arm and yanked him toward the exit. It took him a moment to start moving again, paralyzed by fear and confusion at the incomprehensible sight of the entity on the ceiling. But once he started running, it seemed like he would never stop. The two raced toward the exit, arms and legs pumping as fast as they could. Behind them, they could hear the creature chasing after them, but they didn't dare look back to see. Just before they passed the threshold out of the mall, Bev felt Daniel's hand slip out of hers. She spun around, searching for him, and watched in helpless terror as the long, long arms of the creature looped around his chest, pulling him back away from her and lifting him up in the air. It opened its massive mouth wide, wider, wider, then swallowed him whole. Bev screamed, but she forced herself to keep running, to save herself from the same fate. She could feel the entity's eyes on her back as she ran out the door, but once she escaped, she knew it would not chase her any further. For some reason, it was letting her go. She couldn't imagine if it was out of some kind of mercy, but she was grateful to escape with her life just the same. Bev stumbled into the local police station in a disheveled mess, face streaked with tears, and told the officer on duty what she had seen. He didn't believe her at first, asking her to repeat her story again and again. Every time she insisted that she knew what she encountered out there, or at least, she knew that she couldn't explain it. The officer sat her in an interrogation room alone with a cup of coffee, and asked her to wait until someone more qualified to help her arrived. She wondered if they were going to try and have her committed, if they had assumed she had lost her mind. But when a man in a white lab coat opened the door and greeted her, 
He said he believed her. He wasn't from a hospital or affiliated with the police. He was from a special organization, a foundation dedicated to investigating the unexplained. He was going to look into what happened at the mall. All he asked was that she tell him, in her own words, what she had seen. I don't know, she sighed. It looked like some kind of messed up cartoon cat. With a first-hand account of Bev and a series of confirmed disappearances that could all be traced to the abandoned mall, the SCP Foundation opened an official investigation. Wanting to eliminate as many potential complications as possible, the Foundation selected only one researcher actually entered the abandoned building, an operative with a great deal of fieldwork experience named Dr. Boggan. Though Dr. Boggan would enter the building alone, he would not be without support. He would be fitted with a microphone and camera, and his progress would be monitored remotely by a supervisor at a nearby Foundation site. If the need for backup arose, they would then be able to deploy additional security officers to enter the mall and extract Dr. Boggan if at all possible. He would also be armed with a standard pistol as well as a Foundation-issued flamethrower. With the team selected and the appropriate safety measures taken, it was time for Dr. Boggan to enter the mall and see just what he could learn about the entity dwelling inside. If at all possible, he was to neutralize it and bring it into containment alive so that it could be studied closely in a clinical environment. If live capture was impossible, he was instructed to terminate the being and bring its body in for a thorough autopsy. With his weapon already drawn and ready, and his eyes sharp and alert, Dr. Boggan walked into the empty mall. He saw a lot of what Bev and her friends had seen. The old pretzel stand, the dried up fountain, the creepy but harmless rows of faceless mannequins still locked in the same poses they had held for a decade. The spider webs made him a little nervous, but that was garden variety arachnophobia more than any real sense of danger. I don't know about this one, honestly. He spoke into his microphone to his supervisor on the other end. So far, it seems like this place is your standard abandoned building death trap. Maybe our missing persons just weren't careful or properly trained to deal with navigating a place like this. Just keep looking, his supervisor ordered. Look for anything anomalous. Got it, Dr. Boggan nodded. He stepped on something with a loud crunch. He looked down to see the oldest, stalest soft pretzel he had ever seen. Anyone hungry? He quipped, turning his camera towards the unappetizing sight. Don't worry, I'll keep looking. He carried on walking, heading past a shoe store, a music store, some kind of novelty porcelain figurine store. He stopped at the toy store when something eerie caught his eye. You guys seeing this? He asked. What is it, Boggan? His supervisor replied. Just this creepy stuffed animal thing, the cat right over there. I don't like how its eyes follow me when I walk by. I don't see a cat. Sure enough, when Dr. Boggan did a double take, the strange cat-like toy was nowhere to be seen. Well, there's your first anomalous activity, he joked, though his heart was beginning to pound nervously in his chest. Keep looking. He nodded and continued his patrol of the area. He couldn't get the face of that thing that wasn't a toy out of his head. Its eyes, like the old Felix the Cat clock his grandparents had in their guest room, that thing had scared the hell out of him as a kid. He could never sleep in the room with it. All he could think about were its eyes going back and forth, back and forth. He stopped in his tracks. He thought he could hear the sound of a ticking clock clear as day just behind him. He turned to look, but there was no clock. Nothing but darkness and emptiness, the same as everywhere else. He felt something suddenly tugging at his foot. He looked, expecting to see an animal pulling at his shoelace, something ordinary. But instead, he saw long, pointed fingers curling around his ankle. He couldn't see what the fingers belonged to, couldn't see a body, but could only see a long, looping snake of a shadowy arm curling around the corner up ahead. Before he could tell his supervisor what was happening, the hand had grabbed hold of him, and was dragging him across the ground. The hand lifted him off the floor, then dropped him back down. He felt the lens of his camera break. Are you okay? We lost visuals. No! No, I'm not! He shouted as he looked up into the face of pure evil. Its pupils were dark and endless, its eyes bloodshot, its teeth bared. Do not send backup! I repeat, do not send backup! Oh god! Oh god! The audio cut to static, and the signal was lost. Dr. Boggan's body was never found. The entity referred to as Cartoon Cat was given the object class Keter, regarded as highly dangerous and nearly impossible to contain due to its reality-bending nature. Because it cannot be physically contained, the Foundation's solution to minimize Cartoon Cat's damage was to block off access to the abandoned mall. All civilians were warned of a deadly amount of radiation in the area. 
in order to deter them from conducting any more urban exploration, vandalism, or other visits to the location. Any of the few survivors that have encountered Cartoon Cat are given amnestics, and their experiences are written off as substance-related or vivid nightmares. The empty mall may not be the only place Cartoon Cat has made its own, nor is it likely to be the only building of its kind that houses an anomalous monster. After all, when humanity decides to vacate a place, to leave it standing vacant and abandoned, you never know what might decide to move in. It has been often said that dog is man's best friend, and obviously that isn't just exclusive to men. Ask any pet owner, whether they own a dog, cat, rabbit, hamster, or soul-sucking interdimensional parasitic monster with too many tentacles, and they'll all tell you the same. Your pet can be your best friend. They can give you the most unconditional, affectionate form of love possible. And as long as you treat your little buddy right, they'll be loyal to you for the rest of your life and theirs. It's not uncommon for a pet to outlive their owner, especially if they belong to someone who's elderly. And that might be a sad thing to think about for some. Although it is important to remember the positives, like how much happiness and companionship that animal would have brought an aging owner in their last years of life. Even someone younger who dies unexpectedly might have had their quality of life infinitely improved by owning a loving pet to make them smile. But on the other hand, there's the negative downside that now some pets have to live on after a tragic death not fully understanding where their beloved owner went. So often we hear stories of dogs that waited for their master to come home, only for them to never walk through the front door again. And it's equally hard when things pan out the opposite way, and an owner loses their pet. The one silver lining is that we as human beings have a far greater understanding of death and the grief it causes. We know that eventually, despite how hard it can be to adjust to that initial heartbreaking loss, it is possible to move on, and for things to one day get better. But what happens when someone can't accept the death of their beloved animal companion? When the unconditional love of their pet is suddenly missing from their life, how far will a person go to recapture that feeling? How long does it take for grief born out of love to become an unhealthy fixation? And what is the true price of obsession? Well, the answer involves SCP-589 both what it can give and just as easily take away. For as long as she could remember, and even further back than that, Erin and her dog Poncho had been inseparable. Ever since her mom had first adopted that scrappy little Jack Russell Terrier, Erin had fallen head over heels in love with that little rascal. Loving a pet is different from loving another person because they just can't help showing how much they love you back. Humans, for all their good qualities, are so nuanced, and not everyone is honest with each other all of the time. But a pet, especially a dog, even though they can't speak, a bark or a whimper or excited wagging of a tail can easily tell you how they're feeling. And Poncho was no exception. Erin and her mom Cleo lived alone. It was just the two of them for quite a long time. And while Cleo had little problem with that, she couldn't help but notice how isolating it was for her daughter. From a young age, Erin had always been quiet, kept to herself at school. Her mom kept expecting her to make some friends, asked to invite them over or vice versa, but it didn't seem to be happening. It didn't seem to be bothering her daughter, but Cleo was worried that it was giving her the wrong idea, that being on her own was somehow better. So, in an effort to give Erin at least one source of companionship, Poncho joined the family. Brown patches dotted over his white fur. He was the perfect pet, an excitable and loving little puppy that Aaron was immediately smitten with. When Cleo told her he was hers to keep, being only seven years old, Aaron broke down crying with tears of joy. Her mom had let her pick out a name for him, and she'd quickly settled on Poncho. At first, Aaron had meant to say it differently, in order to name the pup after a friendly character from her favorite animated movie but had mispronounced it in her excitement at meeting the energetic dog for the first time. The name quickly stuck, though, and as the years went on and Poncho got bigger, Aaron bought her four-legged best friend a little poncho of his own to wear when it started raining. Over the following years, Poncho became Aaron's most constant and loving companion. Even as she grew up, moving through her childhood, and found making friends a little easier with every passing year, there never came a time when she didn't need her best friend. 
When Erin had her first breakup in high school and came home with floods of tears in her eyes, Poncho could sense she was upset and came wandering up to her, sitting in her lap to make her feel just a little bit better. Then a few years later, when her mom got sick, Erin had to take care of her, a task that would have been much harder without Poncho there to alleviate that stress and lift her and Cleo's spirits. And when Cleo eventually passed, the little white and brown dog sat quietly with his owner as she said goodbye to her mom. Now that it was just the two of them, Aaron and Poncho were living in a tiny apartment. It was cramped for one person and a dog, but Aaron was just grateful to have a place to live in the company of her favorite pup. Besides, Poncho wasn't a puppy anymore. In fact, he hadn't raced around the park or chased a ball for quite a long time. With the numerous stresses of her everyday life, least of all holding down two jobs and her desperate attempts to make enough money to pay rent, Aaron had hardly noticed the signs. Poncho was showing his age. It had been happening gradually in the background over the years. He wouldn't chase the ball or really move around much, and when he did, it was little more than a lethargic plod around the apartment. Perhaps it was because of such a measured, slower-paced change that Aaron was unable to acknowledge it. She could see her old friend was getting more tired, sleeping longer, his tail rarely wagging as much as it used to, but by now that felt like Poncho's normal behavior. Then again, given how important her dog was to her, it's just as likely she didn't want to accept the truth that unfortunately, nothing lasts forever. He was almost 15 in human years, which by all accounts is an impressive age for a dog, especially one of Poncho's size and breed. It was on a day that Erin was out working her morning job when it happened. The faithful, adoring Jack Russell Terrier, who had spent his years being nothing but loved and giving back only more love in return, curled up on Aaron's bed. The apartment was still, silent, not a sound to be heard, save for those last, tired few breaths. Laying there, maybe the dog wondered if he'd ever get to see his friend again, if she would make it back from work in time. He closed his little brown eyes and peacefully drifted off for one last sleep. During the break between her shifts, after the end of the one at her first job and before starting her second, Erin had just enough time to get home. Usually, she had just had enough time to eat and get herself ready for the changeover, then quickly check on Poncho before having to dash back out. Poking her head into the bedroom, she saw her dog laying right there on her bed. There was a stillness to him that instantly made her stomach drop. His ears didn't move when she called his name. He didn't react when she stroked his fur. He was gone. And the moment she realized it, Erin felt like her whole world had come crashing down. The loss of her oldest and closest friend hurt almost as much as losing her mom. Erin always felt that the problem with funerals wasn't just how sad they were, or how it always seemed to rain when she went to one. Instead, it was more that they could never properly sum up just how much someone truly meant. Nobody could ever condense the years worth of love and memories into a burial, and it was worse when losing a pet. There was no procession, no wake, nobody else there, just her and Poncho, saying goodbye a final time. Eventually, things got to be too much. The heartbreak of Poncho's death was another struggle in a lifetime of lows that had all left their lasting wounds on Aaron. That, coupled with the stress of trying to carry on with a busy life, barely able to keep herself afloat in either of her jobs, had pushed her to the edge of a breakdown. Maybe that's what summoned it. Perhaps something had sensed all of Aaron's mental anguish and had come to seek her out. It might have been that her wishes for something, some little alleviation to all the pain and stress were finally being granted. Or maybe it was just a gift left by her neighbor. The sun had long since set when Aaron arrived back at her apartment, stepping over the envelopes that littered her doormat, a few with words like overdue and urgent notice printed on them in red ink. Passing through the hallway, Erin paused as she always did, hoping to hear the gentle pattering of paws against the floor. Her therapist had dissuaded her from doing that, saying it would only make moving on from losing Poncho worse. She didn't care. She wanted her dog back. And opening the door to her bedroom, it seemed like someone had been listening. Sat on her bed was a stuffed animal right in the spot where she'd found her little friend on that horrible day. It had been made to look like a dog, specifically resembling a Jack Russell Terrier, with brown patches over its white fur. The plushie was even wearing a little rain poncho, 
The sight of it was enough to cause Erin to break down in tears, weeping in heavy sobs as she dashed across the bedroom to hold it in her arms. Hugging it tightly, her tears seeped into the soft fur as she felt it against her face. She didn't even think to question where it had even come from. All she wanted to do in that moment was hold the stuffed animal close. For the first time in what felt like years, a feeling of relief washed over Erin. It was as if everything was melting away. The stress of work and the toll of her tiring shifts gone. All the pain from losing Cleo and Poncho dissipated too. In fact, it felt like she now had her beloved dog back. No, it was better than that. It was almost as though everything about Poncho, his energy, his spirit, the way he made her feel so calm and loved was all distilled into this stuffed animal. And now, it would never grow old, never age and die, causing her more pain. Erin gripped the soft toy tightly. The longer she held the hug for, the more her stress and sadness faded. Her face was still wet with tears. Although her sobbing had gradually become low, gentle chuckles soon giving way to a peal of uncontrollable laughter rising in volume. It was as though she had taken something, and the very chemistry of her brain was being altered. But after so much hardship, it felt good, to the point where she was almost lightheaded, laying down on the floor of her bedroom, arms locked around the plushie that reminded her so much of Poncho. Erin continued softly giggling to herself. Her entire body relaxed, so much so that every part of her felt like warm butter, as if she was about to start melting through the floorboards. Although she didn't know it, or probably wouldn't have even cared, her dopamine levels were spiking, flooding her with the bodily hormone that relieves stress and makes a person feel good. In fact, right now, she was feeling better than she ever had. Every day that followed, Erin would come home to her stuffed animal, her poncho too, as she liked to think of it. It didn't bother her how childlike anyone else might find it for a grown woman to rely so heavily on a plushie for comfort. At any rate, it wasn't something she was advertising to anyone else. After every shift at both of her jobs, she'd race back to her apartment, right to Poncho 2, and just sit there, just basking in the way it made her feel. It was the most all-encompassing sense of euphoria and relief, reducing her stress so much that she felt like she was floating, her body lighter than air. That feeling was all that mattered to her. Some days she wouldn't even eat. Poncho 2 was more important to her than food. Gradually, she started to become addicted to that feeling. Having to wait until the end of her work shifts to feel that rush of happy chemicals flood her brain was too long of a delay. She started to crave it while working, unable to focus, feeling erratic and restless without Poncho too. Of course, she couldn't risk bringing it to work with her. What if someone took it, or she dropped it? Her boss might see her with a stuffed animal at her desk and fire her on the spot, or think that she was absolutely crazy. The only safe place for her source of relief was at home, but Erin knew she needed something to bridge the gap while she was working. The only substitute that worked was taking a photo of Poncho 2 on her phone, then blowing it up and printing off a copy. Erin could carry it around portably, keeping it in her pocket and taking it out to look at it every few minutes while she worked. The hit of positive chemicals it gave her wasn't quite as strong as getting to hold her stuffed animal. After all, it was just a grainy photo from her phone, essentially acting like a patch to tide her over until she could get back home to the real thing. However, it didn't take long for Erin to start taking Poncho with her anywhere that wasn't work, to the grocery store, to visit her mom and her dog, and, of course, to therapy. I'm rather concerned about this pattern of behavior, Erin's psychotherapist Dr. Lee stated when her patient explained what had been happening. Sitting across on the opposite side of her office on a leather couch, Erin had Poncho 2 pressed tightly against her. I don't care, she sighed, her brain already awash with hormones that kept her calm. I like how it makes me feel, so I don't care. Erin, look at yourself, Dr. Lee urged. You aren't properly dealing with your grief. It seems to me you're channeling all your desire for positive emotion into this stuffed animal. Poncho 2. Erin corrected her without taking her eyes off the soft brown and white dog in its little cloak. Listen to me, the therapist insisted, trying desperately to get through to her. Poncho, your dog, your real dog, is gone. You lost him six months ago. And your mom, Cleo, she passed away too. You have to process and come to terms with those things, as sad as they might make you feel. 
That's how we move on. But what you're doing right now isn't healthy, Aaron. It's becoming an obsession. Turning away, Aaron pressed Poncho 2 up against her face. I don't care, she repeated. By now, Aaron had become fully dependent on Poncho 2, showing up late for both jobs just so she could spend longer feeling those endorphins and hormones that hugging the stuffed animal seemed to bring. It didn't take long for her to start skipping entire shifts for days at a time and canceling any and all other plans just to sit at home basking in the relief brought on by her apparent obsession. Her apartment became a mess, untidy piles of mail by the front door, the walls plastered with hundreds of photos of her stuffed animal, fueling her obsession. Her evening job was the first to fire Aaron, citing her recent absences as the grounds for her dismissal. Even then, she still didn't seem to care. The fact she might not be able to make rent barely registered. Returning home after her other job called her in to tell Aaron she would no longer be working there either, she instantly looked around for Poncho too, but it was nowhere to be found. All the photos on the walls having faded, Aaron checked her phone. All the original copies of the pictures were gone too. Instantly racked with fear, so addicted to the plushie that she could barely function without it, she began tearing her apartment to shreds looking for it. She wrenched cupboards off their hinges and tipped over her refrigerator. Flipping her mattress, Aaron sliced the fabric open with a kitchen knife, searching high and low for Poncho too, but unable to find it anywhere. She became frantic, erratic, pulling her hair out in a fit of uncontrollable despair. Where had it gone? Had someone stolen it? Dr. Lee. The paranoia had already set in, convincing Aaron that her therapist must have taken Poncho too. She was the only other person who knew about it and had been so critical of her using it to make herself feel better. Marching into Dr. Lee's office utterly enraged beyond reason, all Aaron could think about was getting her stuffed animal back, no matter what she had to do. The effect it had on her was so powerful, so potent, and addictive, that living without it was worth anything, even another person's life. Little did Aaron realize, as her hands grew wetter, coated with more of Dr. Lee's blood after every bludgeoning strike, her therapist had no idea where Poncho too was. In fact, she had nothing to do with it vanishing in the first place. It had disappeared all on its own, along with all the photograph copies Aaron had printed. Arriving somewhere miles away, SCP-589 was ready to begin the whole cycle again on its next victim. It would take on whatever shape it needed to appease the desires of the very next person to find it, preying on their vulnerability and making them totally dependent on it. That was what it did. Everywhere it went, leeching off people that it could easily manipulate. Its presence and interaction would calm SCP-589's victims, helping to alleviate their stress or make them feel better about their deepest insecurities. Before long, these helpless victims would be able to think of nothing else, feeling as if they were unable to live without their obsession doll. And every time, that was when SCP-589 would make its cruelest move. It would vanish, leaving its prey in a state of intense withdrawal. With the calming influence of SCP-589 absent from their lives all of a sudden, the infected people would suffer from a variety of potential psychological symptoms, manic depression, psychosis, uncontrollable despair, dementia, or in Aaron's case, paranoia, and a heightened sense of aggression that caused her to murder Dr. Lee. That was one of the earliest in a spate of similar incidents that had been reported. As SCP-589 traveled from town to town, its influence spread, leaving entire populations dead in its wake. All the while, the stuffed animal fed on the mental anguish that it caused its victims, making them pay the ultimate price for their obsession. Today we're getting scary scientifically scary. When a fear becomes so severe that it might get in the way of you living your normal life, it becomes known as a phobia. We'd wager to say that almost everyone watching this video suffers from at least one of them, and given we'll be covering a staggering 28 phobias today, there's a good chance that statistically, one of them is yours. But we're SCP Explained, not Phobias Explained. So naturally, we're going to be putting our own spin on the concept of debilitating terror. At the time of this video's recording, there are well over 6,000 anomalies documented by the SCP Foundation. Some are cute and adorable, some are funny, some are badass, but most of them are pants-soilingly terrifying. 
That's why today, we're running down our big list of 28 soul-shattering phobias and giving you the perfect anomaly for each one. It's going to get scary out here, so please, don't say we didn't warn you. First, we've got agoraphobia, the fear of open spaces. People with this phobia often avoid leaving home, fearing that they'll have a panic attack in a wide open, unfamiliar space. This is precisely why anyone suffering from agoraphobia would hate to have a run-in with SCP-093, the Red Sea object. When placed against a mirror, this unassuming little talisman can transport you to a nightmarish world of wide, desolate deserts populated by craggy, faceless giants out for your blood. With nowhere safe to seclude yourself away, SCP-093's nightmarish dimension would be an agoraphobe's living nightmare. Then, there's acrophobia, the fear of heights. This is an incredibly common one, and if being high up enough has ever induced vertigo and made your legs turn to jello beneath you, then you can probably relate. But hey, simply don't go anywhere high up, right? Nice and easy. Except SCP-3007, a deadly infohazard has the terrifying ability to bring those heights to you. If you're infected by SCP-3007, you'll have ultra-immersive hallucinations of yourself teetering on the huge and impossibly high-up walkways of a city full of silver spires. And if this makes you dizzy, remember, it's not just a dream. If you fall from a great height in your hallucination, you'll die in real life. But maybe you'd take being at the top of the tower over having to deal with anything that has eight legs. That is, if you have arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. This one is self-explanatory. Some people are just debilitatingly terrified of spiders, and they likely think about it a lot. You might even say they have intrusive arachnid thoughts like SCP-632, an anomaly that's likely to scare an arachnophobe to death, literally. If you see a tiny pink spider with a strange pattern on its back, it may already be over for you. As the horrors of SCP-632 flood your mind with thoughts of spiders, and your brain matter literally transforms into a vast, skittering colony of the little beasts. Maybe the last anomaly has you wanting to just get up and fly away. Or maybe you suffer from tyromerhanophobia, the fear of flying. Of course, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Unless you're enough of a baller to have a private jet, you probably agree with everyone else that flying absolutely sucks. Especially if the flight you're taking is SCP-787. This cursed plane is filled with 515 human corpses, perfectly illustrating what you fear will happen to you on that plane. But it's also the site of a wide variety of terrifying anomalous happenings, from violent sounds to nightmarish figures roaming the cabin, and who thought flying could possibly get any worse? Next, we're going to box you in a little, which will absolutely terrify you if you suffer from claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. If people with claustrophobia are confined or locked up, they're likely to experience a full-blown panic attack. That's why they'd utterly despise SCP-1562, also known as the carnivorous slide. This seemingly ordinary tube slide will cause its victims to be teleported to a mysterious place in total darkness, so cramped that they can barely move, lodged into place by mysterious items in the tight tunnel around them. And if that wasn't scary enough, you're not alone in this terrible, claustrophobic place either. You don't want to know what happens after that. But maybe it's not the confinement that scares you in that scenario, but the lack of light. If that's the case, you may have nyctophobia, the fear of the dark. And if you do suffer from nyctophobia, then you'd absolutely hate to be stuck in SCP-087, The Staircase. This place is filled with a kind of darkness so oppressive that it doesn't follow the laws of physics. No matter how powerful light you bring in, it cannot penetrate the haze. As you descend deeper into the staircase, you'll find that your sense of dread will only increase as you begin to hear a child crying far below. If you're foolish enough to keep going, you may end up face to face with a certain pale, featureless face. Though maybe that entity didn't have nearly enough legs to scare you. Perhaps you suffer from entomophobia, the fear of insects. 
There are honestly more insectoid SCPs than we can even list right now. But for the entomophobia sufferers in our audience, we think the scariest one out there might be SCP-743, the Chocolate Fountain. Sounds delicious, right? We hope so. Because if not, you didn't die for much. Because anyone who eats the chocolate from SCP-743 is doomed to be eaten by the millions of flying ant creatures within. You'll die screaming, surrounded by horrific buzzing and feeling a million tiny legs crawling all over your body. How lovely. Now, picture an ocean. A vast, roiling ocean whipped to and fro by nautical winds. Maybe this comforts you, or maybe it terrifies you. Because you've got thalassophobia, the fear of the sea. This is an incredibly popular fear because, let's be real, there are a lot of really scary things under the sea. Terrifying things you'll never forget. Or maybe things you'll definitely forget. Like SCP-3000 Anatashisha. This astronomically large eel produces amnestics, which lull its victims into a false sense of security before devouring them. And hell, if the ocean itself is that terrifying to you, maybe being eaten by a massive eel god would be a reprieve for you. Let's get back out of the water and onto land, where all kinds of things are slithering. If that makes you nervous, you might have ophidiophobia, the fear of snakes. And if you do, you're going to be mortally terrified of SCP-5430, an eastern garter snake that has even greater locomotive abilities than the average snake, because it has 48 legs, connected by thaumaturgic means. It's essentially the snake equivalent of a centipede. We don't even have ophidiophobia, and that's a pretty terrifying thought to us. But maybe we need to think bigger. Or maybe a lot bigger. If that sentiment makes you feel a little nervous, though, you may suffer from megalophobia, the fear of large things. There are many large and terrifying SCPs in this world, but few are quite as dizzyingly massive as SCP-2317-K, also known as the Devourer of Worlds. Just how big is this very hungry boy locked away behind the door to another world? According to our best estimates, it's a little over 200 kilometers tall, roughly equivalent to 451 Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. Geez, that makes us feel a little dizzy. Let's stop thinking about that, and instead consider the most frightening thing of all. Spooky, scary skeletons. Skelophobia, the fear of skeletons. And for those afraid of skeletons, SCP-3114 would be an elementally terrifying entity to encounter. This living skeleton actually hates being a skeleton, so much so that if it encounters a human being who does have skin, it tears the skin off in a jealous rage and wears it like a costume. So if you do have skelophobia, you'd be lucky to encounter SCP-3114 when it's wearing a tasteful human skin outfit. Then I'm sure it wouldn't be terrifying at all. Okay, okay, it's no secret that we sometimes like to be funny here on SCP Explained. Much like Dr. Bright, we use humor as a coping mechanism. We're happy to be a little clownish now and then. That wouldn't be so chill for people who suffer from cholerophobia, the fear of clowns. And for those terrified of clowns, we know one show you definitely shouldn't watch. SCP-993 Bobble the Clown. This jolly cartoon nightmare is a clown that loves to teach kids the tools of his trade, like breaking and entering, murder, cannibalism, and arson, just to name a few. If you're afraid of clowns and you encounter this show as a kid, you'd be traumatized for life. Thankfully though, if you encounter it as an adult, you'll just pass out. Small mercies, huh? Now, some phobias truly can wreck your life. They can make you afraid of something so common, so ubiquitous, it makes you wonder how you can even function. One example is helophobia, the fear of the sun. However, we'd all be sharing this phobia if SCP-001 when daybreaks came to pass. Simply being exposed to the sunlight would cause you to melt into a deranged blob. However, if this ever happened, people suffering from heliophobia may actually be the most likely people to survive because they've already spent their life building strategies to help them avoid the piercing gaze of the sun. So maybe keep a heliophobe in your life, just to be safe. Some phobias are, thankfully, a lot easier for you to avoid. Take, for example, coasterphobia. 
the fear of roller coasters. If you have this problem, just don't go on a roller coaster, but especially not SCP-2183, also known ominously as the ride never ends. If you end up on this ride, you'll be hurtling through the sky, screaming in terror forever. Not fun for anyone, least of all coaster phobes. But maybe roller coasters don't make you nervous. Maybe being watched makes you nervous. Maybe the idea that there could be a pair of mysterious eyes boring into you right now that makes your skin crawl. If this is true, you may have scopotophobia, the fear of being stared at. And if you have scoptophobia and you're not a furry who's down ludicrously bad, then you'd be terrified after downloading the Mal-O app, also known as SCP-1471. If you download the app, you'll be stalked by the skull-faced Mal-O, which will stare at you from all your favorite places. That'll get your heart rate up, one way or another. I'll say no more after that. Hey, is it getting hot in here? Can you smell smoke? Can you hear that strange crackling noise? I certainly hope you don't have pyrophobia, the fear of fire. Fearing fire is honestly pretty natural, given it can burn you to death, especially if you're a liar who's trapped inside SCP-2128, a terrifying device known as the Liar's Cradle. If ever you're locked inside its deadly furnace, you better choose your words carefully, or the cradle will detect your mistruth and incinerate you. And wouldn't it suck to be terrified and agonized as you die? But perhaps you don't fear fire, you just fear ladies that are smoking hot. That means you have calumniphobia, the fear of beautiful women. Yes, it is real. And if you suffer from this phobia, then you'd be terrified of SCP-056, also known as a beautiful person. The ideal form of this conceited entity is the famous actor Scarlett Johansson. So if you're afraid of beautiful women, then this entity will horrify you to your core. They're just a real jerk, too. What if the early 2010s were just an absolute nightmare for you? Because there were zombies everywhere. Movies, TV shows, Halloween costumes, zombie walks, and more merchandise than you can shake Negan's baseball bat Lucille at. This probably means you have kinomortophobia, the fear of zombies. And if that is the case, stay the hell away from victims of SCP-008. This lethal and contagious pathogen creates mindless and extremely aggressive zombies, whose only purpose is to spread their disease to others, adding additional members to their teeming mindless horde. So if that's not your thing, either keep your distance, or make sure you have some SCP-500 pills close to hand. Next, we have another ubiquitous nightmare, hydrophobia, the fear of water. It's everywhere, and you literally need it to survive, so it's a bummer to be petrified by it. Though at least with SCP-1128, the aquatic horror, you'll have a very good reason to be afraid of water. After all, if you see a picture or get a comprehensive description of this massive underwater monster, no body of water is safe. From bathtubs to cups to swimming pools to puddles, the horror will stalk you relentlessly and eat you alive. And now, from big horrors to tiny ones. Microphobia, the fear of small things. There's a joke I'd like to make here, but then we wouldn't make any money on this video. Anyway, for anyone paranoid about puny perils, I bet it's a nightmare to encounter SCP-165, the creeping hungry sands of Tule. Because while it may look like a pile of sand, it's actually a giant pile of almost microscopic flesh-eating mites. Sleep tight. Oh, was that a thundercrack I just heard? I hope nobody here suffers from astrophobia, the fear of storms. Though I think we'd all be afraid of storms if we had a run-in with SCP-3280 after the storm. This is an extremely dangerous blob of living water, which is able to incorporate even more water into its mass. Its favorite hobby is crawling into your body, stealing all your water, then bursting out, leaving you dead. And why do storms make it even more dangerous? Because it gives the creature a heavy supply of water. And if this thing ever gets into the water cycle, we're probably all doomed. Let's move from existential threats to the threat of murder most foul. And that's foul with a W. We're talking about electorophobia, the fear of chickens. Of course, the average chicken probably couldn't kill you, at least not without considerable prep time. But killing you is incredibly easy for the abominable chicken-human hybrids known as SCP-3199. Humans refuted. 
These horrific creations of a mad evolutionary scientist would strike fear into anyone, but especially someone predisposed to fear chicken-like beings. But what if we took a fear of an animal that could even kill you without any anomalous influence, a phobia like cynophobia, the fear of dogs? And that fear would only be made worse by a run-in with the ominous SCP-023, also known as Black Shuck. If you see this terrifying furry beast, then it means you're going to die soon. This is one dog you really can't call a good boy. But hey, we're fair and balanced here at SCP Explained. That's why we're also including Illurophobia, the fear of cats. And if you are afraid of cats, then you might be one of the few people who survive a run-in with SCP-247, ironically dubbed a harmless kitten. This is a lie because this innocent-looking little cat is actually a highly aggressive, fully-grown tiger that we just happened to perceive as a cute little kitten. Being afraid of it despite its adorable disguise is probably the best way to not get mauled. Now, let's go from furry to slimy. That's right, it's baractrophobia, the fear of amphibians. Frogs, toads, newts, if it can traverse both water and land, you're afraid of it. That's why, despite her good-hearted nature, you'd probably have a heart attack if you ran into SCP-811, the Swamp Woman. She's not mean, but she is green, and she does excrete dangerous acidic mucus. If you're afraid of frogs, seeing this huge humanoid frog-like entity would be an excellent way to ruin your latest pair of tidy whities Maybe you're fine with frogs, though, but would absolutely die on the spot if you were faced with a lizard. That means you've probably got herpetophobia, the fear of reptiles. The worst thing you could possibly run into is extremely obvious here. SCP-682, the legendary, infamous, hard-to-destroy reptile. There are some scary lizards out there, but none quite as scary as this, because it hates all life, including you, and probably enjoys the fact that you fear it. Though, for what it's worth, we think being utterly terrified of running into this reptile is a very rational fear. Now for a slightly more abstract terror, autophobia, the fear of being alone. How do you feel about isolation? Of being separated from all your friends and family, nobody to hear you, nobody to help you, alone. If you can feel your chest tightening at these words, not only do you probably have autophobia, It'd be your absolute worst nightmare to be trapped in SCP-3001, the Red Reality, where poor Dr. Scranton was forced to spend the rest of eternity. You're probably beyond the help of everyone here, even reality itself. In other words, it's a nasty, nasty place to be, no matter what you fear. And perhaps the most irrational real phobia in this video, it's bibliophobia, the fear of books. Typically, books cannot hurt you, unless you get a paper cut or one falls on you off a shelf. There are, however, notable exceptions. Perhaps the most terrifying of all is SCP-140, a cursed tome known as an Incomplete Chronicle, or a Chronicle of the Devas. Anytime this book is exposed to human blood, it expands and rewrites itself, bringing the nightmarish Davite Empire closer to ruling the world as it is today. In this and only this very specific instance, Bibliophobia is extremely justified. And there you have it, folks. We're sorry for giving you a mild to moderate case of the heebie-jeebies. Which of these phobias apply to you? And do you think there are any other important ones we missed? Let us know down in the comments. And of course, remember to subscribe and ring the bell to turn on notifications, or all your worst nightmares will become reality. Ranger Halter felt the bark of the tree trunk slamming into his back practically knocking all the air out of his lungs as he tried desperately to slow his frantic breathing. The sound of his own panting filled him with a sudden, horrifying thought. If he could hear his own ragged breaths, then it could hear them too. He clamped a hand over his mouth, clenching his jaw shut so tightly that he thought his teeth might splinter as he pushed them together. His free hand gripped the tranquilizer gun, shuddering as the snap of a twig rang out somewhere behind him. It had caught up to him already. He could bolt, make a quick dash for a cover behind another tree, but it was close enough now that it would see him. And if it did, 
It would come rushing after him with a speed that even a seasoned park ranger couldn't match. As much as he tried to force himself to stay still, the petrified curiosity got the better of him. Holter peeked out from behind the tree and immediately wished he hadn't. It had all started out as what sounded like an everyday occurrence. High atop his watchtower in the Glacier National Park, Ranger Holter had been enjoying the view of Montana's Rocky Mountains, a cup of coffee from his thermos in his hand. Then the familiar squawk of his radio had cut short his appreciation of the serene scenery. Holter sighed, tossing the remaining contents of the cup over the tower's railing, wondering what kind of day he was in for as he went to answer the radio. Most of the time, things in Glacier Park were as peaceful as they looked, but the park ranger knew that staying vigilant could make all the difference when it came to finding a missing hiker in time, or the difference between deterring a group of campers away from a family of bears and having a hell of a mess to clean up. He pushed down on the button for the microphone, connected to the bulky radio that took up practically an entire desk. Halter, thank God, came the relieved voice from the other side. We've been trying to reach everyone, put them on alert. We've got trouble. Reports of a coyote gone feral attacking folks. I'm on it, Halter replied, grabbing his gear from the cramped watchtower as he continued to speak into the mic. Where did the report come in from? Not far from your station. I'd say about a click west from your position. Stowing his tranquilizer gun, Ranger Holder descended the ladder from his watchtower down to ground level. As a park ranger, Holder valued the environment he worked in. And as a fan of the SCP universe, we know how much you value intricate world building, or in some cases, world destroying. But either way, we couldn't be happier to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, World Anvil. World Anvil is a comprehensive set of world building tools that not only help you craft and organize your unique setting, but also present it in a captivating manner. From wiki-like articles and interactive maps to a full-fledged RPG campaign manager and novel writing software, World Anvil has everything a world creator could dream of. World Anvil equips you with over 25 templates, prompting you to dive deeper into your creations. Enrich your content by embedding maps, images, sound effects, and even little secrets for that immersive touch. With their innovative design, you can easily visualize your world through maps, chronicle its history with timelines, and fine-tune events with intricate details. Your crafted world can be beautifully showcased on a unique homepage, inviting others to dive into your vision. Got a sudden idea while working on another? No problem. World Anvil lets you swiftly create new articles or link existing ones, ensuring you never lose track of your inspiration. But my personal favorite feature is their interactive maps. Beyond just creating and uploading your own designs, you can directly link your creations, allowing for a dynamic and engaging experience. And if you're collaborating, invite your team to refine, write, and even let your fans chip in. I'm currently working on my own interactive map of Site 17, and maybe I'll even let you see it when I'm done. But don't wait for me. Dive into World Anvil yourself and elevate your world building game. And here's a treat use our link in the description to go to worldanvil.com and use the code SCP to grab a whopping 51% off any yearly subscription. Explore, create, and share with World Anvil. The sun was already starting to dip out of sight behind the trees. Pretty soon it'd be pitch black, save for the beam of his flashlight. He had to move fast. Coyotes were only known to attack humans on rare occasions. Usually they kept away, at least enough to make them a minimal risk. But waiting for him just west of the watchtower wasn't a coyote. At least, not at first. Watching it from behind the tree moments later, Ranger Holter's stomach turned at the sight of the creature. It walked bipedally, like a human, but the shape was all wrong. Its legs looked broken, but that hadn't stopped it from catching up. Instead of bending at the knee, they were Z-shaped, pointing back behind the creature, then twisting back again in the opposite direction at the joint. They looked more like the legs of a dog, but they were far too big. The same could be said of the arms, bent out of shape at multiple points like its legs were. The creature was a mess of misshapen limbs. The cartilage in its ears had seemingly reformed into points, and there were claws protruding from its fingertips, practically bursting out from where a human's fingernails would be. But beneath it all, and what alarmed Ranger Holter the most, was its skin. It had darkened in patches, layers of fur sprouting over those areas, but there were still parts that remained clear where skin, human skin, was still visible peeling away to reveal the new fur-coated layer underneath. It looked like a grotesque accident, like something ripped straight out of an old horror movie, the kind of monster that a mad scientist would make by haphazardly splicing DNA and playing God. 
Ulther checked the tranquilizer gun in his trembling fingers, still empty after that most recent shot. He reached for another dart, slowly sliding it into the loading mechanism and readying the pistol. It cocked and made a sound. The creature's malformed head turned, snapping directly towards the source of the noise, directly towards Holter. He turned to sprint away, trying to expand the distance between him and it. If he was too close, the dart wouldn't have enough momentum when he pulled the trigger. The toe of his boot snagged on something solid, unmoving, a root from the tree he'd been hiding behind. He felt himself tumble, landing with a hard thud against the forest floor. His gun, it had fallen from his grasp. He scrabbled around in the dirt for it, barely able to see where the tranquilizer had landed in the dark. Just as his fingertips brushed past something metal, Holter felt the force of something heavy strike his back again. This time, though, it wasn't a tree. It was the creature. It snarled, gnashing its canid jaws that were protruding out of its skull, rows of sharp teeth that had uprooted the old ones burying themselves into the park ranger's neck and not letting go, until he'd stopped moving for good. A few short hours later, a convoy of mysterious unmarked vehicles arrived at Glacier National Park. The rest of the park rangers, who had reported the strange activity, were approached by shadowy figures who refused to give their names or offer up any form of identification other than just referring to themselves as experts in things like this. Not long after, none of the others would remember Ranger Holter or the incident that had led to his untimely death. After administering amnestics, it didn't take the SCP Foundation search party long to discover a lone coyote sniffing around the remains of a park ranger covered in blood. The wild animal was captured, to be brought back for testing before being re-released into the wild. Meanwhile, the Foundation scoured the rest of the area, until they came across the real culprit. Standing in a clearing a short distance from a footpath through the forest was SCP-1579. Of course, the next challenge was getting it packed up and transported to Biosite-66 without touching it. To the untrained eye, SCP-1579 looks to be fairly unassuming, even as far as anomalous objects go. It is simply an old wooden sculpture, the kind that can even be occasionally found in various wooded areas throughout the world. Its age is apparent from even one cursory glance at SCP-1579, the partial damage to its cedar surface speaking to the numerous years it has existed for, along with the bright green moss that covers it. Although, curiously, this moss doesn't seem to dry out and die in responses to changes in humidity, nor does it affect SCP-1579's structural integrity. As for where it came from, and who made it, those are still unknown. As if the answer to what holds SCP-1579's anomalous properties, whether or not the cedar it was carved from or the moss coating the sculpture possesses some unknown properties, or if SCP-1579 was somehow imbued with these after being created. Initial testing by the SCP Foundation's researchers determined SCP-1579 to have an abnormally high resistance to the type of damage wood, and particularly cedar wood, is susceptible to. For one, it does not seem to show any signs of rotting or natural degradation. For another, it is also resistant to heat, at least to a certain extent. It doesn't burn the same way other objects constructed from cedar wood. However, this sculpture is not entirely indestructible. Pieces can be easily chipped off of the main body of SCP-1579, and these splintered fragments continue to carry the same anomalous effects as the rest of the sculpture, even when separate from it. But of course, you want to know about the creature. How does this supposedly harmless, if a little structurally abnormal cedar wood sculpture connects to whatever it was that killed Park Ranger Holter? Well, it's quite simple, actually. SCP-1579 killed Holter. Not directly, you understand, but by proxy, through its further anomalous properties. Still confused? Well then, how about a demonstration? Let's take a look at one of the Foundation's preferred test subjects, an expendable member of D-Class personnel, probably spending multiple life sentences working here at the SCP Foundation, rather than behind the bars of a maximum security institution. Now, what would happen if you place this delightful individual in the same room as SCP-1579? Well, nothing initially. That is, until the subject touches the cedar wood surface of the sculpture, either out of curiosity or following the instructions of a Foundation researcher. That's when the real anomaly starts. The wooden sculpture will exhibit a slight but observable movement, 
shuddering slightly as if moved by an unseen force. This will precede the person who touched the object, feeling a burning sensation. That kind of irritating, painful heat that spreads underneath the surface of the skin. The burning will always begin at the area of their body that made direct contact with SCP-1579, and touching it again at any point will trigger a reactivation of the sculpture's anomalous effects. Subjects experiencing the effects of SCP-1579 have described the feeling as being akin to a bad sunburn that rapidly spreads across the skin from the point of contact, only to stop once it has affected a person's entire body. Following the subsidence of the burning sensation, subjects experiencing the side effects of touching SCP-1579 will notice an immediate change to their skin. Within a window of three minutes, their skin becomes thin and paper-like in its texture before starting to peel away. Once this stage occurs, the peeling skin will reveal a new layer underneath, hence the colloquially used codename for this anomaly, Different Skin. However, this so-called different skin isn't merely a new layer of otherwise ordinary human skin. Instead, it will belong to another species entirely. A person coming into contact with SCP-1579 will find themselves rapidly developing new skin that shares the physical traits, as well as matching DNA, to that of a number of animal species. It should be noted that these features will continue to rapidly develop until the subject is entirely transformed and is no longer considered to qualify as a human being. As for the specific transformation that occurs, there are a number of known outcomes that repeat in the following cycle. Let's say our D-Class, we'll call them Subject A, touched SCP-1579 at the start of the cycle. They would, after the burning sensation stops and peeling begins, start to sprout dark feathers across their torso, arms, and upper legs, likely with a great deal of pain as the sharp quill of these feathers start to burst out from beneath the skin. Beneath the knees, Subject A will see their legs start to become yellow and scaly as well as a change that causes their toenails to simply start to painfully protrude outwards until they form pointed, blackened talons. Subject A's face will also start to grow feathers, however these grow outwards away from the areas of the nose and mouth. Flight feathers will also protrude from the forearms, multiplying in number until their entire body is covered, at which point Subject A, on every level including genetically, more closely resembles a corvus corax more commonly known as the common raven, than a human being anymore. Take another test subject, Subject B, and get them to touch SCP-1579 right after. Their different skin is covered in brown fur that's approximately four inches long. Their lips and skin underneath the fur will darken, and their nose will become constantly moist. Claws will start to grow from their fingertips, although these will be notably smaller than those of a fully grown creature of the same species an Ursus Arctos Horribilis, or a grizzly bear. Then we get to the point in the cycle where some unwitting hiker encountered SCP-1579 in the forests of Glacier National Park, Montana. When this subject, Subject C, touched the cedar sculpture, their skin began to grow layered fur, as the cartilage of their ears is separated from their tissue and replaced by new, reshaped cartilage. Much like Subject B, who SCP-1579 turned into a grizzly bear, Subject C also had darkened skin, a moistened nose, and longer, sharper nails. It was at some point during this transformation that an unassuming park ranger stumbled upon Subject C. Frightened by what he saw, this ranger was unable to identify that what he interpreted as attacks by some kind of half-human, half-animal hybrid were actually desperate pleas for help as Subject C was transformed into a coyote. Although it's hard to say which physiological change triggered by SCP-1579 is the most alarming or unpleasant to experience, the fourth kind is in no way any more pleasant than the preceding three in the cycle. Subject D of this particular series of tests will find the new layer of skin that emerges under the old to be hairless and of a green coloration, often with brown markings. Unlike the previous instances, their skin will rapidly begin to dry out and seems to be far more reactive to the humidity of the surrounding environment. It is also far thinner than that of the skin possessed by other transformations that SCP-1579 causes. So thin, in fact, that the eyeballs of Subject D will be visible through its eyelids, which rapidly become translucent, similar to those of the Pseudacris regula, otherwise known as the Pacific Tree Frog. 
Repeated activation of SCP-1579's anomalous properties will trigger the next transformation in the cycle, whether the Cedarwood sculpture is touched by a new subject or repeatedly by the same person. In the latter instance, where a subject is re-exposed to SCP-1579, the additional changes their body undergoes will be significantly more painful. Their already newly replaced outer layer of skin will fail to dry out and will begin bleeding instead. Three or four consecutive exposures to SCP-1579 will lead to excessive bodily trauma for the subject, usually causing them to die from shock before the fourth transformation is complete. And as we're sure you can imagine, an amalgamation of a human, a raven, a grizzly bear, a coyote, and a tree frog is hardly a pleasant sight. This unfortunate fate was suffered during one of the first incidents with SCP-1579 that brought the Foundation's attention to it. During an elementary school field trip, a teacher who was explaining the history of totem poles in Native American culture accidentally touched SCP-1579. While experiencing the pain of her transformation, she fell against the sculpture in a panic, not realizing it had been what caused her to change. This repeated triggering of the object's anomalous effects led to her untimely death, an event that had to be wiped from the minds of her students by the Foundation using the careful application of Class B amnestics. For now, SCP-1579 is kept in a secure, sterile environment at a Foundation storage warehouse, where personnel are not permitted to make any contact with it. So there's no need to worry about accidentally running into SCP-1579 in the wild. Although, there are always plenty of other things to worry about while out on a hike through the forest. Things that could be right behind you. Its wolf-like jaws glisten with saliva. It prowls endlessly through the darkness, searching for its prey. Its mind is simple, yet its technology is impossible. What is this terrifying being? While there is never any shortage of the inexplicable and even the downright absurd at the SCP Foundation, few creatures manage to be both in equal measure. Then, there's SCP-6662. This is the designation given to a Keter-class entity that remains free from Foundation containment, since it cannot be physically confined to a single location. Instead, the Foundation has had to come up with measures that allow them to observe the creature from a safe distance without provoking it, while also making sure that civilians remain unaware of its existence. To achieve this goal, they have implemented several diversionary tactics in order to manipulate SCP-6662 to spend its time searching more remote, unpopulated areas. Searching for what, you might ask? Well, we guarantee you would never guess. Let's dive a little deeper into exactly who, or what, SCP-6662 is, and what coveted treasure it spends its time searching for. SCP-6662 is described in its file as a part humanoid, part canid creature. Canidae are a biological family of carnivores, more colloquially referred to as dogs. These include not only domestic pooches, but also wolves, coyotes, foxes, jackals, and a number of other similar mammals, as well as our intriguing new anomaly, SCP-6662. The main difference is that 6662 appears to be bipedal, walking on two legs much more like a human would, as opposed to four like its canid cousins. Its similarities with humans also include longer fingers, larger eyes, and more complex facial muscles that enable it to convey a wider range of facial expressions. It had a top-heavy build, its body seeming to be structured in such a way that would make it unbalanced. It's not even that the upper portion of its body is necessarily stronger, as SCP-6662's musculature doesn't even seem to function in the way one would expect a human being to, or a canid for that matter. It is entirely abnormally structured, with its muscles being simultaneously and paradoxically both lean and pronounced, yet also rounded and undefined. Despite possessing exaggerated masculine proportions, there is no indication that SCP-6662 is male or female. Testing by the SCP Foundation had revealed that its body doesn't produce any recognizable hormones, except for an extreme amount of insulin. Within humans, insulin is created in the pancreas and used to help convert glucose, or sugar, into energy. For the amount of insulin it appears to produce, it appears the inner workings of SCP-6662 are seemingly prepared to ingest high quantities of sugar. In terms of style, 
SCP-6662 has a consistent choice of outfit, consisting of a wide-brimmed fedora, a zipper jacket, and a backpack with a simple button flap. All of these are matching, made from brown leather that has been heavily weathered. SCP-6662 has never worn any legwear, but seems to not even understand the concept of why one would ever choose to put on a pair of pants in the first place. Apart from all of these traits, this anomaly's head, hands, feet, tail, and fur all resemble that of a Canis lupus, otherwise known as a Eurasian wolf, or the common wolf, native to much of Europe and Asia. However, the creature has exhibited a great deal of discomfort around mammals, and anything that isn't human seems to cause it to become increasingly confused. Does that make SCP-6662 the result of genetic experimentation? Is it some kind of hybrid between man and wolf? Or is it a werewolf? Well, it doesn't seem to be either of those, but instead something far more unusual. Ontokinetics. It's the clinical term given to reality warping with ontokinesis referring to the anomalous ability to alter reality. This is an ability possessed by numerous SCPs that the Foundation has encountered over the years. And while some might use it to write human victims out of existence or otherwise generally wreak havoc, few deploy it in the same way as SCP-6662. SCP-6662 has exhibited the ability to manifest almost any variety of tools, bringing them into existence at will usually by producing them from within its backpack. The things it can bring into being do not appear to function in the same way that you might expect an object from this reality to. For example, in one instance, SCP-6662 produced a handheld musical instrument from its backpack. While you might think this would be used to play a tune, this item actually unfolded into a fully operational tank at the push of a button. The gadgets it creates seems to have no logic that governs their function with many being downright scientifically improbable. While any of these items appear to be operated through the simple use of brightly colored simplistic controls and buttons, SCP-6662's technology is far more complex than even the Foundation's top researchers can understand. Experts in the field, who have been examining anomalous devices for their entire careers, have been left stumped by studying the components of items SCP-6662 has created. Internally, each of these devices has a total lack of any coherent inner workings. They simply do not make sense, yet they carry out whatever function SCP-6662 intends. This has led many Foundation personnel to the working theory that each of the objects produced from its bag are solely operated by SCP-6662's subconscious. However, it only seems to be able to create tools that can fulfill immediate physical purposes and cannot produce from its backpack anything that would satisfy its greater emotional needs and desires. As for what SCP-6662 actually needs or wants, well, it is a creature that has displayed an emotional and intellectual range that is almost as confusing as the inner workings of the devices it warps reality to create. Behavioral experts working at the SCP Foundation have noted that when it comes to its intelligence, it is hard to compare this wolf creature with any known level of human intellectual development. It's as inaccurate to liken it to a child as it would be to compare it to an average adult, primarily because SCP-6662 is profoundly unfamiliar with and unable to comprehend any fundamental aspects of our reality. It is able to acknowledge that it is not from our reality, but also unable to identify its own point of origin. In addition, it can perceive no difference between itself and human beings. Any of the differences that exist between humans and this bipedal canid creature are either imperceptible to it, or SCP-6662 considers them too negligible to even be worth acknowledging. However, one distinction that SCP-6662 does make is the difference between adults and children. SCP-6662 has complete trust for children and will even allow itself to be blatantly manipulated by them, believing anything they say. But in complete contrast, during its interactions with SCP Foundation personnel, the creature has shown itself to be highly distrustful of fully grown adults. Normally, when approached by one, it assumes that they are either angry or bored, even when Foundation staff have attempted to approach it with caution or have adopted positive mannerisms. The only proven strategy for interacting with it appears to be treating the canid creature with indifference, otherwise it will perceive adults as inherently confrontational. 
It lacks any and all awareness related to human development or familial structure, misidentifying every adult that it comes into contact with as a parent, regardless of whether they have children or not. Despite being at least aware of the difference between parents and children, even if it can't properly apply this knowledge to the people it meets, SCP-6662 doesn't think of itself as belonging to either of these social roles. Instead, in the rare occasions the SCP Foundation has been able to successfully conduct interviews with the anomaly, it has made references to an entirely different social binary that is separate from its understanding of parents and children. SCP-6662 has made reference to both keepers and seekers. When asked further questions about this by research personnel, probing the creature for more information on what exactly it thinks keepers and seekers are, SCP-6662 claimed that it was an example of a seeker, but the wolf-like entity either refused to or was unable to delineate the difference between what makes someone a keeper or a seeker. It has also not identified any other being from our reality as being either of these, and has been unable to explain more about the society or culture of whatever dimension or reality it originates from. Given that the anomaly closely resembles a wolf, you might be forgiven for assuming that being a seeker is akin to being an animal that hunts. Perhaps seekers and keepers are this creature's version of the hunter and gatherer categories we see in our own animal kingdom. Yet it does not seem to actively hunt for food, nor is SCP-6662 believed to be a carnivorous animal. Instead, apparently thanks to its anomalous reality-warping abilities, the creature is able to sustain itself without any effort, seeming not to require food, water, or any other form of sustenance in order to survive. But then this begs the question, what exactly is SCP-6662 seeking? Almost all of SCP-6662's time and energy is spent searching for something it refers to as treasure treats. The creature has displayed an intense fixation with attempting to track down these treats, but in a rare example of it providing elaboration, SCP-6662 has shown itself to be willing to explain exactly what the phrase treasure treats refers to. In fact, the creature has provided such extensive description of these that they've even been given their own adjacent designation by the Foundation, SCP-6662-1. The so-called treasure treats are described by SCP-6662 to be an edible substance that the anomaly will go to any lengths to acquire, with the emphasis that it will do anything to obtain them. However, despite the detailed descriptions of SCP-6662-1 that have been provided to the SCP Foundation, any attempt to recreate these treasure treats or provide the creature with an existing alternative have been met with dissatisfaction and rejection by SCP-6662. There is one consistency, though. SCP-6662's descriptions of their coveted treasure treats will closely resemble the characteristics of breakfast cereal, in particular, sugary cereal. SCP-6662 has shown no interest in interacting with humans or any other living beings unless such an interaction is focused on obtaining SCP-6662-1. Whenever Foundation staff have attempted to engage with the canid creature, normally with a great deal of difficulty, the focus of conversation inevitably turns to acquiring SCP-6662-1. The anomaly will even go as far as attempting to coerce, bribe, or manipulate anyone engaging with it into assisting it in finding treasure treats. However, the creature is far from a master of manipulation and will always reveal its true intentions, given that it either lacks the developmental understanding to completely deceive a person or that it is so obsessed with finding SCP-6662-1, possibly even addicted to them, that it can't help but make its true intentions known. In order to observe the anomaly's behavior closely, one of the Foundation's mobile task forces was able to plant a bug within SCP-6662's backpack. This listening device revealed that the creature has a habit of vocalizing its own thoughts, often speaking aloud about its own feelings and actions at great length, when it believes that there is no one around to hear it. Within the transcript of the recordings recovered by the SCP Foundation, SCP-6662 can be heard lamenting how long its search has gone on, 
It expresses an unwillingness to see the stars, as night often brings with it feelings of doubt within the creature. It seems to have lost all sense of time and a self-defensive inability to think for too long about its own memories. SCP-6662's mind almost reflexively shuts out any thoughts of its own world as it starts to reminisce, bringing all its attention back to the present and its ongoing search for SCP-6662-1. They're great! My instinct as a seeker is to press ever forward. Each fresh dawn is a call to a new day, a new adventure, a new breakfast. Just as no day can be relieved, no breakfast can be re-eaten, no matter how balanced it may be. There was a time when I would have said that life is but a journey from one breakfast to the next, but now, I've explored the darkest jungles and braved the deepest tombs this world has to offer, but the only frosted oat doubloons that can be found are the pictures which yet ache in the back of my head. The creature is tormented, seeking out something it can remember as being worth finding, yet unable to locate it no matter how long it continues to seek. What good is a journey when the destination no longer exists? Why should I keep my eyes to the present when everything I see can only be found in the past? According to its own words, SCP-6662 has spent years searching and yet feels as if that time has been wasted as it has nothing to show for it. It even questions whether or not what it seeks can actually be found at all, yet it is unable to stop itself from searching day in and day out. Curiously, when alone, the creature makes reference to other beings that it has memories of, in particular one named Samuel, presumably a bird as he apparently possesses a beak. He also references someone named Horatio, who was apparently a seafaring captain, as well as an unnamed creature who dwelled in the treetops. SCP-6662 also speaks of a leprechaun, a great tiger, a group of sky elves, and an undead nobleman in a castle. From the way the anomaly describes these beings, they were rivals and possibly even fought in some kind of conflict together. Although the unnamed treetop being seems to have been an ally, and it seems that this particular being, possibly some kind of monkey, is the one SCP-6662 misses the most. I would have gladly forfeit my remaining days of pineapple pearls, chocotastic treasure chests, and fruity fiesta gemstones. I would have made my destination the warmth of your gaze, and my purpose the pursuit of your smile. I would have followed you to the stars. I emerge from my cave, my burning heartache now tempered to a strange warmth. Questions of shame turn those to hope. If there are many worlds, could they share the same sky? If you can see me from where you are, I want you and your honey-coated constellations to gaze down at this weary dog with a smile. Whatever boundaries of space and time were broken for me to learn these lessons, I will break them again. I will snap every joint in the skeleton of reality between my bloody jaws until I am at your side in the cosmos. So let's recap. We have a creature resembling a wolf with abnormal proportions that are almost closer to a caricature. This being can bend reality to produce any item it needs, whether or not said object even makes sense or conforms to our universe's rules of physics, almost like a cartoon. It also spends all of its time searching for sugary treasure treats, and the internal functions of its body appear to be primed to consume extreme amounts of glucose. If we take everything we know about this anomaly and put it all together, there is only one outcome. An answer so obvious and yet so outlandish that it remains the only applicable explanation for what this anomalous canid creature is. SCP-6662 is a breakfast cereal mascot. Roll up, roll up, step right this way, ladies and gentlemen. On the other side of these canvas doors, you're about to witness something so monstrous, so hideous, so repulsive, that it will turn your stomachs and fill you with amazement. The creature you'll find in this tent has been known to elicit all manner of responses from well-to-do folks like yourselves. You may want to laugh at it, you may want to strike it down, you may even want to throw rotten fruit at it. And believe you me, we are prepared for that. You will find all manner of rotten tomatoes, eggs, and other festering foods that are begging to be pelted for the low, low price of five cents per handful. If you follow me through these doors and gather around this cage quietly, Perhaps you will see it. Wait for your eyes to adjust to the dark and hold your revulsion until you cannot bear it anymore. 
Only then will we get to look at the papery gray skin sagging loose over a swollen gut. Marvel at its tree trunk legs, barely strong enough to support its own weight, its deformed trunk that hangs limp off the front of its face, and its ridiculous ears that flap nervously when it's afraid. Don't be afraid of the tusks sticking out from its face or its cries of pain and anguish. Instead, hold your tongues and wait. For if you're patient enough, and perhaps with a slight beating, it may even play us a song with the valves on its trunk. Then, and only then, you're permitted to pelt the Elephant Man with whatever you see fit, as you bask in the glory of Herman Fuller's Circus of the Disquieting. Reese Freeman didn't have much of a choice but to join the circus at the age of 14. The cast-out son of a freed slave in New Orleans, he spent much of his early life wandering the streets, trying not to get into any trouble. In the late 1800s, very few places were interested in hiring a young black man, unless, of course, they were looking to turn him back to the life that his father had fought so hard to escape. That's why when Reese was out fishing one afternoon and saw a big red tent going up on the outskirts of town, he couldn't help but wander over. Much to his surprise, a group of black men were the ones raising the marquee. They didn't look like slaves, either. Reese had never heard of a circus. The closest he'd ever come to seeing was a traveling entertainment cart that would sometimes pop up around town with a dancing bear in a cage or a glass ball in a pack of tarot cards. The brightly colored tents that went up one after another were enough to draw a crowd. Even the most well-respected in New Orleans came out for a look. Standing ankle-deep in the river, Reese peered over at the man who came out to address the throng. Dressed in a long tailcoat with a tall top hat, the man stood on a box of fruit and waved a cane dramatically in the air. Good folks of New Orleans! What you're about to witness tonight has never before been seen this side of the Mississippi! Wonders and amazement galore! Spectacle and intrigue! Mystery and mayhem! And just a touch of the impossible! I go by the name of Herman Fuller, the most talented and notorious circus master in the entire United States. The dazzling array of shows that I've brought before you is not for the faint of heart or the weak of constitution. Your stomachs will be turned and your minds may be altered, but it promises to be a night that you will never forget. Reese wasn't much interested in any of what he had just said. This kind of two-penny show was reserved for the folks who had the money to throw around on needless things like smiling and having a nice evening. What Reese was far more interested in were the groups of men working behind the scenes, pulling various carts and setting up all of the stalls. A lot of them didn't look much older than him. A grin spread across his face. SCP-4409 insisted on being interviewed in the dark. With all the lights in the interview chamber switched off, Dr. Simon Crossley entered the room and sat down across from the Elephant Man. Even in the dim light, though, he was able to still make out part of the man's features. The ivory tusks, the hanging nose, and the nervously twitching ears. The man had been picked up in St. Louis, where local police had found him panhandling in the streets. While he certainly seemed harmless enough, it was important for the Foundation to take him in just to be sure. Sitting in the dark interview room, Reese Freeman was apprehensive at first about telling his side of the story. A life of being mocked, spat on, and chased out of towns had left him with a real distrust of other people. That was probably made worse by his apprehension at being put in another cage within the Foundation. He told Dr. Crossley that he was born as normal as could be, that his current ghastly affliction was something done to him quite some time ago. But as much as it pained him to recollect, it was a tale that he knew he'd probably have to tell. Dr. Crossley replied that he was all ears. It took Dr. Crossley a few seconds to realize his faux pas. SCP-4409 glared at him before continuing to explain how he was made the way he was. Reese Freeman had managed to land a job with the circus surprisingly easily, despite having no previous experience and no references to back him up. Herman Fuller took a shine to him. It was menial work, and not many folks were up to doing it, but since Reese had never had a job before, he didn't know any better. He started out at the bottom of the ladder, scraping out feces, washing down old cages, and carrying heavy crates. The once scrawny 14-year-old boy quickly turned into a stocky 17-year-old with broad shoulders and strong legs. They would travel from town to town across most of the United States, 
stopping off in major cities for weeks at a time to bring in as much money as possible before moving on. Reese didn't save much of that money, but he didn't mind. The fact that he got two meals a day and something to do with himself was enough. In fact, he kind of enjoyed sleeping on top of the carts as the horses pulled them across the dusty American roads. The one thing that always seemed to affect him, though, was that he was never allowed to actually see inside the tents. He would see folks come and go through the canvas doors week after week, but was never allowed so much as a peek inside himself. The older guys were responsible for throwing the canvas sheets over the cages, which would remain that way as they traveled. Not having seen much of the world at that point, Reese didn't have much of an idea of what could be in those cages. Perhaps some kind of animal from a foreign country, something from Africa or Asia. They made all kinds of noise. Reese said that most of them sounded like humans, but then they'd go and make strange animal sounds that no human mouth could ever produce. One night, his curiosity got the better of him. Hanging back before the crowds got into the tent, he sidestepped over to the entrance, making sure that no one saw him, and took a peek through the doorway. It was dark inside, too dark to make out much of what was happening. The crowd of people was standing between him and the cage, all jostling and leaning this way and that, trying to make out whatever it was that was inside. A screeching sound filled the air, making the whole crowd and Reese outside jump right. Standing on his tiptoes, he tried his best to see what was moving around in that cage. It seemed to be moving around like a person, lurching this way and that, but the sounds coming from it sounded more like a bird. And sure enough, after a moment, a huge pair of disproportionately ugly wings stretched out from either side of the creature, flapping and sending a rush of air through the tent so powerful that it blew the flap wide open in front of him, just as Herman Fuller turned around to see him standing there. Reese bolted and hid behind one of the carts. He was going to be in trouble for this, he was sure of it. It was one of Fuller's only rules of the circus, and he had just gone and broken it. He was in the hottest water imaginable. But as nighttime fell and the drags of the spectators wandered out of the tent, Fuller seemed to be in too bad a mood at all. Watching him from a distance, Reese got the impression that he might not actually be in as much trouble as he thought. Fuller caught his eye and came over, <laughs> cane twirling and top hat sitting jauntily atop his head. Reese got off on the wrong foot, apologizing right away for spying into the tent. The circus master just laughed it off and slapped him on the back. Reese, my boy, don't worry about it. I've got much bigger plans for you. Much, much bigger. That night, as Reese lay in bed, he had a terrible dream about what he had seen in the tent that day. Circus of the Disquieting was certainly an apt title for this place. The image of that strange, shadowy bird person in the cage haunted his nightmares until suddenly, two pairs of strong hands gripped him and ripped him out of his sleep. He knew better than to fight back. This was surely going to be his comeuppance for breaking Fuller's rules earlier. They dragged him into the main tent where there was an oil lamp in the middle illuminating what looked like a heavy wooden operating table. His wrists and ankles were strapped in, and then the two men left him alone. He had half a mind to scream, but with all the caged-up creatures from the circus around him, he doubted anyone would pay him much mind. It was almost an hour before Herman Fuller walked into the tent. By this point, Reese expected him to be walking in with surgical equipment, gloves, maybe even a saw, but the man had nothing in his bare hands. Herman Fuller asked him if he ever heard of Joseph Merrick. Reese didn't answer. Of course he'd heard of the Elephant Man. The whole world had been talking about Joseph Merrick for months. A man born so hideously deformed that people had compared him to an elephant, though the resemblance wasn't that convincing. This sentiment was clearly shared by Fuller, who placed one hand on either side of Reese's face and began to softly massage his cheeks, explaining how disappointed he was that Merrick didn't actually look all that much like an elephant. Reese's cheeks started to hurt as the man massaged him, almost as if he was stretching and pulling at his face, finding loose skin. The boy asked Fuller what he was doing. The circus master just smiled at him and explained that it was an old technique handed down in his family. A gift, he called it. He started touching Reese's nose, gently pulling at it with more and more pressure. Much to Reese's surprise, he felt his nose elongating, growing longer and longer in the man's hand. He tried to twitch his face and was starting to find that his new nose twitched along with it. The longer it grew, the more painful it felt. 
the skin and flesh from his head being ripped and pulled into a new shape. At several points, Reese felt ready to pass out from the agony, but the circus master kept talking to him, kept him awake through the whole ordeal as he molded the boy's face like clay into the shape of an elephant. Lying on the bench panting, Reese could see his trunk from between his two eyes. It was a nightmare. That was all it was. But then Fuller reached under the workbench and lifted out a small hand drill. One by one, he punched holes into the top of Reese's trunk, installing little valves like a trumpet as he went. Standing back to admire his handiwork, he told Reese that he would be his new favorite attraction. My boy, I have made you into a star. The tusks did not come straight away. Over the course of several months, they slowly and painfully emerged from his deformed jaw. His elephantine legs were also not part of his initial transformation, but instead came as a result of health issues he developed while being trapped in a cage for several decades. Crowds of people would come and go, flocking to see the Elephant Man. Having spent the first part of his life constantly hungry, Reese was now being overfed every day. Hands would come to his cage and force him to eat rich, fatty foods, denying him any possibility of exercise. The broad shoulders and strong legs that he had developed while working at the circus melted away under layers and layers of fat. His skin went gray and papery, folding and wrinkling in on itself, either from Fuller's magic or just from a lack of sunlight. Whatever it was, with every passing day, Reese Freeman steadily became more and more hideous. SCP-4409 was stuck in the circus for much of his life. Eventually, Herman Fuller moved on and is currently being hunted by the SCP Foundation. When he did, SCP-4409 was able to bargain for its freedom from the circus. Wandering from city to city, never sticking around for very long, SCP-4409 begged for change at the side of the road. Some people would feel sympathy, while most would feel horror at its disfigurement. From its years trapped in a cage, SCP-4409 has developed severe health issues, including gout, severe obesity, and metabolic syndrome. While in Foundation custody, it is fed a special diet to counteract these conditions. As of yet, the Foundation has no way of reversing what was done to Reese Freeman in the tent in the 1800s. As Reese poses no threat to the Foundation, he is allowed to live with relative freedom, or at least as much freedom as a contained SCP can earn. His health condition severely limits his mobility around Site-66, a low-security residential containment area. Unable to walk even moderate distances, SCP-4409 heavily relies on the use of a cane and a heavy-duty walker, capable of supporting up to 140 kilograms. Researchers listen intently at his door, waiting to hear if he's ever going to play a sad song on his trumpet, but no sound ever emerges, except for his heavy breathing and spluttering coughs. It appears that having spent decades locked in a small cage, a sedentary life is all he knows now. With every opportunity to exercise, read books, and take up new hobbies, SCP-4409 appears unable to engage with anything other than sitting and staring at the same spot on the wall every day. If an animal has spent its whole life living in a zoo and finds in its old age that one of the walls has fallen down, what use has it in taking a step outside? As history often teaches us, sometimes human beings are the biggest monsters of all. Of course, when you join the ranks of the SCP Foundation, that starts to seem even less likely. And why wouldn't it? After all, just look at some of the creatures they encounter and keep in containment. A giant, unkillable lizard. A being with toothy protrusions growing out of its body. A whole host of immortal eldritch beings that could destroy reality. And one sadistic old man who drags unsuspecting victims into his own personal hellscape. Monsters are a dime a dozen to the Foundation. Humanity could never be anywhere near as evil or as cruel as the real monsters, even on their worst day. Or at least, you'd think. Researcher Kelton had held much of the same mentality that the SCP Foundation had the job of defending humanity from the real monsters of the world. And it was because of that belief that he had never previously questioned the containment procedures in place for SCP-1000. These beings were a species of nocturnal and omnivorous apes, usually with bodies covered in either gray, brown, black, red, or white fur. Possessing the same level of intelligence as the common chimp, 
the SCP-1000s had been colloquially described as a species known as Bigfoot, linking them to the urban legend about an ape-like being of dubious existence. Kelson had hardly been surprised that Bigfoot itself was an anomalous SCP. There were already a number of others that the Foundation had encountered that seemed to have influenced popular folklore from different parts of the world. In fact, it was that unique subcategory of anomaly that Kelson was conducting research into when he came across the SCP-1000 files. He was trying to determine, in various cases, which came first, the anomaly or the legend. Did the existence of SCP-1000s inspire earlier human civilizations to pass on stories of the Sasquatch? Or had those word-of-mouth tales been somehow linked to the very origins of SCP-1000 themselves? Studying the files, Kelson knew there was a mimetic disease infecting hominids like SCP-1000. The infection meant that anyone who observed one of the Bigfoot creatures had, at minimum, a 2% chance of suffering instantaneous brain death. It would make discovering the link between the Sasquatch legend and SCP-1000 difficult, not being able to directly look at the apes. But Kelson hoped he wouldn't need to actually observe the creatures, only find evidence that proved which predated which, SCP-1000 or the legend of Bigfoot. The population of SCP-1000 was limited, although their highest concentrations were known to be found in the Pacific Northwest region of North America, as well as in the Himalayan mountain range in Asia. Being stationed at a Foundation facility in the US, researcher Kelson opted to mount an expedition to the former location. A few odd occurrences had taken place leading up to his departure. His car tires had been slashed and now needed repairing. Newspaper clippings were also left on Kelson's desk that told of various hikers' deaths taking place in the Pacific Northwest. A more paranoid person might interpret these as subtle, indirect threats. It certainly seemed as if someone in the SCP Foundation wasn't keen on Kelson departing for his research trip. Nevertheless, he changed tact and called in sick to work, sneaking away to a small airstrip and boarding a light cargo plane that smuggled him towards the forests of North America. Once he had arrived, night was already falling. Kelson was on his own, traversing the woods as the sun rapidly receded out of view behind the tree line, leaving the forest in darkness, save for the beam from his flashlight. The researcher was hardly an outdoorsy type and far from an expert at exploring the wilderness, but he pushed on into the heart of the woods, to the areas where the most sightings of SCP-1000 had been reported. It wasn't long before the torchlight fell over something imprinted in the woodland floor, a large footprint left by something bipedal and rather similar to an ape. Venturing further, the sound of twigs breaking caused Kelson to whirl around. The noise had come from nearby, making it louder than the low background ambience of the forest at night. He swung his flashlight in the direction he thought it had come from, only seeing the shadows of branches cast against the tree trunks. Then, another noise leaves rustling as something passed by, followed by more snapping of twigs and the shaking of the leaves again. This thing, whatever it might have been, was encircling him. Frantically, Kelton tried to spot it with his light, when suddenly the beam fell over something tall, a hulking figure moving between the trees. Even from that split-second sighting, it was clearly an instance of SCP-1000. The momentary glimpse had reminded the intrepid researcher of an important detail, he couldn't look at them. A 2% chance of instant brain death seemed too low to worry about, but Kelton's research had described the effects of the mimetic disease to be cumulative. The longer an SCP-1000 ape was observed, the higher the chance of being killed on the spot by the infection. Snapping his eyes shut as tight as he could, Kelton was frozen to the spot at the mercy of the sounds surrounding him. The SCP-1000 was drawing closer, enough for the researcher to detect its footsteps. His pulse quickened, along with his breathing to match. Although he was already aware that the apes weren't known for being aggressive, hearing its heavy breathing as it drew nearer was enough to make him uncertain. Kelton wasn't sure if the Bigfoot would attack him or pass him by, but by far the last thing he had expected was to hear it start speaking. You, man came a deep, gravelly voice. It was the kind of sound an animal makes that can almost be mistaken for speech. Kelton wasn't fully convinced it had been a word, rather just his ears playing tricks on him in a moment of heightened fear. Human, it repeated much clearer. There was no mistaking it a second time. 
The SCP-1000 had spoken. Yeah, you can talk? Kelton exclaimed in disbelief. The Sasquatch didn't answer directly. Instead, the researcher detected the sound of receding footsteps. There was a pause as the SCP-1000 ape turned back to Kelson. Follow, human, it said. Open your eyes and follow me. What, what about the disease? Kelton shouted, keeping his eyelids still screwed shut. You'll be safe, the ape replied, before it resumed walking away. Cautiously opening his eyes and lifting his flashlight, Kelton could see the hairy figure making its way through the forest. Its back turned to him. He could see it. The researcher could look directly at it, and yet nothing seemed to be happening. No adverse side effects, no instant brain death. The odds were low, Kelton reminded himself, as he began to warily follow the path of the ape. Following at a distance, he made sure to momentarily glance away, trying not to stare for too long at the SCP-1000 creature in the hope that might disrupt the mimetic effect of the infection. Before long, they had arrived at a cave deep in the heart of the forest. The embers of a small fire were still aglow near the rocky entrance. As they lumbered inside, the SCP-1000 threw extra wood on the fire, poking it with a long stick until the flames began to reach higher. The flickering orange gave Kelton a better look at the ape. Its large frame covered almost head to toe in brown fur. There was also something about the creature that seemed off, not unsettling, but almost sad, melancholic, like it was lonely. The researcher had been so amazed that he could observe the creature for so long without dying that he'd barely focused in on the more important discovery. SCP-1000s were far more intelligent than the Foundation files had indicated, capable of not only speech, but emotion, too. D do you have a name? Kelson stammered, unsure where to start. Gaikor, he replied. That is my name. Yeah, you'll have to forgive me. I'm a little <laughs> taken aback by all this, the researcher hastily explained. Yeah, you're able to articulate. Your species is advanced enough to have names. Why should that be surprising? Gaikor asked. Oh, well, it's just the Foundation seems to think you and your kind are, I, I don't mean any offense, but mindless beasts. The ape made a huffing, exhaling sound. Kelson noticed after a moment that they were chuckling, a dry, almost sarcastic chuckle. It was unlike anything he had expected to learn about SCP-1000. That reminded him of why he'd come here. Um, <clears throat> Grycor, uh, may I ask something? He cleared his throat. Nodding, the SCP-1000 instance poked at the fire again, paying little mind to the human in its company. Where did you and your people come from? Kelson asked. Uh, what's your history? Why? Grykor replied abruptly. Uh, you see, humans have these legends, stories about something called Bigfoot or Sasquatch. The foundation, the humans I work with, they call you one and the same. I wanted to know if that was true. For a short moment, the creature paused. Then Grykor began to give Kelton the truth, the real truth. And as they spoke, it was as if the researcher could see the story unfolding, emphasized by the pain in the ape's teary eyes. We were like you long, long ago, he began explaining. We and humans, we evolved together side by side. For a time there was peace between us, but we began to grow faster, stronger, became smarter while you were left behind. You evolved before early humans did? Kelson probed. Indeed, Gracker answered with a gentle nod. We began to surpass the humans. You were still young, still hunting and foraging for food, while we were moving far beyond. Thousands and thousands of years, we were able to develop our culture, our technology, all before the humans had even come close to fire and the wheel. But that doesn't make any sense, the researcher interjected yet again. If that was the case, mankind would have never had its chance to reach the top of the food chain. We would have died out, and that would have made you the dominant species on the planet. We were, the SCP-1008 replied. For a time. What happened? Grykor turned with a solemn look on their face. You, it replied plainly. Humans happened. We covered the world. Billions and billions of us. You were rare, as few as we are now. My people made technology far beyond anything humans have dreamt up, either before or since. Trains, ships, vehicles created from the trees and the animals, communication using parts of insects and smaller creatures, cities filled with us, 
where we lived in harmony, stretched out across parts of worlds humans dared not tread. Organic technology, Kelton gasped. Fascinating. We had weapons, too, and that was our biggest mistake. What kind of weapons? The researcher quizzed the ape. Given how advanced you were compared to humanity at that time, I'm assuming your weaponry was far beyond our early spears and clubs. The devastating kind, Gryker said, staring ahead into the fire, almost if the dancing flames conjured up images of the kind of destruction his ancestors' weapons could cause. I, I think I understand, Kelson said. There was some kind of conflict, yes? A majority of your people perish? Oh, my condolences. But that would have removed you from the top of the evolutionary chain and allowed the earliest ancestors of humanity to usurp your place there? Was the disease you and your species carry a result of the war? A sort of lingering radioactive fallout, but on a genetic level? We are not sick, Grykor growled. Your people lied. They made that up. And there was no war. It was a slaughter. Kelton fell quiet, unsure of what to say. Humans would stay away from us back then. We avoided them too. You slept during the night when we were awake, but you made a deal. A deal with something ancient and dangerous in the forests. A deal to even the score. You found our weapons and didn't hesitate. No, that that's... The Foundation researcher tried to protest, but the look of sadness on the ape's face stopped his sentence before he could finish. We were almost entirely wiped out. In a single day, humans switched places with us. We became less, and they became more. They used our technology to forget about us, wiped our memories, so they wouldn't have to face up what they had done. But we will never forget. And the Foundation... They maintain that facade, Kelton realized. That's why they tell us you're infected, that if we look at you, we'll die. They're ashamed. We all should be. Not just ashamed, Gryker replied. Afraid. They fear we want revenge, retribution for what was done to our people. And do you? The ape took another pause as if it was pondering, or just allowing itself a moment to feel sad. We have forgiven you, it answered. I'm not sure we deserve that, Kelson said back as the pair sat by the fire until the sun came up. Now go and check out SCP-323 Wendigo Skull and SCP-023 Black Shuck for more anomalous entities that are pulled straight out of folklore, myths, and ancient legends.